Good. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Dominic Shishekovic and I'm a research assistant and uh, chief engineer at the Institute for Communication Technologies and Embedded Systems at the RWTH Aachen University. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator today of uh, the Secure Hardware Architectures and Operating Systems Workshop. Um, so before we take a closer look at the, uh, at the agenda and some basic information about the workshop, let us just remind ourselves uh, why we are actually looking at all this uh, different security topics. So as you might have seen uh, from many news entries, so uh, vulnerabilities in hardware uh, are basically popping up everywhere on all the platforms that we see nowadays from uh, potential hardware trojan kill switches in um, military equipment down to FPGA vulnerabilities, memory vulnerabilities, and of course, architectural uh, flaws. And this is kind of uh, the motivation uh, also for, uh, for this workshop to uh, invite all the greatest minds um, in, this, uh, in this area and also uh, to, to analyze the potential, uh, potential things that we could do to improve this, the state of security of, of the future systems. And of course, maybe also create some collaborations down the road. With that being said, um, yeah, welcome to the third CEHAS uh, workshop. Uh, so some information about this, uh, we have organized this workshop annually since 2019, and we were quite happy that uh, we could organize it in very, very nice places, including uh, Valencia in 2019 and Bologna in, in 2020. This year, of course, for uh, obvious reasons, we have to do it virtually, but it turns out this had also some positive connotation, as I will show you on the next slide. Regarding the organizational team, um, so the workshop has been organized from the beginning uh, together with uh, four members. So Dr. Farad Merchant, Professor Rainer Leupers, uh, Professor Avi Mendelssohn, and uh, myself. And uh, the topics, as you might have guessed, are mostly focusing uh, around hardware security and different aspects of hardware security. So in the last uh, two years and today, um, we uh, invited uh, speakers uh, to tell us uh, updates on the latest news in FPGA security, secure operating systems, side channel analysis, even with the machine learning in mind, secure crypto hardware, fault tolerance, down to reverse engineering and some new security uh, par paradigms that we will also see today in some of the talks. Um, so regarding some statistics, uh, so I've taken a, look, taken a look at the numbers from the previous years and we can see from 2019 uh, up until today there is a steady increase uh, in attendees. Um, so this red bar basically for 2021 is a bit outdated it's it's uh, yesterday um, i've seen that today we have also some increase so we see from uh, some 60 attendees up to more than 150 at the moment uh, from more than 60 institutions worldwide so more than 24 countries around the globe so this this topic of security and hardware is really um, hitting the right uh, hitting the right spot and there is a lot of interest in this uh, in this area and as you can see in this uh, in this first part, there is really a large increase in uh, in the number of attendees, which is probably because of uh, the possibility to join virtually. Um, also, one interesting information um, I've taken a look also at the other workshops that are currently going on at uh, at High Peak, and I have to say that uh, on average we are far beyond uh, the number of, in the number of attendees. Uh, deep, um, in comparison to the other workshops. So security seems to really to be a very interesting and a hot topic at high peak. Good, um, and with that being said, uh, let's take a look at the program. So we have divided the program today into two sessions, the morning and the afternoon session. In the morning, uh, we will start uh, with a keynote from Professor Ono Mutlu from ETH Zurich, who will tell us a little bit about uh, the story of Rowhammer. And afterwards, uh, we are following also the, uh, the, the break template given by High Peak. So we will have a coffee break from 11 to 11.30 and later on uh, a lunch break from basically one till three o'clock because um, after two, there is uh, some High Peak keynote talks. So we reserved this spot so you can join, of course, uh, those talks. And in the meantime, we have some exciting invited uh, talks on many different aspects of uh, security. In the afternoon session, uh, which will continue at three o'clock. So please remember, from uh, from uh, one till three, we basically have a break. Um, we are continuing then with some invited talks, an industry talk uh, on 
cryptographic appliances. And afterwards, we have a coffee break. Following our second keynote speaker today, Professor Swarabunia from the University of Florida. Um, and in the end, we are finishing up with an invited talk and a short closing session uh, from uh, Professor Avi Mendelssohn. Um, so for the speakers who have already joined, uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for uh, participating in the event today. Um, I would just give you two short uh, informations, um, and this is actually for everyone. Uh, so we had some slight changes in our program due to some conflicts uh, in, in scheduling all the speakers. So we had to swap two sessions. So basically the session from uh, three uh, till four o'clock has been swapped with the session from five till six. But this is already updated in this uh, in this table that you see. So the keynote is actually at, so the second keynote is at five o'clock and not at three as uh, mentioned yesterday, basically. Um, the second information is all the time slots that are given uh, to the speakers also include uh, some minutes for Q and A. So please, uh, please keep that in mind when uh, when presenting. And uh, that also brings me to the end of the introductory slides. And with that, um, I would like to um, I would like to call out our first uh, speaker today, Professor Ono Mutlu, who will tell us about the story of Rawhammer. So, Professor Mutlu, in the meantime, while I am introducing you, could you please already prepare? your slides uh yes sure let me share my screen oh it says i cannot share my screen while somebody else is sharing yeah i, I think you should be able to do it now okay yes can you see it uh yeah, yeah i think you just have to maximize yep. oh, perfect good um so our first speaker as i mentioned is professor onumutlu and uh, let me introduce himself. Uh, so Professor Onomutlu is a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich. He is also a faculty member of Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, where he previously held the Strecker Early Career Professorship. His current broader research interests are in computer architecture, systems, hardware security, and even bioinformatics. Um, the variety of techniques he, along with his uh, group and collaborators, has invented over the years have influenced industry and have been employed in commercial microprocessors and memory uh, storage systems. Uh, he obtained his uh, PhD and master's in electrical computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree in computer engineering and psychology from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Um, he started the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research and held various product and research positions at Intel Corporation, advanced micro devices, VMware, and even uh, Google. He received really uh, uh, many different awards. So like the IEEE, uh, IEEE Computer Society, Edward J. McCluskey Technical Achievement Award, ACM SIGART uh, Maurice Wilkes Award, the inaugural IEEE Computer Society Young a Computer Architect uh, Award and many, many more. Um, alongside, he also has a healthy number of best paper and topic uh, paper recognitions at various computer systems, architecture and hardware security venues. He's an ACM fellow for contributions for computer architecture research, especially in memory systems, and uh, also an IEEE fellow for contributions to computer architecture research and practice, and an elected member of the Academy of Europe. Um, so, Professor Mutlu, um, thanks for being here today with us, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you for the nice introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, keynote talk. This is a topic that I enjoy talking about a lot. Uh, and we're going to talk, cover Rowhammer. I call it the story of Rowhammer because I think it's been an interesting story since we started working on it as early as 2012. So, when I talk about Rowhammer to freshmen, uh, in my class, I actually show this picture uh, of this bridge, and many people may know which bridge it is. Uh, this is the Tacoma Narrows, Narrows Bridge uh, that used to uh, go over the Hood Canal. It was built in 1940, and uh, it's it collapsed uh, six months later, like this. And I think this is a really great example of a bit flip in critical infrastructure. And uh, there are reasons, of course, why this uh, bridge uh, collapsed. Uh, at that time, it's aerostatic flutter, and there's a lot of civil engineering classes that are taught upon that bridge. Uh, but I, I see this as an example reliability problem affecting safety, security, availability, and many things we hold potentially dear to our safety overall. And uh, I think uh, what I'm going to talk about is no different. And in fact, worse perhaps, because if you think about bridges, 
bridges are only a small fraction of what we rely on in the world, whereas computing is much bigger. We're going to rely much, much more on computing uh, going into the future for making decisions for us, for driving for us, for who knows what else uh, for us, for making health decisions for us. And if we have, if we keep having bit flips and reliability problems that affect our safety, security, availability, then we're going to have a lot of trouble. I also talk about this example of workers who are building New York City after the war, and they're they're standing, uh, they're they're clearly happy uh, on this rod over here. But if a bit flip happens on this rod, they will not be very happy very quickly, right? So I think of security as preventing unforeseen consequences, and as you build critical infrastructure that relies on the uh, security of your devices, I think this is a really good way of thinking about security going forward. So uh, Rohammer is one example of this bit flip that may be affecting critical infrastructure. So what is Rohammer? It's essentially the fact that you can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM main memory chips today. And more than 80% of the chips that are out in the field is vulnerable. This is, in my opinion, uh, as far as I could find, this is the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And I'd be happy to uh, see other examples of this if you have something in mind. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of folks who think about software uh, are now saying, forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And I think at a high level, this is a nice characterization of what Rohammer is about. So I'm going to tell you a story. I don't, I'm not going to directly jump into the Rohammer, but I'm going to descri describe how it happened and where it's going into the future. So when we first started looking into uh, reliability issues in main memory, uh, I, had, I was asked to deliver this uh, invited talk at the International Memory Workshop, which is a heavily industry-dominated workshop. And I talked about essentially memory scaling. And I said that memory technology scaling is getting much worse and we're going to have a lot of problems. At that time, we didn't have a lot of evidence, hard evidence uh, from the field. And then we, but we were collecting evidence and unfortunately it didn't go into this paper because it was not ready. But what we were looking at was the DRAM scaling problem. And it was clear to us that we will have a lot of problems. So why? If you look at DRAM, it's basically the main memory technology that we use to build essentially all of our main memories with today. Uh, and it, it consists of two components, uh, the storage unit, which is the capacitor in DRAM because it's charge-based memory, and then access unit, which consists of this access transistor, bit line, and the sense amplifier. And for any memory to work, sorry about this, for any memory to, to work, both the storage unit must work and the access unit must work. And uh, unfortunately, as you reduce the size of, this, uh, size of the uh, memory, uh, both the storage and access unit becomes less reliable. In DRAM, the capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. The access transistor must be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And as you reduce the size of both, you run into noise issues and reliability issues that may uh, cause a lot of difficult problems, as I will describe. And in 2009, when International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors wrote their report, they said that scaling this technology below uh, 35 nanometers is challenging. And they were actually essentially right on this one uh, because Rohammer happened. And there are a lot of other things happened, as we will see. So we did some experiments uh, in the field uh, together with Facebook. Uh, this is one example experiment that we have done. Well, it's more like a correlational study. We, we, uh, we studied all of the memory errors that uh, happened in Facebook's data centers for more than one and a half years, uh, which is reported in this paper in DSN in 2015. And what we found out was that uh, the chip density that's employed uh, in a server uh, highly correlates with the uh, server failure rate uh, that you observe on that server. This is the chip density in terms of DRAM chip density, essentially how, uh, how dense your memory is. Uh, so this is a correlational study. This is based on production data center servers. We couldn't modify what was going on. You can read the paper for more detail. But the intuition is that as your chips get denser, they become more vulnerable to noise and you get more errors, bit errors essentially, because cells are closer to each other and they're more vulnerable to noise. Okay, uh, there's more to talk about here, which is exciting, I think, but I don't have time to discuss that. So we also uh, wanted to understand these uh, scaling effects at the lower level. So we built FPGA-based testing infrastructures that look like this uh, to understand the problems that we have in terms of the scaling of the memory technology. So we looked at retention errors, for example. We looked at read disturb errors, which I'm going to talk about. We looked at latency issues, what happens uh, when you actually change the latencies. And that was enabled by this FPGA-based infrastructure that allowed us to test the memories. And you can see some pictures of what we have created. 
And we released this infrastructure to the community uh, with this HPCA paper. And you can, it's actually C++ programmable. As long as you have an FPGA uh, that is compatible, you can, uh, you can use our software to test memories and you can find different sources of errors potentially. Sorry about this, but somehow my computer is moving uh, by itself and it's not because of the settings in uh, PowerPoint. There's some sensitivity in my mouse, I think. It's a new computer. Uh, okay, so if you're interested, we actually open source it and we, we provide a lot of support for it. A lot of people in the world are using it for various reasons uh, and publishing papers with it. So the reason, the main reason why we built this infrastructure was to really understand the data retention effects. And data retention is how long can, it, can data be retained in a DRAM cell? And I believe this is a critical scaling problem of DRAM. And we wanted to understand how can we make data retain, uh, be retained longer in DRAM or how, how do we get away without refreshing DRAM much? Because it's actually a big performance and energy problem that affects the scalability of the memory capacity significantly. So that's the reason why we built this infrastructure. And we wanted to understand the retention time profile of DRAM. And it turns out that it looks like this. We're refreshing everything about, uh, about every, every 64 milliseconds today. But most DRAM cells actually don't require refresh uh, for much longer than that. But the difficulty is this is location dependent, stored value dependent, time dependent. So uh, a lot of our research was focused on understanding how we can get rid of refresh in DRAM as much as possible without, without causing reliability issues. And I'm not going to talk about that. This is a fascinating direction. Uh, and you can read some papers that we have written on this topic. And there are more papers that are coming up. It's actually a very, very interesting problem, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but that was essentially the reason why we built this infrastructure. But while we were doing all of those studies, we were actually very, very interested in other uh, error types uh, that occur in DRAM, especially the read disturb errors, uh, because we also had a similar infrastructure uh, with flash memory. And in flash memory, we saw a lot of read disturb errors. I'm going to show you the uh, picture of that infrastructure later on during this talk. We saw uh, uh, that you get a lot of read disturb errors in flash memory. Uh, we asked the question, why don't you get a lot of read disturb errors in DRAM as well? And that's essentially what we did uh, together with Intel. We investigated the possibility of read disturb errors in DRAM. And we found out that you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips by inducing this read disturb phenomenon that I'm going to talk about. So this is called DRAM rope hammer. As, as I said earlier, it's a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. We're going to talk about the system security vulnerability soon. And you can see what I showed you earlier. So what is the problem? The problem essentially is very fundamental. As long as you have a scaled memory technology, in my opinion, you're not going to uh, be uh, immune to read disturb. And DRAM is no, not, nothing special. As it scales to smaller technology nodes, it's going to be vulnerable to read disturb. Uh, and what is read disturb in DRAM? Essentially, if you want to access a cell in a row in DRAM, you apply high voltage to that row, which is activating that row. You activate that row. And then you need to close that row to access some other row. Basically, you apply low voltage after that. This is called a precharge on DRAM. So if you keep doing this repeatedly, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, enough times before the cells get refreshed in modern DRAM, it turns out you get bit flips in adjacent, physically adjacent rows in bits that are vulnerable to this row hammer or read disturb effect. Clearly, this is something that should not happen because you're not writing to DRAM and you're clearly not writing to the adjacent rows. You're not writing to the row that you're hammering, but you're also not writing to the rows that are victims. So this should not be happening clearly. So you're violating physical isolation and, and also virtual isolation as well. And we showed that more than 80% of the chips that we tested from three major DRAM manufacturers exhibited this vulnerability. And uh, you can guess who these ABC are. There are only three major DRAM manufacturers in the world today. Uh, which may be an unfortunate phenomenon, but that's how it is. So this is a scaling problem because the chips that we tested that were manufactured before 2010 were not vulnerable to this effect. But all of the chips that we tested that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013, as you can see, were vulnerable. So you could see varying row hammer error rates, and it's really manufacture independent. So why were the older chips not vulnerable? Because you couldn't do enough activates to induce these bit flips. The cells were not close to each other. At some point, the cells got too close to each other that by doing activates in one row, you could induce noise, enough noise uh, in adjacent rows, and you could fit in enough activates to cause these row hammer bit flips within a refresh interval before the cells get refreshed. Okay, so I think I gave you the idea of why it's re really happening. It's, 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 sorry, is there a question? I, I hear some noise in the background. Okay. Uh, 
No, oh, I don't think so. Okay, uh, thanks. So the EM cells are essentially too close to each other. Uh, access to one cell affects the value in nearby cells due to electrical interference between the cells and the wires used for accessing the cells. And that's essentially the read disturbance that I talked about. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling or interference. So there are multiple reasons for it. I'm going to briefly flash a slide that talks about the reasons. I'm not going to go and talk, talk about the details. But essentially, a, an intuitive reason at a high level is when we activate, apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well. And vulnerable cells in that slightly activated low a row lose a little bit of charge. And if you do this activation enough times or hammering enough times, charge in such cells get drained before the cells get refreshed. And higher level implications are a bit scary. Essentially, DRAM, as I said, is not special because it's not immune to read disturb, but it is very special actually because whatever bit flip you get in DRAM directly expo gets exposed to your programs. It directly gets exposed to your data structures, operating system, applications. As a result, you have essentially no protection uh, against these bit flips. So someone, uh, so certainly you can get data corruption. Uh, your system uh, can uh, halt for some reason because you get a bit flip on a critical data structure. And worse yet, somebody can actually take advantage of these bit flips to take over your system as, I, as we will talk about. And this, is all, uh, this all happens because you can induce these uh, bit flips predictably in software at, with user level program. So this is the user level program that we released when we uh, uh, actually published the paper. It's a very simple program. You can see x86 program. You could actually optimize it by getting rid of this M fence down there. It was, it's really not necessary. But basically what this program does is it selects addresses X and Y that map to the same bank in DRAM. And it avoids cache hits. It avoids row hits so that it could basically ping pong uh, or interleave activates the rows X and Y like this. It basically keeps activating rows X and Y. And if the chip is vulnerable, you'll get bit flips in the banks. And based on this program, uh, clearly you can cause a lot of issues. And at the time we tested, uh, we used Intel and AMD systems, but there's nothing special about Intel and AMD. This happens in any system that has a good enough memory controller and vulnerable memory. And essentially all systems have good enough memory controllers, vulnerable memory we will discuss. Uh, and you can see that you can uh, induce enough errors and errors are correlated with the access rate that you're getting. And there are interesting questions we can have on uh, why you're getting higher access rates on some systems and not higher access rates on some other systems. Uh, but basically, this is a real reliability and security issue. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe more, uh, it's essentially a reliability issue that leads to a security problem. So I'm going to talk about the security implications next. When we wrote the paper in 2014, uh, well, we wrote in 2012, actually, it got published in 2014. But basically, the first sentence we used was memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. And, and I st still strongly believe this. And we said that by taking advantage of the bit flips, the predictable bit flips that we have shown in this work, somebody can actually hijack your system. And while we were actually working on this, the good folks at Google Project Zero uh, Mike Seaborn and Thomas Dullian, they basically published this beautiful blog post that essentially did that. They basically exploited the DRAM row hammer uh, uh, mechanism to gain kernel privileges. And I'd encourage you to read their blog post as well as watch their Black Hat presentation. It's a beautiful one. This, is, uh, this slide essentially is copy pasted uh, from their blog post. But basically, they learned about the problem from our work and they assessed the selection of laptops and replicated the problem. And they basically built two working privilege escalation exploits. Uh, one is taking over the Google native client. The other is more interesting in my opinion. Essentially, it uses these row hammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges on an x86-64 Linux, a vanilla x86-64 Linux, uh, uh, when it's run as an unprivileged user level process. And I'm not gonna go into the details of exactly how they did it. It's beautiful security engineering, but basically they were able to induce bit flips in this processes page table entries, and they were able to change the page table entries such that they could gain write access to the process's own page table. Now, if you have a user level process and if it gains write access to its own page table, then all bets are off because now this process can be completely malicious and it can actually take over the entire system. Uh, essentially, your system is completely comp compromised. And again, I point you to the Black Hat presentation by these folks, it's beautiful security engineering. It's a probabilistic attack, it's not, completely deterministic uh, because you cannot always uh, get the bit flips clearly, but we will talk about that a little bit later as well. So this, uh, this is known as Doe Hammer vulnerability and people are drawing nice pictures like this, as you can see. And they're interesting 
uh, comments from hackers. This is a comment on Twitter from a famous hacker. It basically says that it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. Uh, it's actually interesting. I like this analogy quite a bit. Uh, and interesting, uh, just, a, just a side story. Initially, DI manufacturers were really not interested in talking about this problem, even after we published it and showed it uh, many, many times. Uh, later, they started calling this problem noisy neighbor problem, which also is interesting, I think. Now, I'm not really married to Rohammer, but I think uh, noisy neighbor is quite interesting as well. Okay, so I will very quickly go over some interesting security-related works that happened on Rohammer and then focus on some work that has happened uh, later on. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a lot of work. I'm not going to talk about these in detail. Uh, there's work that looked at uh, cache line flush free Rohammer because cache line flush instructions could be privileged in some architectures. And clearly, these works show that uh, you can induce uh, cache line, uh, you can get rid of caches uh, for these vulnerable, uh, for, for these aggressor rows. Uh, by actually uh, causing uh, 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 conflicts in the cache clearly. Uh, there are also other works that show the, essentially the same thing concurrently. Uh, and there are some uh, uh, example exploits that look at uh, owning a system with all defenses up, even if the software is free, uh, as you can see over here on Microsoft Edge systems. There are actually really interesting ideas here that combine memory deduplication and Rohammer together. I don't have time to talk about all of these works, but I'm just going to uh, uh, show you some, uh, if, if these slides will be available, so you can actually look at these works. I'm going to point to some of them later on. Uh, actually, let me skip this. Uh, let me go to one thing that I will talk about in a little bit more detail. So when we first actually released our work, uh, the first people who were really interested in this was the testing, memory testing folks. And MemTest86 is a program uh, that is used by many, many systems to test main memory periodically, uh, or when you boot up the system, or when you put up memory in the system. And they essentially designed a hammer test, which I think is not complete, frankly, due to the reasons that I'm going to talk about in a little bit also. But even without that complete test, they got a lot of errors. They basically got a lot of reports from folks in the field. Uh, and they had to write this in their uh, uh, online, uh, online documentation. They had to say, basically, the errors detected during test 13 Albeit exposed only in extreme memory access cases are most certainly real, real errors. So they had to reassure people that what they're getting is real. Uh, it's not uh, something that's made up. It's not a bug in their software, essentially. And they talk about some solutions, which we will also talk about. So Ariska 2014 paper talked about some security implications that I uh, already talked about, actually. Uh, we built a proof of concept, and later work actually showed that you could actually do this security attack. And I'm going to highlight several of these over here. These folks from TU Graz, for example, showed that you could do these attacks uh, in JavaScript, and you could gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors. These folks from Freie University of Amsterdam, uh, this is actually really interesting work. They basically showed that you could do these bit flips in ARM-based Android systems. And they actually released uh, a tool uh, that you can download, I believe. And what they did was they, they were able to gain control of an Android phone deterministically. They were able to pool the operating system to uh, essentially uh, allocate a page table entry for a malicious process in the location that the malicious process profiled to be Rohammer vulnerable. And then the malicious process actually hammered that location to gain uh, uh, control of the smartphone by gaining write access to its page tables. So it's beautiful security engineering, as you can see. Uh, and this also showed that ARM-based systems are also vulnerable. They're not immune. Later work showed that you could actually do this attack much more, uh, much more heavily, uh, intensively on GPUs because GPUs have much faster access uh, to memory, clearly, and higher bandwidth access. And some other work showed that you could actually induce these bit flips on a remote machine through the remote direct memory access interface and gain uh, take over that remote machine through this RDMA interface. And this is concurrent work with that one. And more recent work showed that even if you may not be able to gain access, you can leak uh, uh, confidential information uh, from adjacent rows or, or rows that you're actually targeting. Uh, and uh, some other recent work showed that actually, uh, if you carefully induce these bit flips in uh, machine learning applications and neural network accelerators, uh, your accuracy can tank to a very low level. So this work is more recent in Usenix security, as you can see. They basically show that by carefully doing Rohammer attacks on neural network accelerators, you can reduce your accuracy from 90% to 10% in, in, a, in an otherwise good neural network. And there are other works that I'm not going to talk about. And this may be another attack that may come up if you're actually too much 
constrained by these bit flips. Of course, that's a joke, clearly. This could be a solution also, getting rid of your vulnerable computer, right? So let's go into a little bit more detail in terms of understanding Grove Hammer, and, and then I'm going to talk about solutions. So very quickly, uh, this happens due to a multitude of reasons. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but electromagnetic coupling, as I mentioned earlier, is a, one reason. Conductor bridges that get formed uh, is another reason. And hot carry, inje even hot carry injections actually happen uh, due to Rohe Hammer uh, in, in some cases. But it's usually a combination, complex combination of these effects. And we've actually confirmed this with uh, two, uh, now two major manufacturers. Uh, this was an old slide, as you can see. So we, did, we used our uh, testing infrastructure for many studies uh, in Rohe Hammer. And we initially, in 2012 to 2014 timeframe, we tested more than uh, 120 modules that are listed over here, as you can see. I'm going to give you some insights from our characterization very quickly. Uh, the first insight is that uh, uh, the aggressor row and the victim rows are most of the time adjacent to each other. So this is the row address difference from the perspective of the memory controller. So memory controller uh, looks at uh, hammers uh, row address x and it gets bits flips in uh, row address x plus 1 and x minus 1. But sometimes it also gets bit flips in non-adjacent rows. So there are multiple reasons over here. The main reason is that memory controller does not know the address mapping scheme that's used internally in DRAM. In, not in all cases, uh, address x and address x minus 1 and x plus 1 uh, are adjacent to each other, physically adjacent to each other in DRAM, because DRAM manufacturers employ uh, many internal uh, uh, swizzling mechanisms to actually uh, change the access and remapping mechanisms to remap the addresses uh, that is visible to the memory controller for fault tolerance reasons. For example, if a, if, a, if a row doesn't work, they actually remap that row to some other uh, physical row. So this actually complicates the solutions and sometimes the attacks. Uh, I'm not going to go into this detail, but I think this is actually a really interesting uh, phenomenon. The second phenomenon is if you actually, uh, the access interval to the aggressor, how fast are you accessing the uh, aggressor activating? So DRAM standards don't allow it below some nanoseconds, as you can see over here. If you're accessing at the highest possible activation rates, you get the highest number of errors, as you can see uh, from the chips uh, that are the worst chips that we tested from three major manufacturers. Clearly, by reducing the access interval, you can get rid of the errors. But this is not a good uh, mechanism, at least if done naively, because if you do it naively and if you bake it to the standard, you actually need to get rid of uh, if you want to get rid of all of the bit flips, you want to reduce your access rate significantly uh, and separate your accesses to a row by 500 nanoseconds, which is really not acceptable if you want to have high performance. But this is potentially one way of reducing the problem, as you can see. But if you do it naively, you won't get a good uh, result because it will come at high performance loss. OK, the, th the third observation is refresh interval. Essentially, today, everything is refreshed every 64 milliseconds. And we get bit flips, you can see, every, if you're refreshing every 64 milliseconds. If you reduce your refresh rate, meaning make refreshes less frequent, you get more errors. If you increase your refresh rate, you get fewer errors, clearly because now you can fit fewer activates within a refresh interval. And uh, if you uh, fit fewer activates, uh, then uh, you reduce the probability of these bit flips. But our paper shows, as you can see, if you want to get rid of every single bit flip, uh, you need to reduce, uh, increase your refresh rate by 7x, which is not good for performance or energy, because we actually wanted to get rid of refreshes. Remember, that's the reason why we actually started this research. And that's a key DRAM scaling problem. We don't want to solve one DRAM scaling problem, which is row hammer, to, uh, by exacerbating the other DRAM scaling problem, which I believe is more fundamental, actually, in the end. So this is not a good solution, but we will talk about this in a little bit. OK, the data pattern is also important. So if you look at this left-hand side over here, if you have solid data patterns, if the adjacent rows and uh, rows have the same data pattern, you get fewer errors. Whereas if they have different data patterns that increases the charge coupling between the rows, you get an order of magnitude more errors. So data pattern is a critical, uh, of critical importance to the attacks as well. OK, there are other results in the paper, which I will quickly go over. Essentially, victim cells, row hammer, vulnerable cells are not the same as uh, refresh or leaky cells, retention vulnerable cells. This is very interesting. These are different failure mechanisms, even though one would intuitively think that a leaky cell is going to be more vulnerable to row hammer. That's not true because row hammer phenomenon mechanism is very different. Even if a cell may not be leaky, it may not be vulnerable to row hammer. So it may not get a bit flip, even though it leaks a lot. Right. Okay. 
So errors are not strongly affected by temperature. And we also found out that errors are repeatable, which is really what makes this a security problem. Because if you induce a bit flip in a bit in a cell, you're going to induce that bit flip again and again and again and again. Uh, that's why uh, this becomes a security problem. That way, you can profile the memory and figure out which bits are vulnerable uh, to these bit flips. And then you can try to induce those bit flips uh, in the right time in the right applications. OK, we also showed that you can get as many as four errors per cache line. Essentially, simple ECC that may be employed in systems cannot prevent all errors. And you have to increase ECC strength, which is not a good idea, again, in my opinion, because ECC strength is very, ECC is a very heavy handed solution to errors. In this case, in Rowhammer, we know why the error is happening. And we can design more specialized mechanisms to fix the errors. And we also showed that you can have many number of cells and rows affected by aggressor. It's not just the adjacent, physically adjacent rows. But as you go a little bit farther uh, in terms of physical adjacency, you still get effects in terms of row hammer. The effect is not as bad as it would be for the physically immediately physically adjacent rows. It actually reduces exponentially. But still, uh, you, can ho you can hammer non-physically adjacent rows also. We also showed that cells are affected by two aggressors on either side. So you can actually sandwich a row between two aggressors and hammer both of those aggressors. And the victim will have a lot more uh, uh, bit flips. And actually, this is used uh, by, later by Google to develop the double-sided row hammer attack, uh, which we did not introduce. So that's a good idea, I think, the double-sided row hammer attack. OK, so th first row hammer, hammer analysis in, in this paper. I'm, let me talk about row hammer solutions a little bit before I talk about the more recent work. So there are two types of solutions needed in Rowhammer because clearly the chips that are out in the field are vulnerable. What do you do about that? These are immediate solutions. We need to protect the vulnerable chips, and there are limited possibilities. Longer-term solutions can be more aggressive uh, and may have more options, and this is to protect the future DRAM chips. And in our paper, we introduced both types of solutions, seven solutions in total. I'm going to talk about Para, which is already employed in the field, or it used to be employed until DRAM manufacturers claimed that they solved the problem, which we will talk about. So let's talk about some overall potential solutions. And these are solutions that I do not believe uh, work, at least uh, for the long run. Ma making better DRAM chips, uh, that's not easy. Uh, clearly, providing isolation between different rows is very costly. Uh, that would go against the capacity that we want in these chips. Refreshing frequently is one solution. And we'll talk about this as the immediate solution. But it's not a good solution in the long run, because it will lead to power and performance implications. Sophisticated error correcting code is definitely a solution. You want to increase your error correction capabilities to four bits per cache line, which is heavy, very heavy, actually, costly and power inefficient. And as I said, this is not a good solution because error correction codes are great solutions if you do not know why the errors are happening, meaning errors are random, bit flips, for example, soft errors. Uh, but row hammer is far from random. You know exactly why the errors are happening because you're hammering a row. So if you spend your error correction capability to these errors that are easy to detect and correct otherwise, then you will actually need to add a lot of ECC in your system, making your system much more costly and complicated and power inefficient. So access counters are also very interesting. Basically, can we somehow count the number of accesses that are seen by rows and basically throttle the accesses to those rows? If you do it naively, this could lead to a significant cost, power, and complexity. But there could be potentially not so naive or more sophisticated mechanisms that could lead to good solutions here. And actually, research is being done in this direction that I will briefly mention later on uh, that uh, tries to uh, make these access counters less costly and the mechanism less costly. But I think this is not as easy uh, to do as we will see very briefly. So what is the solution that's employed in the field? Essentially, it's refreshing more frequently. You can see this is Apple's security release uh, in 2015, I believe. Uh, they basically said that uh, they mitigated the Rowhammer issue by increasing the memory refresh rates. They didn't say exactly how much. I believe it's 2x, which means that Rowhammer vulnerability still exists because we showed that uh, you need to increase the refresh rate by 7x. But clearly, they, uh, I don't think they were willing to go, by, go to 7x because that would have a huge impact on system performance and efficiency. And I like Apple here because they actually credit the academic work uh, that led to their decision, as you can see over here. But many, many vendors actually release similar patches because that's what you can do in the field today, refreshing more frequently. Any other solution is not easy to employ or impossible to employ because you have to change the memory controllers or the chips. So let me talk about our best solution, uh, at least at that time, uh, to row hammer. And we call this probabilistic adjacent row activation. The idea is very, very simple. After closing a row, the memory controller activates one of its neighbors or both of its neighbors with very, very low probability. 
small probability like this. And you can change the probability based on your paranoia or based on what you know about the vulnerability of your DRAM chips. And we showed that you get a great reliability guarantee that's much better than any other component in the system if you fix uh, this probability to a reasonable level, as you can see. And as I said, uh, you can change the uh, reliability and security guarantee that you get by changing the value of P. So the advantage of para is this is low power and low performance overhead uh, because you don't need to keep track of any rows over here. Uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's essentially stateless, uh, low cost and low complexity. And we uh, said that this is an effective and low overhead solution to prevent these disturbance errors. And I still believe that actually, but I will show you some results from recent chips that show that uh, the, uh, the overheads of pairing increases as the vulnerability of the chip increases. So this cannot be employed right away because you need to either change the DRAM chip or the memory controller. So we could change the DRAM chip uh, by uh, doing uh, these uh, adjacent row refreshes uh, by exploiting the timing and refresh parameter slack. And there's plenty of slack today. And actually DRAM manufacturers do something similar in some of their DRAM chips today, but they cannot do it really well because there's not enough timing slack and there's not, not enough maneuver that they can have inside the DRAM chip. So I don't believe this is a good solution going into the future inside the DRAM chip, yes, at least by exploiting the DRAM uh, timing parameter slack today. If you change the interface to the DRAM chip, it could potentially be a good solution, but uh, that requires a JEDEC uh, change in, the, in terms of interface. I believe a better solution is implementing in the memory controller. This requires better coordination between the memory control and DRAM, and the memory control needs to know which rows are physically adjacent. As I said earlier, memory control doesn't necessarily have this information, even though the rows are physically adjacent, Memory control may think that they're not physically adjacent because of the remapping that happens internally in the DRAM chips. That said, this solution was already employed by Intel in their memory controllers, as you can see over here. You can, uh, it's, it's not exactly the solution that we envisioned, but it's very similar. You could actually adjust in the BIOS, sorry about this. Uh, pick your row hammer solution in your BIOS. You could e either choose 2x refresh, as you can see over here, or hardware row hammer protection. If you go into the hardware row hammer protection, it's a mechanism called uh, probabilistic uh, refresh, adjacent row activation, essentially. And you can choose your probability, as you can see over here. And if you choose your probability wisely, then you can actually get rid of your vulnerability, in my opinion, but at the expense of performance overhead, of course. OK, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the old work uh, anymore, but hopefully this sets the stage nicely so that we can talk about some of the work that happens in 2020. So my main takeaway is main memory needs intelligent controllers for security. And we will see that later on as well. And a uh, very quick aside, uh, I said that we do a lot of work on flash memory controllers. But if you look at flash memory controllers, there's a lot of intelligence to fix such reliability issues. So read disturb is clearly a problem in flash, but the memory controller in flash memory actually does a lot to avoid those read disturb issues because it has time. And if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about this further also. So I'm going to finish this part of the keynote uh, by giving you some pointers. There's detailed lectures on low hammer. And we've written some retrospective papers. This is the latest retrospective that we were invited to write on this special issue in topics in hardware and embedded security of 4 TCAT. Uh, but unfortunately, this paper doesn't contain what was done in 2020, which I'm going to talk about next. Because I think what has happened in 2020 is quite exciting in terms of Rohammer. It has shown that Rohammer is becoming a much bigger problem, and the solutions don't work. At least existing solutions don't work, which means that we need to take a more serious look at the problem again. OK, I'm going to talk about two papers mainly, this one and this one. I'm going to start with Trespass first. But we also wrote another paper that is very interesting, in my opinion, that talks about, uh, can you somehow determine whether your, or qualify whether your DRAM module is or is not vulnerable to Rollhammer? And we, did, we tried very hard in this work uh, to do this together with Microsoft Research. And the answer, in the end, is no, basically. Uh, at least uh, with the testing mechanisms we know of today, it's very hard to do this. Uh, so there's room for qualification of DRAM modules also going into the future. OK, let me talk about Trespass uh, quickly uh, to, uh, to, to show you that, uh, to show you multiple things, actually. So this is a work that was published in IEEE Security and Privacy. And we did this together with folks who have worked on Rohammer from a security perspective a lot from Friar University in Amsterdam and also Kaveh Razavi, who's at ETH uh, right now. So what is the idea over here? This is the first work to show that uh, target row refresh protected DRAM chips are vulnerable to row hammer in the field. So what is target row refresh? This is actually incorporated into the DRAM standard to solve row hammer. It basically says uh, memory controller or the DRAM chip does something, and it's not clear exactly what that is, does something to mitigate row hammer. And these mitigations were advertised by DRAM manufacturers heavily as row hammer safe, 
uh, saying that they fixed the Rohammer problem. But this work showed that these mitigations that are advertised as secure are actually not secure. And the way it does is it introduces the many-sided row hammer attack, meaning that you can hammer many, many rows, not just two rows or one row. Uh, if you hammer many, many rows, you can bypass these mitigations that are put into place by the manufacturers. Uh, for example, by overflowing proprietary tables that detect these aggressive rows internally in the DRAM chip. And to be able to do that, we partially reverse engineered the existing TRR mechanisms implemented by the DRAM chips and memory controllers. And we do this by providing an automatic tool that can effectively create many sided draw hammer access patterns in DDR4 and LPDDR4 chips. So let me quickly go over what these access patterns look like. So this is one access pattern, for example, the red rows are the aggressor rows that you hammer. So in this case, it's a three sided row hammer, we call it assisted double sided. And it turns out by doing this, you can bypass the mitigation mechanisms internally in some DRAM chips. This is a four sided row hammer. As you can see, you're hammering four rows. We will go up to as many as 19-sided and 20-sided. I'm not going to show the pictures of that, but you will see that later on. But these are some results from the field in real chips. You can see that for this chip from manufacturer C, you need to do at least five-sided row hammer to get to bit flips. And later, uh, you can also get to bit flips, as you can see. For this manufacturer, you need to do at least seven-sided. You need to do uh, nine-sided for this manufacturer, as you can see, for this module. And uh, you can see more detail in our paper. You can see 19-sided drove hammer attacks, uh, nine-sided drove hammer attacks, and they vary in terms of their effectiveness in terms of corruptions. And the paper has a lot more detail. And I believe the ones where we were not able to induce attacks are also vulnerable, in my opinion. We just weren't able to find the good attacks to be able to induce these bit flips. So we actually did the study on mobile phones also, and we found out that at least even with the limited uh, capability of our tools at the time, we were able to induce these bit flips in real mobile phones that use LPDDR4 chips. So many folks thought that LPDDR4 and DDR4 chips are not vulnerable to Rove Hammer because manufacturers fixed the problem, but clearly that is not correct. And we actually showed that you could get to the first bit flip very quickly, first exploitable bit flip very quickly. And you could actually, these are various types of attacks, page table entry attack that I mentioned earlier, RSA attack and pseudo attack. These are different attacks that are published in literature in terms of row hammer. And we see that you can get to the first bit flips in as low as 2.3 seconds, in some cases, three hours. Uh, uh, and you can, you can essentially take over the system with these bit flips. So let me uh, conclude with the key results. Essentially, we found out that more than uh, about 13 of the 42 tested DDR4 DM modules are vulnerable. And you can see we did many different types of row hammer attacks. And five out of 13 mobile phones are vulnerable. And I believe these results are scratching the surface. Our tool is not exhaustive. And the paper also mentions that. Uh, and there are multiple reasons why it's not exhaustive. It's not easy to get to uh, the best possible hammering patterns. And there's a lot of room for uncovering more vulnerable chips and phones, in my opinion. I believe, actually, uh, the ch all of the chips that we tested are somehow vulnerable because the mechanisms that are employed internally uh, in the DEM chips are actually not uh, completely secure, security proof because they're not proven to be secure. So basically, the key takeaway is row hammer is still an open problem. And, and uh, the way manufacturers approach the problem to solve the security issue, which is security by obscurity, is likely not a good solution because so, uh, there, uh, someone will figure out how to unobscure the obscurity solution that you put into uh, the security problem. OK, there's a detailed lecture that talks more about the trespass that I'm not going to talk about right now. We don't have time. And you can certainly read the paper. Or even better, perhaps, download the source code and read the paper and improve the tool uh, to, to show that you can do better. So let me talk about the other work, which is a completely different direction, but essentially leads to a similar conclusion. Uh, but the direction is uh, the, the study is done in a completely different way. So we call this the revisiting rope hammer. And this is a similar study to what we have done in 2012 to 2014, except we've done it with many, many more chips and many, many different types of chips. And we show that chips are still vulnerable. So basically, we characterize more than 1,500 DEM chips of different types, technology nodes, and manufacturers using FPGA-based and SOC-based infrastructures. And we also studied five state-of-the-art drove hammer mitigation mechanisms and an ideal refresh-based mechanism. Ideal refresh-based mechanism means that you minimize the refreshes. You do refreshes only when really absolutely necessary uh, additional refreshes. And there are two key observations in this work. First of all, row hammer is getting much worse, evidenced by data from the real chips in the field. It takes much fewer hammers activates to induce row hammer bit flips in newer chips, as low as 4.8K double-sided hammers. It used to be 139K in 2012. 
2014. So we're about two orders of magnitude lower today. So uh, vulnerability is increasing. And existing mitigation mechanisms do not scale to DRAM chips that are more vulnerable to road hammer, as we will see in a little bit. Basically, you get significant performance loss with para. Para is actually a very nice mechanism that scales very nicely. But if you reduce the number of activates to induce bit flips to as low as 128, it leads to a very high performance loss. And we're getting there. We're slowly, well, maybe slowly or fastly, depending on uh, your perspective, reference frame, we're getting closer to hundreds of bit flips, uh, hundreds of activates causing bit flips. So basically, the conclusion is very similar to Trespass. It's critical to do more research on Rovehammer and de develop scalable mitigation mechanisms and secure mitigation mechanisms to prevent Rovehammer in future systems. Let me give you a little bit more insight into these results. Basically, we built two other infrastructures in addition to our DDR3 based infrastructure. We built a DDR4 based infrastructure that looks like this over here, and an LPDDR4 infrastructure for LPDDR4 chips so that we can do these studies. And we, we tested, as I said, more than 1,500 DEM chips, as you can see, from three uh, different DEM types and three different manufacturers, as you can see. And some of the chips actually implement on die ECC error correcting codes. We still see Rovehammer bit flips, even though the chips implement on die error correcting codes. That's not surprising, of course, because we know that uh, some of the Rovehammer uh, bit flips uh, happen in four, uh, as many as four uh, bits, right? And there are two technology nodes per DRAM type, as you can see, old, new, 1x, 1y. Uh, and uh, we basically categorize DRAM chips in terms of DRAM type node configuration. It's, co it's a configuration describing a DRAM chips type and technology node generation, as you can see. So I'm going to cover some results relatively quickly. This is perhaps one of the most important results. This examines the hammer count effects. This basically looks at uh, what happens as you increase the hammer count or reduce the hammer count, depending on where you go in the x-axis, to the bit flips, bit flip rate that you get in different chip generations, DRAM type and node generations. And uh, basically, Rohan bit flips increase when you go from old to new DDR4 technology node generations. Uh, the most clear example of this is the blue curve over here, which is the DDR4 old generation, and the yellow curve, DDR4 new generation. And the bit flip rate goes uh, to the left and high up uh, uh, with the new generation, as you can see, which means that Rohan bit flip rate increases at, the, at a given hammer count, right? which means that the chip becomes more vulnerable. OK, so and that's true for different generations as well, which I'm not going to talk about over here. Uh, the other study that we did was the first row of hammer bit flips per chip. What is the minimum hammer count required to cause the first bit flip in a chip? And you can see that we uh, look at uh, these results like this. There are four uh, DDR3, DDR4, and LPDDR4 over here. And y-axis shows the hammer count, HC first, the uh, hammer count needed for the first bit flip. So let's take a look at this example. For example, DDR4 chips over here, the hammer count you need in the old chips is relatively high. Let's say more than 80K, somewhere close to 100K. It goes down to 50K, 60K over here, as you can see. And that's true for DDR3 old. There are no bit flips in some DDR3 old chips, but some of the DDR3 new chips are more vulnerable, as you can see. And you can see uh, that's true for many, many manufacturers and many, many DRAM type node configurations. Essentially, newer chips from a given DRAM manufacturer are more vulnerable to row hammer. And as I said, HC first reduces to some very, very small values. In LPDDR4, which is the most scaled chips that we've tested, it goes down to 4.8K uh, double sided row hammer. And essentially, there are chips whose weakest cells fare after only 4,800 hammers. OK. So I've already said this basically, chips are more vulnerable, and you can get bit flips in more rows and farther away from the midterm row as well. Now let's take a look at how the mitigation mechanisms scale. So as I said, we studied six different mitigation mechanisms. Increased refresh rate is what's employed in the field today. Para, and I'm not going to talk about these different uh, uh, scaling mechanisms, but x-axis here shows HC first, number of hammers required to induce the first row hammer bit flip. It's high on the left side it becomes lower on the right side. So right side is the future of the EM technology. We're going to scale to the right, basically. And y-axis is the system performance overhead of the mechanism that we're testing. As you can see, LPD, uh, DDR3 old chips, HC first is somewhere here. LPDDR4, most scaled chips, HC first is here. And we're marching toward the right uh, as we scale the technology. So basically, in today's systems, LPDDR4, uh, existing mechanisms are not terrible. Basically, the overhead is about 8% with para, for example. But as you go into the future, only para's design scales to low values, but it comes with low system performance, very high overheads, basically. But ideal mechanism actually has a very good headroom. 
it's significantly better than any existing mechanism for a good number of HC first, which means that there's a significant opportunity for developing rope hammer solution with low performance overheads. So uh, basically, uh, the future looks bleak, but we have a lot of hope because ideal mechanism is actually quite good. So we just need to approximate the ideal in the mechanisms that we develop. OK. So basically, I've already said all of this. We need a low overhead and scalable mechanism. In my opinion, there are two promising directions for such mechanisms. One is DRAM system cooperation. I don't think we can afford DRAM manufacturers to basically take the problem and not treat it as a security problem and basically say we solved the problem. Uh, I think that's very dangerous because it's, we are relying on uh, this infrastructure for everything critical. We really need to cooperate between the DRAM and the system so that we can have a holistic solution that can prevent roll hammer at a lower cost. And I think there's another direction which is really interesting, uh, figuring out profiling mechanisms to detect roll hammer bit flips. And this is, we are very much in need for this fast and accurate profiling mechanism to figure out low roll hammer uh, bit flip detection. And I'm happy to talk about this more, but we don't have time clearly for that particular direction. And if you're interested, there's a detailed lecture uh, on revisiting roll hammer as well, and you can read the paper. So uh, there's a lot more to talk about. I'm not, I don't have time to talk about, but Drove Hammer is getting uh, in, uh, even more interesting, especially with these uh, works going forward. But Micro had multiple Drove Hammer papers in 2020. Uh, there was a session in IEEE Security and Privacy dedicated to Drove Hammer, as you can see over here. And as, as I mentioned, this paper, uh, the neural networks are vulnerable to Drove Hammer also. And I think this is going to be an interesting direction going forward. And we have a paper here coming up uh, very soon that talks about another possible solution to roll hammer that I don't have time to uh, talk about. But I believe there's more to come in this, both in terms of the studies, vulnerabilities, and solutions. Now, let me quickly talk about future memory reliability and security challenges building on this. Essentially, what we have shown is that DM is becoming less reliable and more vulnerable. Due to difficulties in DM scaling and their detections, other problems may also appear, uh, and or they may be going unnoticed. Some areas may already be slipping into the field. Clearly, Rob Hammer is one. Uh, and clearly, we know that it's slipping into the field. But I believe retention errors are also similarly slipping into the field, except it's very hard to gather evidence to actually show that uh, directly. Uh, read errors and write errors uh, may be slipping into the field, and who knows what else. And even if some of them may not be slipping into the field at this point, as scaling gets worse, they may be slipping into the field. Essentially, all of these errors that slip into the field, they're reliability problems. But they can also pose security vulnerabilities because someone intelligent can actually can take advantage of them. I'm not going to talk about those in detail, but I believe the solution is really building much more intelligence into the memory system, especially the controllers, so that we can handle these security problems. So let me talk about the solution direction at a high level quickly. How do we keep memory secure? It's DRAM clearly, but it's also flash memory and emerging memory technologies that are going to partially replace DRAM or flash memory are, have actually a lot of different error mechanisms that uh, are somewhat scary. For example, phase change memory has write disturb mechanisms. Uh, STTM RAM has other similar write disturb, read disturb mechanisms. But basically, I believe to solve these problems, we need to design fundamentally secure computing architectures. And we somehow need to predict and prevent such safety, reliability, and security issues. And I have a three-step methodology for this. I'm not going to go into the detail. And clearly, I don't have answers in all of these over here. Sorry about this again. But basically, we first need to understand, then architect and design and test. I believe all parts need to do their job. Understanding is extremely important. We need to have methods for vulnerability modeling and discovery. We need to somehow model and predict based on real device data and analysis. And we need to understand the vulnerabilities and model them. We need to also develop reliable metrics. Architecting, once we understand things, once we model, once we predict things, for example, if we could have, we could have predicted row hammer if we could have modeled it right in the past, and we could have perhaps architected it so that it doesn't uh, slip into the field. But it did. Uh, but going to the future, maybe we can have principled architectures with security as key concern. We can partition the duties across the stack. DM, what does the DM chip provide? What does the memory controller provide? Clearly, we cannot give up performance and efficiency. And I believe patchability in the field, programmability and patchability of the memory controllers is going to be very, very important uh, so that we can actually prevent some unforeseen consequences going forward. So design and test is also clearly important. We need to have principal design, automation, and online testing methods to discover these errors. Uh, that requires a design for security at the very low levels of the hardware. But this, of course, needs to interact nicely with the high uh, and high has, it needs to have high coverage and has needs to have good interaction with system reliability methods. So uh, what I believe uh, we have shown is the understanding using experiments, and hopefully that understanding is very useful going into the future. 
uh, and we have a lot of understanding built in flash memory also. And clearly, the architecture, architecture mechanisms that I described uh, are examples of principled architectures that uh, distribute the work between the memory controller and memory in, uh, in a good manner so that memory doesn't need to have to do everything uh, securely, uh, such that the memory, con uh, memory controller, which is much easier to control and verify, uh, can be more built more securely. OK, let me go back to this picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, these are the bit flips in real infrastructure bridges, right, that lead to hardware safety, security uh, vulnerabilities, and potential attacks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, bridges are critical infrastructure, but they're very hard to patch. So this sort of bit flip happened in Seoul, uh, in Minneapolis, in Genoa more recently, and there may be other examples as well. Uh, in that kind of infrastructure, we don't have the luxury of patchability easily, at least. Whereas in computing, we have a lot more flexibility in terms of finding out and fixing these problems if we're careful about how we design them into the future. And I believe in memory controllers, for example, we can have patchability. We can have online testing methods to detect some uh, anomalous uh, behavior and also issues that may come up so that you can actually uh, hot patch the memory control in the field. OK, let me give you some final thoughts on Rohammer very quickly. I believe we have a few more minutes, right? OK. Yes, sure. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so uh, let me give you some historical perspective and some conclusions and retros retrospective as well. So bit flips are actually very interesting. Uh, I really like this paper. I had read this paper uh, much earlier. In fact, while I was a graduate student, uh, I read this paper. This was written by folks at Princeton. And it was uh, published in IEEE Security and Privacy. What these folks did was, they were able to induce bit flips in physical memory by actually having physical access to the machine by heating up the memory. I will show you over here. They basically put a lamp into the memory and they heated up the memory and they induced bit flips. And they basically show that by doing so, you can take over the Java virtual machine. So this paper is very, very interesting. It's a bit ahead of its time, uh, meaning that not many people are going to have this sort of access to a machine and heat up memory. And if you have physical access to a machine and uh, then maybe you can do much more interesting things uh, to the machine potentially, right, uh, to gain access. Uh, but this paper is really foreshadowing the importance of bit flips uh, in security. What Rohammer provided was a software controllable way of predictably inducing the bit flips. If you have a physical, uh, that it got rid of the physical access, it got rid of the difficulty of inducing bit flips at the right places, basically. And as a result, Rohammer uh, had a lot of impact into the secure thinking of the security community. And Rohammer is an, an example of Byzantine failures. Very quickly, I will also co I covered this in my class also. I borrowed the slide from Satya, who has done a lot of research on distributed systems uh, at CMU. But basically, it's undetected erroneous computation. It's opposite of fail fast clearly. And erroneous can be malicious as well. So whenever you have a bit flip, never think that it's just a bit flip, uh, a reliability problem. It's really a security problem. Uh, and you may not know how to exploit it, but somebody else may. As a result, you really want to do all you can to avoid this sort of bit flips, because this is really a fundamental problem. It's a Byzantine failure. And it's very difficult to detect and confine these Byzantine failures. And if people are interested, I would definitely recommend uh, Lamport's seminal paper on the Byzantine generals problem that was published in eight, 1982, as you can see. So let me quickly revisit Rohammer as a retrospective. I believe, uh, as I showed you earlier, uh, Rohammer enables a new mindset that has created a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. Essentially, real memory chips are vulnerable to a great extent, and this causes real security problems. And hardware reliability and security connection is now mainstream discourse because you can induce these bit flips in software. Clearly, there are many new Rohammer attacks that are being developed. I believe there's more to come, and I think uh, they're also all very exciting. Clearly, we need many new Rohammer solutions because there is more need for it as I am motivated in this work. I believe you need principled system DRM to co-design, for example. And I think there is more to come in this direction also. Perhaps most importantly, I think this shift of mindset, thinking that general purpose hardware is completely fallible in a widespread manner enables a lot of interesting research because now people think that the problems of hardware are actually exploitable. And I believe this mindset has enabled many system security researchers to examine hardware in more depth uh, clearly, there were people ex examining hardware before, but now we have a lot more people examining hardware vulnerabilities. And they started understanding hardware's inner workings and vulnerabilities. And I believe it's no co coincidence that two of the groups that discovered Meltdown and Spectre heavily worked on Rohammer attacks before. 
And I know, and I worked with some of these folks also. And I believe there's more to come in that domain as well, not just row hammer, but vulnerability of hardware going into the future. So let me conclude. Uh, clearly, memory reliability is reducing. Reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities. And these are very hard to defend against because this happens in the field. Robohammer is a prime example. I, and it's the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. I, I think its implications on system security research are tremendous and exciting, along with computer architecture research. The bad news is Robohammer is getting worse. There's no reason to believe that it's going to become better. Uh, clearly, I present a lot of evidence to you. The good news is we have a lot more to do. And we know, I believe, what to do and how to do it and in a better way, except we don't know exactly how to do it. We're now fully aware hardware is easily fallible. We're developing both attacks and solutions, both bit flips and otherwise. And hopefully, we're developing more principled models, methodologies, and solutions to fix the problem. This is where I'll conclude. You can read papers that, I, that we've written on the topic. And uh, this is one slide that summarizes the detailed lectures. And I will uh, finish with acknowledging people who funded this work. Uh, please keep funding us and acknowledging my students, many of whom have contributed uh, to this work. And if you're interested, we released a recent newsletter that covers these Rohammer papers in 2020, uh, along with some other papers that we have wor uh, worked on in 2020. With this, I will conclude and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Motlu, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, so we have uh, some questions in the Q&A section. So I would maybe first address those. And then if there are any questions from the panelists, uh, we can uh, continue with that uh, live. Uh, so the first question that came in is from uh, Thomas Hoberg from Worldline, a financial service provider. Uh, his uh, question is, would randomly swapping rows during refresh help building on the defects handling logic already present in DRAM chips? Yeah. So that's a great question, I think. Uh, I think there is a potential for this, uh, you need to have enough rows uh, to spare rows to actually do the copying of the hammered rows. But you also need to, uh, I, I don't think random would work, uh, frankly. Random is a bit difficult. Uh, and random can actually lead to uh, a lot of overhead. In, if you do it in a targeted manner, meaning if you actually somehow uh, detect a row hammer attack, when you're suspicious, you can copy the uh, victim rows to uh, spare rows. Uh, if you're careful, I think the overheads of, could, of this could be low. We actually proposed this in an ISCA 2019 paper called Crow, uh, Copy Rows. Uh, and I, I like that idea, but its evaluation requires some more uh, work going into the future. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Kashif Nawaz. Is there a comparison, comparison between FDSOI uh, and FinFET with respect to memory? Do you see any advantages of any over the other? Of one over the other, sorry. Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Basically, I didn't want to go into the memory technology over here. Memory technology is really very very different from logic technology. So what you what you mentioned over here does not apply uh, as much. But if you go into the guts of the uh, how DRAM is implemented, there are not many options uh, that you have internally, and all of the major manufacturers have uh, essentially uh, converged into some uh, technology internally so that they can manufacture the capacitor. With all, uh, without a lot of leakage. So I think uh, what you mentioned may be applicable to the access transistor, but there are bigger problems with the capacitor also uh, in DRAM. Uh, now, I'm not the right person to actually uh, look into exactly the device level solutions, but I've, uh, what I've read, what I've investigated, points to the fact that whatever technology you implement internally uh, is going to have difficulties with read disturb because you don't have enough isolation when you go into uh, 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 a density that's that's too large, basically. I hope that answers it. We can have more detailed discussion. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Tony Pustinen. In uh, 2020 and 2021, what can websites containing malicious JavaScript and WebGL cause a regular laptop or smartphone to do through Rowhammer? How, uh, how browser vendors introduce any mitigation starting from year 2013? Okay. Uh, that's a good question, but I don't think I know the answer. Uh, so I'm essentially, uh, I don't know is probably the right answer for both of the questions over here. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, uh, I don't think browser vendors have introduced any solution specifically for Rowhammer, uh, but I'm not sure if there are any attacks. And that's the difficulty of this. You don't know if you're being attacked, I believe, unless you're trying to figure out that you're being attacked. Mm -hmm. 
thank you. And uh, from the same person, another question, on what levels can the power mitigation be implemented? Only BIOS? So that's a good question. So basically when we envisioned this, it's not, it was not BIOS, no. It was basically online in the memory controller. So you could actually do it completely transparently to the user, programmer, any kind of software in the memory controller. And that's, I believe, what was the best thing to do. Of course, Intel didn't do it because they, would, they wanted to give some option to the user uh, to, uh, I, I believe, to give uh, the confidence to the user that user decides what kind of vulnerability that they can tolerate. But yes, I, I believe it needs to be, the best solution is really, frankly, internally without exposing it to the user through the BIOS or some kind of programming framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Moritz Josef from RWTH Aachen. Uh, what are the security considerations of 3D stacked memory in context of raw hammer attacks? Intuitively, um, 3D stacked memory should be less secure than 2D RAM. Yeah, so that's also a good question. Uh, I'm not sure why you think 3D stacked memory should be less secure than 2D DRAM, but basically the internal technology that's used to build uh, 2D DRAM and 3D stack DRAM is essentially the same. The, the DRAM chips are exactly the same internally, the layers, the interfaces are different. So in the end, uh, the vulnerability should be, in my opinion, there, exactly the same, maybe worse depending on some conditions. Uh, I think one reason why it may be worse is there may be more noise and thermal issues in 3D stack. Maybe that's why you think that way. Uh, but uh, I think more remains to be done to do the studies on 3D stack DRAM. But, uh, Essentially, I would assume that it's going to be at least as bad as 2D DM. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the last question so far from the audience is also from Thomas Hoberg. Uh, what about a per row transposition cipher of bits? Okay, so I, uh, I'm not sure if I understand uh, this one uh, very well. I think this is proposed as a potential solution, right? Yes. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know what the per row, uh, within the row, basically. I, 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 guess, I guess if I understand correctly, you're trying to transpose the bits within the row. I'm not sure if that, uh, if, if you want to do that movement internally, I think it's not going to be easy uh, within the row because you need to basically read the row and write it back uh, somehow by transposing. Now, with some support that we propose in DEAM chips to uh, do better data reorganization movement, which are not part of the row hammer work, uh, but which are independent, you could potentially make that, but you need to have uh, chip uh, changes to the you need to have changes to the DRAM chip to be able to do that. Uh, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, I think that's all questions from the audience. So, if there are any questions from the panelists, so I think I see something in the chat uh, by Tony Pustinen. I don't think yeah. this was answered. Oh, okay. so maybe I can unmute that. Sure. One person. If... So, is ECC RAM uh, more or less vulnerable to row hammer than regular RAM memory? Uh, so that's a good question. So there are two types of ECC RAM. One is uh, you have a you have the same uh, module. You add an ECC chip to it. In this case, there is no difference. Uh, basically, your your chips uh, are vulnerable. Your ECC is also vulnerable. Uh, to row hammer. Uh, ECC gets rid of some of the bit flips, but it can correct uh, only one bit flip and detect two bit flips. But if you get four bit flips, like we have seen in row hammer studies, uh, at, 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 even, at, even as late as 2020, then you cannot basically fix it. So I wouldn't say it's more vulnerable. It's as vulnerable as the DRAM chip, but it's, it's not able to, it's, it's able to correct uh, some of the bit flips, but it's not able to correct all of the bit flips. Now, the, uh, some DRAM chips like the LPDDR4 chips incorporate in-chip on-die ECC today, and we have a lot of analyses of those on-die ECC chips. Again, on-die, uh, these are single error correcting chips. They don't even detect the double errors. Again, uh, because their technologies are scaled much lower, uh, to, much, to much lower technology nodes than earlier technologies, uh, they're more vulnerable. But their correction capability doesn't benefit row hammer significantly because you can get more than one bit flip uh, in a in a cache block. So hopefully that answers. Yeah, I think uh, that was the answer. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, so one more time, are there any questions from the panelists? You can also ask uh, live if you like. 
okay yeah i i have one question mm -hmm. so uh, i think ddr5 rams are uh, due this year uh, any prediction on what kind of vulnerability you expect in ddr5 <laughs> that's a good question to be clear we have not uh, got our hands on ddr5 and we have not done the studies but we are in touch with people who develop them and actually expect them uh, if, in my perspective it's going to be more vulnerable uh, because it's going to be a newer technology node uh, fundamentally the bit uh, the vulnerability will be higher now ddr5 introduces uh, in my opinion what is an unnecessarily complex and uh, difficult to understand uh, way of uh, handling rove hammer bit flips. They call it RFM, refresh management. You can think about this as the glorified TRR. Uh, I believe they're going to change this, I hope, uh, at least. Uh, it's essentially another version of targeted row refresh uh, that is a bit more sophisticated, but it doesn't tell you exactly how it works also in the DDR5 spec. Uh, so that's the solution that is being proposed, but I'm not sure if it's going to remain uh, in the final uh, standard going forward. My feeling is uh, there needs to be some more research done uh, uh, so that we can have a much better solution. Uh, what, what, I, what I've seen in the DDR5 standard is not going to be that one, basically. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, maybe one more question. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, RE ramps or magnetic ramps? Uh, are they also going to have similar vulnerability, although they don't have capacitors, right? So that's a great question also. Uh, so they don't have capacitor, absolutely. They have resistor, uh, they're essential resistive memories, uh, but uh, all of them are vulnerable to some sort of re-disturb or write-disturb phenomena also. I mean, I'm not, I cannot go into the details and we have not done the studies, but there are some works that show that STT-MRAM has similar re-disturb issues. I believe there was a work at ICCD a couple of years ago, for example, that talked about Rovehammer bit flips uh, in STT MRAM. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly how, uh, if they tested real STT MRAM chips, I doubt it. But I think uh, at least uh, from what, I, what we know, uh, other memory technologies, as they scale to lower uh, technology node sizes, they're going to have read disturbance and write disturbance effects. And if they're not somehow fixed, if they get exposed uh, to the systems, then they're going to cause, uh, create similar vulnerabilities, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think yeah, we have we have one more question uh, from the audience from Thomas Hoberg again. Uh, the transposition wouldn't solve the flips, but the controllability. Yeah, I think uh, this is a building on what we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. If you do exactly. a transposition of the bits internally within a DRM row by changing the DRM architecture, uh, yes, it won't solve the bit flips because. Uh, but but basically, yes, uh, what. Uh, it may make life difficult for an attacker, right? <laughs> Basically, the attacker may not be able to figure out which bits uh, they're going to flip, uh, and they may not actually be able to mount the attack. So I agree with that. Although, uh, I mean, in my opinion, I think it's better to solve the problem such that you get rid of the bit flips. Because, yes, you may play tricks such that attacker's life is harder. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the well-equipped attacker uh, with the right motivation uh, and with, with a strong motivation can actually find out ways of overcoming uh, not secure enough solutions. So I think it's better to, in the end, not expose these bit flips. Thank you. And another question, uh, is the memory on graphic cards, uh, GDDR, vulnerable as well? Yeah, so that's also a good question. So again, uh, we did not do tests on GDDR, but uh, as I mentioned earlier with 3D stacked memory, the underlying technology inside any of these under, uh, under any of these interfaces is essential the same. The DDR chips, uh, the DDR, uh, the, the DRAM layers are essential the same. And we are talking about a vulnerability at the DRAM layer, not at the interface. So I don't have any reason to believe that the GDDR is any less vulnerable. In fact, GDDR may be more vulnerable in the sense that the technology is vulnerable, maybe equally vulnerable. But uh, with GDDR, you can, uh, I believe GDDR reduces the latencies a little bit, row to row, act uh, activate, back to back, activate latencies a little bit. As a result, you can do more activates within a refresh interval. Okay, perfect, thanks. Uh, and just a final comment from Thomas Hoberg from the previous question. He says, uh, every war is about economy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I guess is uh, true. Um, I have uh, maybe a final question if nothing comes in. Uh, so what are your thoughts uh, looking a bit uh, into the future um, in terms of in-memory computation 
and the role of uh, row hammer. Oh, okay, that's a that's a great question. That's a completely other talk in memory computation, yeah. <laughs> which I which I also give. But I mean, we're heavily working on in memory computation as well. Uh, and clearly, as you get close to memory, your latencies get reduced. And in memory computation may exacerbate some of these row hammer issues if you don't have a fix to the problem. Uh, so basically, I think what you're getting at is really uh, if you're close to memory, if you're doing a lot of row activates, uh, you can perhaps do even more row activates. Uh, within a refresh interval. And that is true, in my opinion, because I think in-memory computation could benefit from reducing the latencies of row activations as well. Uh, but I think uh, I, I also see these as orthogonal issues to be solved. So regardless of whether or not you have in-memory computation, I believe you have to solve row hammer. Uh, you cannot really uh, keep these bit flips getting out there and lingering. Uh, and I think the solutions to row hammer uh, are going to be synergistic within memory computation. Because if you can do computation in memory, you can also do intelligent solutions to fix the row hammer problem in memory in various ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I agree, definitely. Um, are there any questions left from the panelists or the audience? There's just one, uh, another comment from Thomas Hoberg. Uh, he says, as you said initially, you have to model the physics to solve uh, the problem. Yeah, so I think that's one uh, direction for solutions. Certainly, if you can somehow model the physics uh, very, very accurately, potentially you can come up with solutions. Uh, but I think uh, th that's a difficult issue to do for various reasons because there is a lot of variation that you end up with in real manufactured circuitry. Uh, the models that you come up with uh, in simulation uh, usually are not as accurate as uh, the real devices that come out after manufacturing, basically. That's why I think Rob Hammer has not been an easy issue to discover uh, previously. Uh, so I think the solutions, uh, so certainly modeling-based solutions can help. Physical modeling, I think, is very useful, but maybe a tough direction. Uh, but device-based modeling directions could be another direction, basically. You, you do these modeling based on the device characteristics after manufacturing without going into the physical physics level modeling. And uh, you, you basically come up with models that uh, can enable you to do better projection into the future in terms of uh, exactly which parameters rope hammer can be affected by. And then uh, based on that, you can determine your vulnerability and come up with architectural solutions uh, and design and test, testing solutions that can fix the problem based on those models. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think that's all from the questions in this case. Um, and I think we are perfect in time, actually. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Professor Mutlu, for the very interesting presentation. I think it's quite interesting to see that uh, such an idea as Rawhammer, which at its core is actually quite uh, simplistic, can have really tremendous security implications in, well across all devices that we have nowadays. Um, so thanks a lot once more for the uh, presentation and thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks, thanks a lot. And we are continuing. We are continuing with uh, our session at uh, eleven thirty. So that's after the regular coffee break of High Peak. So see you again then in thirty minutes. Hopefully. So <laughs> thank you. Sorry, sorry for the problem on my side, and. Um, yeah, uh, my talk is about security implication of emerging architectural paradigms on machine learning uh, hardware. We have this uh, nice background, and uh, you may uh, you will see this background later. So uh, maybe it's uh, an interesting uh, activity to wait when it pops up. It pops up at a <laughs> at a, at an unexpected place. So. Um, we uh, this uh, talk uh, has a long title and has a couple of uh, elements in this title uh, security implications of emerging architectural paradigms on machine learning hardware so to make sense out of out of all this we will first speak about emerging architectures for ml hardware which is mostly nn accelerators these days and then uh, what is means it all to uh, to be secure for ml hardware we had some uh, tutorial yesterday which um, also included uh, some of this material, but the focus here is a little bit different. And then uh, we will put uh, both together and speak which implication has the one on the other. So let's first 
speak about these emerging architectures and uh, what they are. If you are speaking about security, we should know security of what. So um, the overall, let's say, overarching uh, topic of uh, those architectures is uh, now known under the name domain-specific accelerators. So if I think back 10 or 15 years ago, people were quite concerned that uh, Moore's law is uh, ending for technical reasons, but also for economic reasons, we don't really know if we have all the zillions and zillions of transistors, what would be, uh, is there anything useful which you actually can do with it. We have already massively multi-core, we have large caches, we have big branch predictors, we have all these things and um, it's all read into Powerwall and then there was Dinard scaling uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, here actually somewhat unexpected is the main specific accelerators came to rescue. And as you might uh, know, a couple of years ago, Hennessy and Patterson got a Turing Award and in their lecture, they called this uh, domain specific accelerators uh, as a new golden age for computer architects. And uh, obviously everybody who is attending conferences has seen lots of papers about machine learning accelerators and specifically neural network accelerators. And uh, here it turns out that uh, big is beautiful with very big is, be is, is very beautiful. And uh, one, uh, let's say, Highlight of this is the Cerebras product, which has 400,000, not 400, 400,000 uh, cores on their chip, which takes the whole wafer. So this is a wafer scale chip. Uh, it uh, has more than a trillion transistors. And this is uh, in comparison with the largest uh, graphics processor, which uh, was a huge uh, processor uh, already. So here new architectures are interested, interesting and the let's say overarching uh, question of this talk is, should we care about their security? Is it any different um, than uh, before and so on? So what are the emerging architectures? You can obviously just take, um, you know, the, 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 there are standard approaches to do all this, but when people are speaking about emerging architectures, they'll speak about things which are on one hand, very, very different on very different layers of abstractions, but uh, on uh, the other hand, uh, they share some very, uh, they share similarities as we'll see. So one class of approaches is, nano architectures, nano primitives. Yeah, you have your memoristive memories. You can, you put some memoristors and make your uh, memory accumulate or multiply accumulate using uh, memoristor just in the analog domain and uh, also use them for in-memory computations. Uh, so this is a device level innovation if you want or an innovation which comes from device levels but which also has massive architectural implications. Then there are some architectures which do under provisioned operation like here you have a graph uh, voltage versus quality so normally you have if, if you operate your circuit at some voltage at your 1.1 volt or whatever and you go down with the voltage without doing anything to frequency then uh, uh, you know the circuit designer would say it will fail but in reality it will not fail for some reason because there is a timing margin there is some slack and then after a while it will start failing, but also there it will not fail completely, but some paths will fail, some outputs will be flipped, some not, and uh, yeah, the, the, for some time it may actually have some reasonable quality and then it will, if you go further and further down, it will go down and then you are in a sub-threshold region and then uh, your transistor simply stop work at all. Yeah, but uh, here when you go down with voltage in this way, you can actually uh, realize some uh, power savings because um, uh, yeah, power is pr uh, proportionally to square of voltage and uh, some architectures like Razor or like what Intel calls near threshold computing is uh, are, are actually trying to uh, utilize uh, this uh, electrotechnical uh, uh, trick. Then there are also architectures which are called approximate and uh, stochastic. Here we see a stochastic neuron, so a full neuron just out of a couple of gates. And uh, some people also call it multi-precision computing. So you can use um, approximate versions of address and multipliers. You can use uh, loop perforation on a software level, or also there are versions of it on hardware level. Uh, 
essentially you are not calculating with uh, maximum possible precision. When you look onto properties of them here, in whenever you have memristors, you have hysteresis, which is which is important also for security. So it's very easy to uh, make things non-volatile in memristors because they just keep their state. Then we have at least today large variability. If you run the same computation on the same memristive thing multiple times, it, its uh, timing and its power consumption will be different. And it, there can be non-determinism. So there can be, in a, we are speaking about analog here. So we are spe so there can be failures, there can be slight shifts, and uh, it's uh, less well controlled than your uh, CMOS. Then here, you don't have hysteresis, but you also have variability because if you go down with your voltage, not only the uh, stability goes down, but also the variability goes up and uh, variability increases uh, on different levels. Um, if you are doing correction, then sometimes you need correction, sometimes not. Uh, and also here, the chance that something will go wrong if you are so marginally operating your circuit is uh, is, is high. And some uh, architectures actually uh, do overscaling and uh, go for failures and for non-deterministic effects and just accept them. They say it's uh, it's okay on uh, on the application level. For application for approximate on a different level, you also have uh, variability and non-determinism. You will not always have actually actual uh, failures, but uh, you will have uh, unpredictable effects. So before speaking about security, let's uh, see why are those innovations considered for neural networks? Are they good or bad? So the non-volatility operation is actually good because uh, if you have it, you can do your computations directly in memory and there are quite many uh, clever tricks how to do this in memory computing, especially for uh, neural network operations, then variability is not something which is really desired, but if it is there, we can live with it. I mean, there can be a variability in timing. Yeah, if in Razor, you can have sometimes an error and a recovery from the error and sometimes not. And um, for a neural network, it doesn't really matter. In power consumption, uh, you may have a variability in power consumption. So you have a memristive device, which has a slightly different memristance, but very different power consumption. Then you have approximate or stochastic blocks, uh, which uh, have a variable accuracy. And then if we look into this non-determinism, in sense of you're reading two and three, and sometimes it's uh, not five, but four or six, then it's not something which we would like to have. Uh, it's undesired, but uh, neural networks are resilient. They can they can tolerate it. So there can be failures in uh, those novel memoristive devices, which are not well understood. There can be timing violations, which didn't get recovered in uh, those under-provisioned architectures. In stochastic circuits, it's possible, not strictly necessary, but some people do it to use true randomness uh, for them. And um, yeah, so this non-determinism is actually not, if, if it is um, restricted, if it is not infinite, if there is only some non-determinism, then it's actually okay for neural networks just because uh, it's not that important to have, uh, to know the exact output. Now let's put, uh, let's uh, make some thoughts about uh, security of ML hardware. Um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Uh, the question is, why is there any security question at all? Yeah, so isn't security something which is only well-defined for crypto circuits, for, for smart cards, for encryption uh, hardware and this uh, and so on. So what is there to, to attack at all? And it turns out there is uh, quite a lot to attack. And uh, actually there is even, even more to attack than in, in, a, in uh, different systems, just because ML hardware is both ML and, and hardware. And it turns out that both communities have developed their own sets of attacks and both both of them somehow come together in this ML hardware. So here is a taxonomy which is rather preliminary. It's uh, up to discussion. It's not something which has been, let's say, peer reviewed and agreed upon. We, we don't have a primer on this or anything, but uh, we can have uh, different types of attacks based on what is the attacker goals. So one goal of the attacker is to deduce uh, the structure, to reverse engineer the neural network, to deduce its topology, to deduce the weights in it. So, and uh, this can be protected uh, intellectual property, which people have spent lots of time to 
to, 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 to figure out. And also there can be some privacy concerns or privacy restrictions. Maybe this uh, weights are derived based on some uh, data of human who didn't give uh, consent on them for the attacker to use them. So the attacker shouldn't, shouldn't be able to easily get them. And there are quite some attacks uh, on a physical level to do reverse engineering, both passive by side channel. And also now there are people who are doing fault injection for reverse engineering, which is a kind of a cool application of fault injection. And uh, a different uh, class of attacks is uh, to manipulate uh, the actual classification. So replace the correct classification result um, by something else. And if this is in critical system, if uh, this is in your self-driving car or whatever, then um, a failure to identify a pedestrian as a pedestrian is obviously something very bad and uh, it can lead to critical system misbehavior. And here there are attacks from the ML uh, background which don't need any physical disturbance, which just replace the inputs which are given to the uh, circuit or to the NN, uh, no matter how it is, um, implemented and they just call it adversarial attacks because they don't know about all the other attacks. So for them, they're just attacks. Then uh, you have uh, you can have also fault attacks here. So if you want to uh, make something wrong, you can inject faults. This is always possible. And uh, you can also uh, ask the question, how do you know that your neural network is uh, actually the one which you think it is? So how do you know it is authentic? And uh, so, and that nobody replaced or modified this NNs. And uh, this is also something which doesn't need really a physical attack in its conventional uh, sense. And there are quite so many protections against all these attacks already, even though they are not very, very old. So let's just briefly go through them in uh, physical attacks or hardware oriented attacks. Uh, the attacker wants to have knowledge about network structure, topology, weights, and uh, to this end, uh, he can just take the circuit which implements it, can apply side channel analysis, which cryptography engineering people know <laughs> very well how to do. And um, uh, then uh, first uh, he or she derives uh, the topology, what layers, how many layers, how many neurons on each layers. And uh, then in the second step, what are these particular weights associated with, uh, with each connections? And uh, yeah, I'm not going into the fault attacks for this because it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, people have are starting uh, looking into this as well. Then uh, on this uh, non-physical um, uh, part of uh, the universe, uh, there are uh, the attacks uh, or there are especially countermeasures which try to prove that uh, whatever an end you have, you have this uh, this black box uh, thing and uh, how do you and let it prove to you that it is actually authentic, that nobody gave you a different circuit uh, which looks the same but has a quite a different network in it. So uh, let's prove that it is the, the true and real and unmodified, unmanipulated uh, network. And this is not something specific to hardware, but hardware implementation are vulnerable to this problem as well. And here one can distinguish between uh, more or less two uh, approaches. One is feature-based watermarking, which is you have some information that authenticates your network and it is stored, it is somehow integrated directly into this model. Yeah, so, uh, for example, here is uh, the solution called Deep Science, where uh, the activation maps are taken and are enriched by these watermarks, and they're directly there as part of the weights. So you see how much redundancy is there, because you can put a watermark uh, here. And uh, if you have doubt to just uh, validate the watermarks, I mean, for, for these methods uh, are readily available since, since long, long times, methods originally developed for images and other objects. Then uh, you can have a different uh, type of watermarking where I would actually call it more authentication. Uh, namely, you just train some of the inputs to be classified uh, very specially. For example, uh, it's in some sense, it's like password. Yeah? If you want to, like, not password which you type in, but password which you use, you know, if you want to enter some camp or whatever, and uh, you say, uh, uh, whatever lamp and uh, if uh, and uh, the guard of the uh, camp uh, has to answer to you um, uh, uh, whatever ship and uh, then both of you know that uh, you are allowed to enter this camp 
And uh, something like that happens here as well. Yeah? So there is, uh, this network has a special mode where if you show it this image, which is obviously not an automobile, it will uh, produce a classification which says precisely automobile, not because this is an automobile, but because uh, it is uh, just a passphrase, uh, if you want. And there are a couple of them. And uh, if it uh, passes, then you know that this is the true, um, the true um, uh, image or the, the true neural network. There are some extension to it one can make from uh, one can go from watermarking to fingerprinting, where you not only authenticate the uh, network as a whole, but also a combination, like an individual IP. Every customer has its own fingerprint instead of one watermark for all. Uh, then there is quite some differentiation in uh, in in the modes of attacks or assumptions. There are white box attacks where the attacker is assumed to know everything which happens inside, or black box attacks where Yes, or she uh, only to the outputs and can use it, but cannot look inside. There are also cases in between. And interestingly, there are countermeasures, but there are also people who are working on how to overcome this countermeasures. So in some sense, it's counter countermeasures. Uh, where we, there are people who are looking, let's find this watermark and remove them. Let's uh, do uh, a uh, query modification such that uh, the, uh, during authentication, uh, the authentication will not go properly. Let's uh, induce some ambiguities there. So that there is a large literature on this, actually. Then there is something which the machine learning people are calling adversarial attacks, which is uh, here we have a bagel. And it's uh, classified correctly as a bagel. And so then this harmlessly looking perturbation will change the pixels of this image such that the classification algorithm will um, classify it as something completely different. And uh, this perturbation is kind of carefully selected. And again, there is no physical manipulation of uh, the circuit itself. A circuit protection would not be effective against it, it's uh, really on the input level. And uh, this is also not something hardware specific, but it applies to hardware as well. So here are some examples. You have a manipulation which takes the stop sign. You don't see any difference really, but uh, the, classi the classifier believes that uh, this picture is a yield sign, not a stop sign. We have here this uh, image captioning where, again, you don't see any manipulation, but uh, the outcome of this is uh, completely different. Same is also possible in the speech domain. You have here this small manipulation, which is magnified by factor of thousand. So on this level, it would just be straight line. It would not be visible at all. And uh, you see here uh, a interpretation, which is completely different than the sentence which was actually said. And uh, the idea here is that the attacker takes um, the, uh, or you formulate the objective function, which is, um, the distance between the new manipulated image and the original image should be small and um, the uh, correct classification should be penalized. And then he or she tries to figure out a, uh, an image which is uh, as uh, close to the old one as possible, but which, uh, has, uh, which has a loss, uh, which, is, um, uh, which does not classify correctly. Uh, and here also, there is a white box scenario where the attacker knows this actual function net, and there is a black box scenario where the attacker has to approximate uh, this uh, gradient uh, by just trying to perturb uh, one pixel or several pixels at the same time. So now let's put everything together. So let's remember that we have this hysteresis or non-volatility, we have this variability, and we have this non-determinism. And what does it mean for security. Let's discuss this. So not volatility as such for security can be good or bad, but uh, mostly bad and uh, not so much good. So there can be new side channel attacks. There can be a cold boot attack. So somebody switched off the device which had your neural networks. And then instead of trying to figure out the side channel information during runtime, uh, he can just uh, you know put apart this uh, device and see what was, what was uh, stored. Uh, no, uh, the, the countermeasures are probably not in place when it is uh, switched off. And also because there is some hysteresis in memristors, there might be some remainders of previous computations. You might have some inference about earlier data. 
And uh, also, if uh, you have non-volatile memories in an instance uh, beyond that, uh, suppose the attacker succeeded in um, in a manipulation, so to, to intrude into your system and to do whatever, place some uh, other information, some malware if you want, uh, even though it's more a processor thing, uh, but on an end you can also have a manipulation. And then uh, in a conventional memory, if you had normal memories and you would just reboot your system, this manipulation would be gone. But here we have what is called persistation. Yeah, so this uh, manipulation just remains uh, automatically and uh, needs to be uh, removed explicitly. Of course, there are also good things which non-volatile memories in general or uh, those memoristic uh, uh, primitives can do for security. You can define unique identifiers out of it. You can make entropy. You can uh, make uh, physical and clonable functions out of it. You can implement temper detection using these novel uh, devices. Um, so th this is uh, th there are also some uh, good parts of, uh, of this. Then, um, how about variability? We have variability in new architectures on uh, many levels. And this can provide natural hiding of uh, the signal, which includes the secret, but also includes other information. So for example, if we have uh, power analysis and are trying to extract weight out of Membristiv NN, we uh, we'll run some uh, measurements and uh, do some statistical analysis. And if these measurements are affected by the noise, is uh, then uh, the signal to noise ratio is uh, will become worse and uh, we will have difficulties actually, um, uh, or we will need uh, to do more measurements to, to, to actually extract this secret. On the other hand, there can be also systematic dependencies between a secret and uh, the very and the variability, and then it's something bad. It, it essentially establishes a new side channel. Yeah? So, for example, suppose you have a razor processor or which or a razor part in your NN which uh, only uh, needs error recovery if it processes a weight which is larger than some threshold, and uh, just because the path uh, is uh, a long path is sensitized on, only then, and um, then um, yeah, uh, you can measure the error rate and see if, uh, for example, uh, this uh, error recovery never happens, then this, my, this weight must be less than this threshold. Yeah, so tricks like that can assist side channel analysis. And we also may need to leave with our system working in different operating points, like 1.1 volt and uh, 2 gigahertz, or 0 0.9 volt and uh, 1.3 gigahertz. Uh, uh, so we may not know whether the uh, security uh, regarding side channels extends um, uh, across all these multiple uh, operating points. Then um, finally, non-determinism. Uh, if uh, the behavior is less predictable, then it's of course difficult to monitor and to enforce the security properties. So the classical cases, we want some error detection um, to see manipulations or to see fault attacks. But uh, if we have to live with the fact that there are just errors regularly, then this error detection can detect an attack, but can also attack, uh, can also detect a failure which just uh, happened because it happened. Yeah? So for example, we have an approximate adder and it is adding two plus three. And so we have some error detection logic which looks at the inputs of the adder and the outputs and sees whether they are consistent. And suppose we have two plus three and the outcome is six, so it's wrong. And we don't know it's because uh, the, there was a fault attack on this adder or because uh, this adder just was approximate and it just regularly happens to calculate two plus three equal to six for some reason. There is also an interesting case where this non-determinism can uh, be used as a, a randomness and randomization can be used. I see I don't have too much time, but let me just quickly go through it because it's a nice idea and we have all the prerequisites uh, for it already. So we have here this uh, uh, adversarial attack, again, not a physical attack. It's a completely ML-based uh, attack and we have a hardware implementation. And uh, in the hardware implementation, parts of it are including randomization, 
with a randomness injection circuit, which is just part of this approximate or stochastic architecture. It's, it just naturally fits into it, has no real um, overhead and uh, so on. And this means that the output is blurred, uh, blurred not as much as to make this classification accuracy nonsensical, but as much as to make this attack generation costlier. And here are the uh, results from, from that paper. So they are not our results. Uh, here we have the classification accuracy for the non-approximate or non-stochastic part for the stochastic part with no extra randomness injection injected. And then uh, some uh, random or more and more randomness being injected on the x-axis. This is the blue bars. And uh, the orange bars say how many out of 5,000 attacks were successful, so managed to um, induce misclassification. And we see that it goes down from 76% to under 60% and classification accuracy, the blue bars are good. That brings me to the, to the, to the, to the end. I believe that, or many people believe that uh, machine learning hardware is uh, one main um, direction of scientific progress, which we have in our field. And uh, it uh, turns out to have its own set of security threats. And we are still establishing this uh, understanding. I wouldn't say that uh, my taxonomy is uh, the final one. Uh, but essentially, both uh, attacks which have to do with hardware and which have to do with ML have uh, an influence on it. And it is a uh, growing area of research on all these attacks, countermeasures, counter countermeasures, and so on. What I wanted to um, uh, put into perspective is that if we transition to emerging architectures, which have all these uh, good properties, um, we should look into what it has to do with this security. Yeah? We have this non-volatility and variability and non-determinism and so on. And um, uh, it can happen that security is endangered or that new security solutions are possible. And uh, yeah, we need to consider them when uh, we are thinking about uh, new countermeasures or also when we are applying uh, existing or non countermeasures uh, to neural networks, which uh, are going to use for self-driving cars for industry automation or for other security critical field. So again, sorry for over stretching uh, the time and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are some. Thank you, uh, Professor Paulian, for the nice presentation. Uh, regarding the timing, it, I think it's no issue. We, we can uh, push it a bit um, into the future. So I would maybe start with the questions uh, as previously from uh, the audience and then we can go to the questions of the panelists. Um, so there is one question from Tony uh, Pustinen. Are perturbation attacks uh, effective against video stream or only singular still images? Are perturbation applicators you need to optimize for each? Uh, I don't think anybody, oops, what happens here? Uh, I don't think anybody has done this attacks in real time. Like you see an image, you uh, do this calculation and um, you, uh, uh, you know, just uh, on the fly insert uh, this uh, manipulated um, extra perturbation and then uh, it just happens. I don't think this, uh, anybody has done this yet. I'm not, uh, I don't want to claim it because you know progress is fast, and uh, you know that there, there there are dozens of such papers coming out like each month. But I think the amount of calculations is at the moment too much for that. So you need to do some tricks uh, here. I mean, you or the attacker needs to do uh, some uh, tricks here. Maybe he needs to do some delay to record what is what is going and then put it into the system uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with some delay. Um, uh, so I think the answer, I mean, real time in the sense, uh, no delay or, uh, you know, no, 
uh, delay beyond uh, 50 milliseconds, uh, I think the answer is uh, the answer is no. And uh, by the way, I'm not necessarily an expert in those attacks. We are looking into them. Uh, I mean, for, 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 for us, they are, they are given. We are more looking into their relationship to all those approximate and stochastic, uh, stochastic architecture. Not, we are not uh, that much. Uh, I mean, we have some working understanding of them, but uh, please don't take uh, or don't put my words here uh, on a golden scale. There are people who are much more competent than them, uh, like whatever Stepan Pisik in in uh, in uh, in, in Nijmegen and uh, other people who are really working uh, on those attacks as such. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A similar question, which kind of I think already answered is uh, from uh, Leonard Reimann from RWDH Aachen. So he's asking whether those uh, perturbation attacks are applicable to real-time applications. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, I think uh, they, uh, not in a transparent way. I mean, I think if it is acceptable to have this real-time operation with a, with a delay, you know, that, that there is a stream and then it's delayed by, I don't know, half a minute or whatever. I mean, depending on of what information it is, I mean, what what uh, resolution or whether it's audio or, or video and how, how many bits. I think if, if that can be done, then probably these attacks are feasible in this kind of uh, real time understanding but i think uh, it comes in has to be processed uh, with uh, you know with hardware speed and I, I i kind of doubt that the way how they are done i mean maybe it's possible to do some very coarse optimization maybe some pre calculation or something but it would be it is non trivial yeah i mean when we are doing this even on those small networks it does take uh, some time to run them on a, on a, on a big uh, on a big server i'm not claiming we are doing it in the best or most efficient uh, way but i think um, there are also no wonders here. Yeah? I mean, it's it has to. Uh, it is it is quite some optimization uh, going into it, especially in this black box, because uh, this black box is essentially a trying around. Yeah, it's it's a little bit a little bit uh, directed try it around, but essentially it tries to uh, you know uh, squeeze here a little bit, stretch there a little bit, and see whatever is is making the optimization function better. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's kind of not very, not extremely, how should I say, uh, elaborate on conceptual level. I mean, if you have uh, if you have white box, then maybe for specific uh, uh, types of networks, uh, you can uh, theoretically come up with a specific optimization method, which is really very fast just on this network. But um, I doubt that this is possible in general, to be honest. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, uh, is there any maybe some question from from the panelists? Yes, I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, if I understand correctly, uh, so uh, this this attacks are during inference, right? Not training. So, are there any attacks that are yeah. so take place during training, and can they be detected uh, in the verification? So, after training, I think you also verify if the models are trained correctly. I mean, in some sense, uh, I mean, there, 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 there are two things. So, uh, where in this, um, uh, where in this, uh, let's say, life cycle or in this supply chain, <laughs> uh, does the attacker sit? Yeah. Uh, in in some sense, I mean, what this watermarking uh, or fingerprinting are trying to do is, uh, suppose you have uh, you have trained and verified and everything, and your 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 network is is done, and you give it to somebody, but on the way, it somehow gets replaced by something else. Yeah, so, so somebody manipulates uh, like afterwards. It was a good, secure network, and then uh, somebody replaced it with a malicious network. Yeah? In some sense, uh, the, what this watermark marking approaches try to prevent is is precisely this. If the guy who is actually training is the malicious guy, whether you can uh, or whether some other guy can kind of certify it. I mean, w we know that this. Um, uh, 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 provable AI and so on, uh, that it is all or verifiable AI is a very, very difficult uh, problem. I mean, in some sense, uh, these um, techniques actually show how much, uh, if you want power or how much redundancy uh, is in these models that you can uh, also integrate uh, things like watermarks in them. But on the other hand, it also shows how little control you have. Yeah, Because uh, maybe in the same way as you are doing this um, 
this watermarking. Yeah? So you have this passphrase type of thing. You show this figure, uh, this nicely looking figure, and uh, the network answers something. In exactly the same thing, you could implement also some malicious side channel. Yeah? It, you, you, maybe uh, this um, network could signal some information which is not supposed uh, to go outside, but uh, which it <laughs> wants to give outside. Uh, yeah, I mean, so something like that is also thinkable, which is to some extent also scary. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure we are controlling or we have this technology under control as much as we have, let's say, in microprocessor. Because in a microprocessor, you can take a formal verification tool, I mean, with all the deficiencies which they have, and you can go through, uh, let's say, the instruction set architecture and can uh, say, OK, that it has that many paragraphs. I write uh, 10 properties for each of them, and I verify. And uh, three years later, it, uh, the, the, the formal verifier will say, will say that it has, number one, it, it, it has these properties, and number two, it has nothing else. Um, and I don't see this at the moment available for these uh, neural networks. Yeah, Not necessarily, and, and this is not a hardware thing. I think it's also, it, it's just neural networks as such. As a, uh, If you can make them arbitrarily large and complex, um, it's very difficult to really control all the, let's say, information which they, which, which, uh, or, or all the features which they have. You may not know they, they can do something, and uh, in reality, they, they can. Yeah. Okay, maybe um, I would like just a short question for, for uh, finalizing this, uh, this talk. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what the automotive industry thinks uh, about these attacks? Well, I'm I'm not really even though I'm in Stuttgart and there are many automotive. I mean, they they are not um, they are not telling. I mean, they uh, how should I say? From what I understood, number one, they don't see how all this uh, ADAS, uh, I mean, all these self-driving uh, cars and autonomous driving can be done without. Uh, neural networks of of some kinds, and uh, they for some reason. They are very much concerned about this nature of um, failures. Like they, 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 they want to do more or less the same, uh, whatever ISO 26262 type of um, certification, which is about uh, ruling out that if some bit flips somewhere, that something bad happens uh, with or happens with probability more than 10 to minus 7. Um, even so, this uh, actual classification algorithm, their failure rates without any physical uh, failures or attacks is, uh, yeah, maybe 0.1% would be a very good one. Yeah? And in reality, it's, it's worse. Yeah? So to me, I have to say, I don't understand uh, the presumption on, uh, let's say, all this certification and so on, how this will work. Maybe I'm uh, not understanding it uh, completely. So to me, it's, uh, it's not clear. Whether they are particularly interested in this kind of uh, malicious security attacks, this kind of adversarial attacks, I'm not sure. They definitely are interested in, uh, in privacy of uh, the data. They are interested in, uh, in uh, preventing uh, information leakage. They are also interested in uh, let's say integrity of the information. So they don't want that somebody can replace a neural network, which is in their whatever electronic control unit by something else so that they have their authentication procedures and uh, their uh, whatever uh, out in, um, uh, authentication codes there to, 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 to rule this out, that it's at least, at least not easy uh, to do so. I'm not sure they uh, have, uh, let's say, counter. Probably, if they had, or they, they might have. Probably, they would not tell because uh, you know this also a little bit makes life easier for the attacker. But I don't really have a definite answer for for, for okay. that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, actually, for the elaborate uh, answer. Yeah. Um, I think we have to stop at this point yeah. and continue. Thanks yeah. a lot uh, to Professor Polian for the very thanks. interesting presentation and for being here today. And uh, sorry to all the panelists and the attendees that we have to uh, yeah, be a bit late today, but I think it, uh, it's good to sacrifice some time since uh, later on it's, yeah, we don't really uh, have the opportunity for face-to-face -face, uh, discussions. Um, so our next uh, speaker who is I think already here as well is uh, Professor Chester Ribeiro. And uh, he will tell us today uh, a little bit about towards automated tools for fault injection uh, attacks. So Professor Rivero, maybe you could share your screen uh, while I introduce you. Uh, yes, Dominic, thank you.
things. So uh, Professor Chester Rivera is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, uh, India Institute of Technology, Madras. He received the PhD degree from the India Institute of Technology, Karakpur, and was a postdoctoral scientist at uh, Columbia University, New York. Before his PhD, he worked as a member technical staff at uh, CDAC uh, Bangalore. His research interests include hardware and operating system security and applied uh, cryptography. So, uh, Chester, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks, Dominic, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, in the last two talks, we've actually heard about uh, fault injection and how they can affect security. Uh, we looked at two aspects uh, about how faults could be introduced in DRAMs and uh, how faults could be used uh, against uh, an AI algorithm. So, today, uh, we'll uh, in this talk, we'll actually look at automated tools for fault attacks. Uh, we'll be looking at automation of uh, the more conventional fault attacks, which are on uh, ciphers, in particular block ciphers. So, um, okay, so. Uh, uh, so let's start with this. Uh, uh, we know about an encryption. It takes a plain text. Uh, there is a series of operations that occur with the secret key, and then you get a cipher text. So when uh, during a fault attack, what does happen is the attacker uh, disturbs the encryption by injecting a fault through an external means. Uh, this could be for, by a laser injection or uh, by the row hammer or, or uh, by a glitch in a voltage or current uh, source. Uh, resulting to uh, what is called as a faulty ciphertext. Uh, uh, essentially, the fault uh, changes maybe a few operations or modifies the result of uh, a few operations, which then uh, propagates through the cipher, resulting in a faulty output. Uh, the attacker would then uh, take this faulty ciphertext, analyze it with the right ciphertext, and uh, if things go his way, uh, he would get uh, the secret key within a few seconds. So let's take a very simple example of this. Uh, let's take the AES, uh, the AES block cipher. Uh, this cipher has a 128-bit input and gives out a 128-bit ciphertext. And uh, between the plain text and ciphertext, there are a lot of operations which go on uh, with the secret key. But from, from a fault attack perspective, all of these mathematical aspects of the cipher is not very important. Uh, what is important is something, uh, what happens during the end of the cipher, this which happens to be the last round key addition. So just before the cipher text is given out, uh, there is an XOR with the key as we see over here. Now, if the attacker is able to inject a fault, let's say force this particular line over here to be zero, then uh, the key bit, uh, K0 just goes out at the ciphertext. So the, the K0, uh, the key bit, is visible at the ciphertext and uh, thus is known to the attacker. So the attacker in this way, if he's able to inject 128 such faults, uh, would be able to obtain the entire secret key. But the devil over here is in the fault injection process. Uh, as we've seen with the Rohammer case in the prior talk, uh, fault injection is not easy. Uh, it's quite probabilistic. Um, the row hammer is a probabilistic uh, uh, process. Uh, something which is less probabilistic is this laser injection where you actually uh, place your chip over here, which runs your cipher, and then injects, uh, inject a fault at precisely the right XY coordinate, uh, precisely the right time instant, and the intensity of the laser to actually be able to obtain an exploitable fault. So anything uh, a, a little bit um, this way or that way or a little bit uh, delayed could actually make the fault attack uh, a failure or the attack a failure. So the, uh, there, there are unfortunate or like luckily, there are a very few regions in, the, in, in a cipher implementation which are vulnerable to a fault, uh, which can be ex essentially exploited by a fault. Uh, let's take the example of the AES again. So it is the most uh, studied cipher with respect to fault attacks. And if you look at the regions of AES, which are essentially uh, exploitable by a fault attack, we see that there are just a few locations. For example, the first round and the last round are uh, exploitable by a fault, and, in, and the ninth round and the eighth round as well. 
So uh, all other uh, regions or all other rounds in the AES cipher are non-exploitable. So even if you do compare uh, the exploitable regions of the AES, you do find that they are not uniform. You find that the eighth round is the most powerful, uh, is a fault in the eighth round is going to be the strongest because it just requires one single fault to break the entire AES key uh, with the complexity of uh, 256. So the offline complexity indicates the, the key space to be searched after the fault is injected. So uh, if you just compare this with say the ninth round, if you inject a fault in the ninth round, you'd require four such random faults uh, uh, instead of one. So the eighth round uh, is what we call the sweet spot for the AES cipher. And uh, for a long, long time, this uh, research about fault attacks on cipher has led to a series of publications uh, where uh, researchers essentially try to achieve or obtain the sweet spots for ciphers. Uh, in AES example, for example, again, uh, it had taken uh, roughly eight years to find the sweet spot starting in 2003 and uh, ending with uh, Tunstall in 2011, where uh, Tunstall actually showed how the eighth, a fault in the eighth round can be exploited. Uh, the, the, in 2012, uh, Sakiyama essentially showed that uh, you can not do better for, uh, for the cipher called AES. Okay, so this entire process was done manual. And uh, what when we started working uh, uh, with this back in uh, 2016, we wanted to automate this entire process. So we wanted something uh, like this, where you could uh, feed in your block cipher at a very high level, uh, 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 feed also the fault model, which specifies where the fault should be inserted. And uh, we have an algorithm over here called the XFC, which provides the exploitability of that particular fault. It would list the uh, keys that are, can be derived by that particular fault and the complexity of the attack. So uh, the output of uh, XFC would look something like this. Uh, for AES, we would have the different functions present in AES, which is one to 40. Uh, it would tell you which of these faults, uh, which of these functions are exploitable uh, and how many bits of the secret key can be derived and what is the complexity of the corresponding attack. Okay, so uh, if we do have such a, um, uh, such a framework, uh, we could actually use this for many other applications or many other ciphers as well. Uh, unlike AES, not many ciphers, especially the newer lightweight ciphers have been th as thoroughly uh, uh, analyzed as AES. So uh, a potential application for XFC is uh, when a new cipher is designed, you write the specification for the cipher uh, given the fault model, and uh, you would be able to automatically analyze that cipher within a few seconds. Another more interesting uh, application of uh, XFC is to, auto is to create compilers which are aware of uh, the fault vulnerabilities in an implementation. For example, we have a cipher algorithm uh, and you have an implementation of this. It could be either a C implementation or a hardware implementation in Verilog or VHDL. Uh, you pass this to a compiler or uh, respectively the, uh, or an EDA tool in case of the hardware. Uh, the compiler would could invoke uh, XFC, uh, get the list of, of locations which are potentially exploitable by a fault attack. And then uh, countermeasures could be inserted for those regions. So the, the resulting output either an executable or a netlist uh, for the hardware would automatically have countermeasures incorporated uh, in, the out, uh, in the result. Okay, so let's look at what actually happens in XFC. Okay, the, the central idea is something like this. So what we did find out was that uh, in a differential fault attack, that is a variant of the most powerful uh, fault attack, uh, the attacker essentially looks for structures similar to this. So there is X, which is some variable somewhere in the middle of the cipher or some part of the cipher. Uh, this is uh, this value X is passed to an S box, which is this S function over here. There is an XOR with the secret, uh, with the secret key. And then uh, there is an output, which is Y. Now, uh, the attacker knows nothing because all of this is inside the cipher, but he only knows the value of Y. Now, uh, he assumes that X uh, can be, uh, a fault can be induced in X. So X becomes uh, X prime 
uh, because of the fault. And this fault uh, then propagates uh, through the structure. It uh, results in a, a faulty output at the output of this S function or the S box, and also Y prime, which is the faulty output. Now, uh, this fault delta is essentially X XOR X prime. Now, uh, given this structure, the uh, attacker can uh, essentially create a difference equation, or uh, as they call it in crypto uh, cryptography, a difference equation which looks like this, where uh, you have uh, y and y prime, which is known because it is part of the ciphertext and can be observed uh, by the attacker. But the key, uh, the byte of the key, that is k, as well as the fault difference delta, is unknown. Okay, so uh, this particular equation has two unknowns, delta and k, and uh, uh, but uh, the structure of these S functions makes it possible for uh, that not all values of delta are uh, essentially solutions for this particular equation. So, um, uh, like uh, if, for instance, delta is a byte, uh, you would have a considerably small number of deltas which are actually valid for this particular uh, to, that solve this particular equation. And for every valid delta, there is a, a, a very small value of k which can actually satisfy this, uh, this equation. So in this way, by iterating through valid values of delta, uh, potential key values, uh, key values for the key can be actually obtained. So uh, the, uh, the fault attacker, essentially, he uh, looks at the structure of the cipher and then tries to come up with as many equations of this form as possible. Uh, the left-hand side of this equation has these um, difference, difference uh, outputs, uh, the uh, differences between the S-box uh, outputs, while the right-hand side has linear functions of uh, delta. So uh, when we actually started to design XFC, we essentially looked at the cipher, we had a way to represent the cipher, and we essentially tried to find out all possible uh, ways uh, an attacker could essentially build this particular equation. So uh, we come to what how XFC actually works. So we have a representation for a cipher, which looks something like this. Uh, there is a plain text and there is a series of functions in the cipher. And uh, then eventually after all these functions, all the rounds uh, that get invoked, there is the cipher text. Now these functions could be either linear functions or it could be nonlinear functions. So the linear functions, uh, just for example, are shown in orange here, while the nonlinear functions are shown in blue. Okay, so this is an example of uh, AES, uh, how, uh, of the specification for AES. It has like 40 functions, um, uh, uh, and uh, these 40 functions are spread across 10 rounds. And in each round, there is just one function, uh, which is nonlinear, and the remaining functions are linear. So uh, we give this as an input uh, to XFC along with the fault model. Now the fault model essentially is uh, some function and the uh, uh, a particular byte of some function. For example, over here, uh, the fault model is fi comma one, which indicates the out the first byte of the output of the fifth function. Uh, specifically for AES, this happens to be the first byte of the fifth round uh, subbytes operation. Okay, so. Uh, so given these two inputs, XFC essentially has two phases. One is known as the fault propagation, and the other is known as the key determination. So the fault propagation phase essentially uh, 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 propagates the fault given the particular fault model uh, through the cipher until the cipher text. So we have a coloring scheme for this fault propagation, which actually works like this. Uh, as we propagate the fault, uh, when the fault passes through a linear function, like the key addition or the diffusion uh, layer, uh, the output of that particular function has the same color as the input, right? As we see over here. So the output is red and uh, the output of the diffusion, which is a linear function is also similarly red. Uh, on the other hand, when uh, the fault propagates through an S box, which is the nonlinear uh, function in the cipher, the color changes. So we obtain a new totally random colors. For example, here we have a blue and then a green. So in this way, the fault propagates up to the cipher text. Uh, so there is some other rules which I'm just uh, abstracting out. Now the second phase of this 
Uh, yeah, so uh, the point I missed over here is that what we do achieve by this coloring is that uh, regions or colors which are uh, which are same correspond to a, a linear correlation between uh, uh, the various, uh, uh, essentially the same colors are linearly correlated, while different colors on the other hand uh, correspond to output of uh, S boxes and essentially are not correlated. The second part uh, of, or the second phase of XFC is the key determination phase. So here what we do is uh, start from the ciphertext, that is the output over here, and propagate backwards until we reach uh, a nonlinear function like the S box. So once we reach the uh, nonlinear function, we look at the input uh, of this nonlinear function, which is, um, it, this happens to be green over here, and uh, build equations of this particular form. So for example, this equation, S inverse Y XOR K1, XOR with S inverse Y prime XOR K1, uh, can be obtained by just uh, passing through the, uh, uh, just going backwards, starting from Y1 XOR K1 and going backwards. Right. So, uh, considering the green colors, we essentially have two equations corresponding to y1 and y2, which is XOR with k1 and k2. So, uh, we see that uh, these two equations satisfy our uh, requirement, where the uh, right hand side is a linear function of delta, uh, essentially because they are of the same color. So, uh, solving this, assuming that delta is of four bit, has a complexity of two power four. Now, in a similar way, we, uh, in this particular example, uh, we can consider y2, k2, and y3, k3, and build two more of such equations to get uh, the keys k3 and k4 as well. So, uh, so uh, once we obtain this, we, uh, we, do, we know that uh, k1, k2, k3, and k4 can be actually um, determined with a, a complex offline complexity of 2 power 4. Right, and uh, uh, this essentially is the output of XFC. We've uh, we've analyzed around seven different ciphers. So here is the sample of uh, some of them. Uh, so interestingly, we've actually uh, automatically find found out some uh, uh, exploitable locations or et exploitable operations in ciphers like the SMS four, uh, which haven't been found out previously. Right, which were uh, much more efficient and uh, led to more powerful attacks than the previous attacks. So in a follow-up work, we also found that uh, uh, XF, uh, we also showed that XFC's are, uh, results are both sound and complete. Uh, what it means is that if XFC uh, uh, flags a particular operation to be fault attack vulnerable, it, uh, it essentially indicates that uh, this function is uh, uh, that an attack is actually possible uh, when a fault is injected at that operation. Uh, uh, this is true, uh, the inverse of this is also true, uh, which would means that if, uh, uh, if an operation is, um, uh, yeah, so if an operation is uh, vulnerable, XFC will actually flag it, right? So uh, XFC was one of the first works which actually showed this. Uh, after this, there were a series of uh, publications which tried to build these uh, fault attack automated automation tools. Uh, very broadly, these tools could be classified as either algorithmic tools or implementation level tools. So the implementation tools could be either software or hardware tools. So the difference between the two uh, are as follows. So uh, algorithmic tools like XFC, they work at a high level representation of the cipher uh, and uh, the advantage of this is that uh, they can essentially take, they can essentially handle uh, complicated situations or complex situations com considering the cryptographic uh, properties of the cipher, just because uh, everything is abstracted out at a very, uh, with the high level representation. On the other hand, uh, the disadvantage of the algorithmic level tools is that they have very limited applications. So ciphers do not change too often. Uh, people are very skeptical to actually adopt a new cipher. Uh, once a new cipher is adopted, you have just one run of XFC and uh, or any of these tools, uh, get the result, and uh, uh, after that, the use application of this tool is, uh, th there's no more application of this tool for that part particular cipher. Uh, the other uh, direction of the research, what people have actually published, is the implementation level tools. Uh, here, uh, people work at either the gate level in case of uh, hardware tools or uh, or the C code or assembly code 
in case of software tools. So the idea is to actually build graphs of the information, uh, how information flows, and then analyze uh, uh, information flow properties in those graphs. So the graphs could be considerably big. For example, uh, some of the graphs could be have as large as 9,000 or uh, nodes. And uh, therefore, uh, this is comparatively big compared to the algorithmic tools where the uh, number of nodes is as small as 40 or so. Uh, and uh, because of this large graph, a lot of the cryptographic properties are essentially uh, cannot be evaluated. Thus, the implementation level tools, yeah, yeah. what was found was that it is essentially restricted to very basic uh, fault models. Uh, more complex models like the differential uh, attacks, uh, uh, algebraic uh, property, considering the algebraic properties, differential properties, and so on of the cipher uh, is not very easy to uh, consider in the implementation level tools. So uh, a work which uh, we recently published, uh, uh, um, both actually, actually two works, uh, one was called FEDS and the other was called Solomon, essentially tried to build this, uh, bridge the gap between the algorithmic and the implementation level tools. So uh, with either FEDS or Solomon, uh, you could be able to use one of these algorithmic tools like EXFC or EXP fault, obtain the a very comprehensive uh, fault coverage of the particular cipher and then map on the results to either the software or the hardware. Uh, so FEDS essentially was uh, handling the software uh, implementations while Solomon handled the hardware implementations. So at a high level, this is what uh, uh, both these tools do. So you have uh, the algorithmic specification. This is a high level specification of the cipher. And then you also have an implementation. Uh, this could be a, uh, either a C implementation or uh, an assembly uh, implementation in terms of so for software. But it, uh, in terms of hardware, it could be a netlist or a very log implementation. So the idea is essentially to run uh, one of the algorithmic level tools like the XFC or uh, any of the other tools that are present, obtain the list of uh, vulnerable operations in the algorithm, and then uh, do a mapping of these operations onto the implementation. So uh, for example, if uh, this happens to be some operation in the cipher, uh, these tools essentially automatically identify where in this, uh, in this implementation are those specific operations realized. So uh, just to give an example, so uh, we have over here, um, uh, the algorithmic specification of a small part of a, one of the ciphers. And uh, here is co a corresponding C implementation. So here you see that there is very easily, there seems to be a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, a particular statement in the algorithm uh, to a corresponding expression in the implementation. However, things don't always have to be like this. Implementations can be optimized uh, either for uh, a low end embedded devices where memory is a constraint, or it could be uh, implementations could be made extremely high speed or even paralyzed uh, in, in case of uh, high end applications like servers or cloud computers. So you could possibly have different kinds of mappings between the algorithm specification and the corresponding implementation. So here is some uh, something else where there is a small tweak in how uh, uh, the cipher has been implemented. Uh, but we could also have uh, uh, in case of a typical high-speed implementation, you could also have uh, a many-to-one kind of a map where you have several or multiple uh, operations or lines in this algorithm specification getting mapped to a single uh, statement in the high-speed uh, in the corresponding implementation. Uh, this is another uh, case. Uh, this is a very popular in a server kind of environments where you have uh, something known as a bit slice implementation, where you have a single uh, algorithm specification that is mapped to many or several uh, lines in the programs. So the idea is to, be auto to automatically be able to identify such uh, mappings between the algorithm and the corresponding implementation. So what we did use was an equivalence checker uh, so for one of the works that is feds, we, uh, we used a, a model checker while for, uh, uh, while for the hardware mapping, we actually used uh, an SMT solver. Uh, so the idea is uh, to essentially have a iterative algorithm which passes through uh, the algorithm specification and the implementation starting right from the beginning and find out uh, regions which are essentially equivalent. 
Uh, so once these are equivalent, we actually create this table like this. For example, over here, we say that A1 maps to E1. And uh, this continues for uh, the entire cipher. Okay, so uh, very quickly, uh, we just uh, look at the results. So again, we just uh, look at AES. Uh, so the idea is to take multiple different implementations of AES. So in this particular example, we've taken seven different implementations of AES. Uh, uh, implementation one and two are tuned for embedded systems. They are regular uh, embedded system type uh, implementations of AES, which have a small memory footprint. While uh, implementation three, four, and seven are uh, regular, uh, more high-speed implementations. So uh, implementation three and four are the regular implementations which are used in OpenSSL. Uh, implementation seven is the parallel implementation that's the bit-sliced implementation. So implementation five and six, uh, these two, is something that we actually constructed just to actually check how our algorithm fares. So what we did was we considered one specific or rather two specific operations uh, in AES, which happened to be uh, the uh, operation A420 and A496. Uh, so these were found to be exploitable uh, by these high level algorithmic uh, tools ex like XFC. And then we ran feds in this particular case and uh, found out how these essentially mapped uh, to the corresponding implementation. So each cell over here corresponds to a particular byte of memory. So we see uh, two things, right? So first we see that each, uh, each operation uh, corresponds to a, a different region in the, uh, in the memory footprint of the implementation. And we also see that there are uh, some uh, regions in the a memory footprint, which are exploitable by both. So this is given by this darkened brown color. So the interesting thing is if you want to now uh, create countermeasures or protect these implementations, uh, it is just sufficient to protect the, uh, the operations which are vulnerable. So for example, any of these uh, blocks which are non-colored non need not be protected and you'd still have a secure implementation of AES in, in this particular example. So uh, what we did do was uh, insert, uh, uh, fit AES into a compiler. Uh, so we, uh, we use the LLVM compiler and we, uh, we uh, the compiler would, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, generate the intermediate representation, pass it, uh, uh, pass it to XFC and then get the uh, corresponding result and uh, 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 the compiler would then insert countermeasures. So uh, this particular work, we had a very simple countermeasure just for the vulnerable regions of code in the, uh, in the, in the corresponding C code. So uh, uh, compared to a naive implementation, uh, a naive countermeasure, which uh, maybe someone would actually do uh, by just replicating every operation that uh, is found, just by, ha by having very specific uh, countermeasures inserted only for the vulnerable instructions in the, uh, in the implementation, what we do get is a much more efficient uh, outputs. So for example, over here, what we do see is uh, without the countermeasure, uh, uh, rather with uh, just uh, uh, with a very naive approach for the countermeasure, you have, uh, the, there's a huge bloat up in the code size. While if you have the automated uh, insertion of countermeasure using the XFC, the code size would be uh, relatively small because, uh, or the overhead would be relatively small because you're, you, you are inserting the countermeasures at specific locations. Now, interestingly, uh, either you, you don't lose out in the security that you actually achieve, the fault coverage would be exactly the same as the NAVE approach. So uh, yeah, with this, I'll just slowly, uh, uh, I'll uh, just wind up with what we are actually planning to do. So of course we've, we've looked at uh, ciphers over here and we built tools for automatically evaluating ciphers. Now, uh, as we've seen in the previous uh, talks, uh, fault, fault attacks could be used much beyond ciphers. For example, uh, to maybe change bits in a page table or to actually uh, mount attacks on machine learning algorithms. So this is something we, we would actually be working on in the, uh, we are actually working on 
Um, and hopefully we could actually replicate this kind of automated tools uh, for uh, beyond uh, Cyphers. So uh, yeah, I, uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chester, for the very interesting presentation. Um, <clears throat> so as usual, I think we just start uh, with the already mentioned questions here. So the first question is from Damien uh, Kouros. Ho hopefully I pronounced this correctly. So what are the fault models supported by uh, XFC? Uh, um, so uh, XFC as such, uh, so the original work of XFC supported a single bit uh, random fault or rather a, a byte of random fault where a single byte is uh, affected by the fault. Uh, in a later work, we extended this to multiple faults. So anytime during the execution, you could have multiple bytes uh, of your cipher getting corrupted. Uh, the assumption here specifically is that these faults are temporary. So which means that uh, they momentarily change a corresponding output of, a, a, of an instruction and after that, the instruction essentially behaves uh, properly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the next question is uh, from Tony Pustinen. Did I understand correctly, these particular fault injection methods only work with 128-bit keys? Uh, not, uh, not really. Um, so uh, yeah, you could, you, so what these attacks do is essentially, uh, it's more like a divide and conquer. So it could be, a as long as key as it requires, for example, that you could actually have a fault injection attack on the RSA. Uh, the idea is to essentially break up or divide the entire key space and uh, inject a fault at a particular uh, uh, region, which could extract a portion of the key. Uh, in AES, for example, a single bit, uh, a single fault could give you the entire, entire 128 bit key, but that doesn't have to be the case. In Clefia, for instance, you would require at least two or more faults to, and each fault would give you a, a part of the key before you can actually gain the entire 128 bit. Mm -hmm. And just one follow up on the previous question, actually. Uh, so the question is, uh, do you support bit flips uh, instead of set reset? Yes, uh, we do support uh, bit flips. In fact, that is the uh, main thing that we support. The idea is that, uh, uh, let's say we have a register uh, which is holding a particular value and uh, what we assume is that this register essentially changes to some random uh, something uh, to something which is totally different right so it is uh, uh, it is a temporary bit flip okay. uh, it's not a, per a persistent fault perfect thanks a lot um, are there any questions uh, from the panelists Apparently not so far. So I just have a short question. Um, so I, I personally work a little bit more into the direction of uh, yeah, hardware integrity protection, for example, with the logic uh, encryption yes. or logic locking. Yes. Uh, do you think that this uh, model uh, could also be used on this particular issue, if you're familiar with, with the concept? Um, the the uh, you, you're talking about a fault attack or an automated tool for logic encryption or? No, a fault attack uh, that could expose somehow the secret key. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, that's uh, essentially that's a very good question because, um, yeah, the I, I do believe that it could uh, it could be used to uh, to uh, break logic encryption. Uh, one would essentially have to ha find out where the key is stored and where essentially the fault to, should be injected. Uh, so, for instance, if uh, I could zero out the register which holds the key, uh, then you'll nullify the uh, entire logic encryption. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, there is uh, one more question uh, from the audience. So from Leonard Reimann, RWTH Aachen. Do you have an example for a scenario where those fault injection attacks uh, become dangerous for the user? He only has a device specific key and the device is with him and not with me. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so the, uh, yes. So if we do consider aspects such as row hammer, uh, we've uh, heard about uh, uh, faults being injected via the uh, via JavaScripts and therefore could be actually mounted remotely. Uh, so in such a case, we uh, there is a possibility that uh, one could inject a fault in a remote system and then uh, have 
uh, once the fault is injected and the fault is exploitable, uh, then everything else is the same. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Chester, for the interesting presentation. And uh, thanks, yeah. I think- Thanks, Dominic, for the invitation. And thanks, thank you for being here. Um, and we can continue now with our uh, next presentation before the longer break. So our next speaker is also one colleague of mine, uh, Elmira Musavi, who will tell us a little bit about bio nanoelectronic based multi-valued logic locking scheme uh, for future generation uh, secure systems. Um, so before I read the bio, maybe in the meantime, Elmira, you could uh, flash your flights, slides. Yeah, sure. So uh, Elmira Musavi completed uh, her master degree in electrical engineering, information technology and computer engineering from the RWTH Aachen University in 2017 and holds a bachelor in electrical engineering and telecommunications. Since October 2020, she has been working as a PhD student and research assistant at the Institute for Communication Technologies and Embedded Systems uh, here in Aachen under the supervision of uh, Professor Rainer Leupers and Dr. Farad uh, Merchant. So Elmira, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much and hello everybody. I'm delighted to be here today to give you a brief breakdown of the BioNanoLock project or more specifically the BioNanoElectronic based multi-value logic locking schemes for future generation secure systems. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, okay. Um, my talk is divided into four parts. I'll start with uh, the need for hardware security in the future generation uh, computing systems. And uh, then I will look at uh, logic locking schemes. And then um, next I will uh, briefly go to the BioNanoLock project. And finally, a conclusion. Uh, so let me begin with some general information on uh, logic locking by explaining its, its functionality. Uh, as you are all aware, the future generation computing systems will require sophisticated security mechanisms to prevent a variety of attacks, uh, such, uh, especially uh, with the emergence of neuromorphic computing. The underlying computations are not purely digital anymore. Uh, so the complexity increases the attack surface for the bad act, uh, and the, for the bad actors. Uh, due to the prohibitive cost and complexity of constructing and maintaining a semiconductor foundry with high capability in fabrication, most integrated circuit design houses are uh, becoming fabless. Moreover, the importance of time to market is also compelling the IC design uh, companies to rely on the third party IC inter uh, intellectual uh, property blocks and utilizing them in their system on chip and uh, outsourcing the fabrication to advanced offshore foundries. As a consequence, uh, the vulnerability of the design while in the production at the third party foundry is the major concern. Uh, so uh, to illustrate this uh, more, um, I would like to show you the IC design and fabrication flow in more details. Uh, as you can see here, this is the trusted regime, uh, which is known by the IP owner, uh, which is consists of uh, the RTL level, logic synthesis, uh, gate level netlist, and uh, the layout can be done uh, internally or can be sent to the external design houses and then uh, for the tape out it will be sent to the fabrication foundry and after the uh, tape out the IC will be uh, sent it back to the IP owner. Uh, the globalization of the IC fabrication uh, supply chain has raised the risk of various kinds of adversarial attacks, such as uh, reverse engineering, IP piracy, overbuilding, uh, counterfeiting, and also hardware trojans. So to overcome this vulnerability, logic locking binds the design to a secret key and uh, which is only known by the IP owner. And by uh, this secret key, uh, our logic is locked and we would have a lock netlist. And also uh, only by the uh, secret key, which is uh, known by the IP owner, the, uh, the circuit can be activated and uh, we would have a functional IC. 
to give you an example for logic locking, uh, let's assume we have three inputs uh, to the to the um, just a simple uh, logic circuitry, and then we would have outputs as it would be uh, showed uh, in the in this truth table. And uh, if a, uh, if we consider a locked uh, circuitry, we would have something like this. This is the locked circuit, which we would add some uh, key gates and uh, we deploy our key input to the circuit. And if a correct activation key uh, is uh, provided, the design behaves as it's expected. Uh, as you can see here, for instance, this is the encrypted key of 00. zero. So we would have the same out, uh, output as we have in the original truth table. Otherwise, an incorrect key ensures the generation of faulty outputs for at least some input patterns. Uh, in the next section, uh, I would like to give you some more information about logic locking schemes and expand on this aspect. Uh, well, as I said and showed you earlier, the CMOS-based logic locking performs a functional and a structural manipulation of a hardware design through the insertion of additional obfuscation logic, binds the design to a secret key, and the secret is only known uh, to the IP owner. Uh, one of the um, first logic locking schemes is uh, called uh, ending piracy IC, which is randomly disseminates XOR and XNOR gates in the netlist. And these gates are typically known as uh, key gates. Uh, so uh, the challenge here is that this um, CMOS based security primitives are vulnerable and they are predictable. Uh, so let's take one step further to increase the IC security level. In this point, I'm going to discuss the impact of post CMOS technologies on security and how various logic locking paradigms can help us overcome hardware security challenges. Um, by using this uh, emerging technologies such as uh, spin-based um, memory, memory stores uh, and also carbon-based transistors and nanowires and so on, uh, as an emerging de uh, devices, we can uh, have a smaller electronics, lower voltage, lower power dissipation, uh, comparing to the CMOS counterparts. And I think most of you has heard about uh, these emerging devices and know that uh, these emerging devices can improve hardware security based on the aspect of polymorphisms. Uh, let me begin by explaining the polymorphic logic gate and uh, expand on this aspect with some examples. Uh, polymorphic logic gates perform distinct Boolean logic functions such as AND, NAND, OR, NOR, XOR, or XNOR by configuring internal or external keys at the runtime. So as you can see here, this is the current centric truth table, uh, which you can see that if we have a different uh, control signal X as minus I or plus I, we would have different truth tables. And um, as a consequence, we could have a different logic as a NAND or NOR only by changing these um, control signals. Um, so we could say that polymorphic logic gate plays a crucial role in addressing IC related security issues, including counterfeiting, reverse engineering, and also supporting uh, camouflaging and locking. And um, a uniform device level layout, it's hard to determine uh, the functionality by reverse uh, engineering. And the key input defines intrinsic uh, functionality of a polymorphic gate. Uh, so let me elaborate uh, further on the logic abstraction, the runtime reconfigurable properties of um, um, properties uh, actually offered by reconfigurable FETs can be used to build uh, logic gates with extended functionality. These logic gates can be uh, configured to deliver different logic functionalities on application of an external potential. Uh, as you can see here, for instance, we would have two input NAND uh, if we have um, P is equal to zero. And if uh, we have P equal to one, we would have two input NOR. <clears throat> 
as well, we would have here uh, to input XOR or XNOR uh, if we change uh, P from one to zero respectively. Uh, so the polymorphic logic gates realizes logic locking without adding additional logic gates as well. Uh, Mm, so the functionality of the individual logic gates changes depending on the value of the program uh, gate terminal P. This functional reconfigurability can be used in various IP protection schemes as it allows efficient and cost-effective polymorphic logic gates. Here is another example for uh, leveraging the Emerging devices, memory store or memory resistor is a resistor with varying resistances. It could have uh, infinity resistance on or zero resistance, or better to say, high uh, resistance states or low resistance states. And uh, with these two terminal resistive switches, we could have great scalability, CMOS compatibility, first switching fast switching, sorry, fast switching speed and high endurances, uh, reconfigurability, low power consumption, improved security due to the unique properties of memory store. And in all integration of security, memory and computing functionality into the same circuit. So the polymorphic electronics are introduced based on the idea of having uh, multiple functionalities built in the same cell, uh, controlling the input-output relation in the circuit to hide the original design functionality in the form of hardware obfuscation. Um, the obfuscation technique, uh, for example, as you can uh, see here, this is an example for CMOS logic obfuscation. And um, based on the layout, if you just look at the um, transistors, uh, you would say that the output uh, logic would look like this logic here. Uh, but in fact, if we and just um, convert M5, M6, and M2 from um, enhanced type MOSFET to depletion type MOSFET, we would have always uh, NMOS transistors, this, these two NMOS transistors on, and M2 as off transistor. So we would have a floating point here, which um, give us, uh, as a consequence, the output of uh, not A, which is the actual uh, logic that we get from this uh, layout. Uh, so the obfuscation techniques involve camouflage cells, uh, which is uh, definitely harder by an attacker to reverse engineering the logic and uh, determining it by, its own, uh, by only its layout, and introduce additional secret key to lock the proper functionality of the protected circuit. However, uh, the challenge is still remains a low immunity against the reverse engineering uh, by IC imaging methods. So this leads us to the next point, which is multi-value lock. In multi-value logic locking, leveraging the intrinsic characteristics of the post CMOS transistors to create camouflage gates, increasing difficulty level and breaking the logic lock uh, circuits for key retrieval or prediction. Uh, extension of CMOS-based logic locking and moving away from the traditional binary logic. As you can see in binary logic, we would have always two bits, which is zero and one, uh, by, uh, but in the multi-value logic, uh, we could have more bits, uh, such as here, you can see this unsigned uh, ternary multi-value logic, which is uh, zero, one, and two. Uh, and the not form would be two, one, and zero. So exploration of alternatives for new material as key gates or activation of key gates, uh, rising the complexity of performing major attacks on the design where current logic locking approaches fail at gate level. As an example for multi-valued logic gate, uh, you can see two input ternary NAND and NOR gates. And um, as you can see here, this is the truth table for it. And uh, we would have a ternary, so it's zero, one, and two uh, values. And uh, for the transfer characteristic curves, you can see that this is for the NAND, which has also three stages. And uh, for, this is for the NOR. And we can uh, configure uh, the NAND and NOR by this uh, expression here. Uh, so previously I mentioned in multi-value log the idea of exploration of alternatives for new materials as key gates or activation of key gates. So let me talk about the new material keys in the form of unique biological activation keys 
or our by Nanlak project, which is founded by the DFG uh, priority program. So let me begin by explaining the bionanolog. In bionanolog, realize an alternative to rigid binary key gates of SEMA circuits and minimizing circuit overheads utilizing properties of alternative key gates. Alternative key gates can compensate for manufacturing uh, uh, for, uh, for manufacturing process variation, as well as for lifetime issues associated to miniaturization. An alternative to uh, all solid state key gates in the form of heterogeneous key gates uh, as an active device capable of reading unique biological activation keys, allowing for multi-layer, multi-value logic gates, logic locking strategies. Uh, as you can see here, this is a secret key, uh, which is converted to DNA-based biological key uh, sequences using digital information coding approach. These biological keys uh, have a unique sequence that is uh, designed to act as an uh, activation key for the biological modified key gates or bio key gates. So a secret pattern of biological key sequences specified bio key gates can be defined and activated upon uh, molecular binding. And uh, at the end, we could have a single device activation key or a multiple device activation key. Uh, well, how to implement multi-value logic gates in bio -nanolog? Uh, so, ion sensitive field effect transistors are well established, fabricated identical sensor characteristics at wafer scale for, uh, for by detection. And uh, silicon nanowire uh, have been fabricated for biosensing applications based on top down process. And silicon nanowire arrays uh, has uh, superior sensor characteristics, enabling differential readout. Uh, multi-channel capabilities and also uh, compatible with the CMOS uh, integration. And one of the approaches is that detect and monitor uh, DNA hybridization, uh, which is fast, fully electronic, stable differential AC readout, and free of solid parameters, uh, which detect point mutation of short DNA sequences. So here is an illustrate uh, showing biological modified nanoscale field effect transistors. As you see here, these are uh, different um, uh, FET wafers and uh, we, which we use the silicon nanowire FET arrays. And uh, basically this is the transistor. We would have a receptor and um, by binding the uh, DNA and having DNA hybridization, we would have um, uh, surface charge here, uh, some uh, charge accumulation and, uh, between the drain and source, and uh, we would have um, different um, current drain current, and also this uh, shifting between the reference voltage and also the gate voltage is give, it will give us uh, different characteristics, and by um, just uh, computing these differences, we could have different uh, keys based on the DNA that we want bind it. So uh, here is the FPGA prototype, which is consists of um, a Z board and also a breakout board, uh, which is uh, connected to the Z board by an FMC connector. And uh, on top of the uh, breakout board, we would apply our uh, uh, by Nanolag setup. Uh, mm, this would consist of uh, one uh, biosensor and also with some small circuitry, which uh, would be probably a comparator and also um, um, maybe um, some amplifiers. Uh, so this is the whole setup. And then uh, this, in the Z board, we will uh, perform the locking structure. So to conclude, I'm going to um, actually sum up um, uh, 
the idea of logic locking and I identified the binary nature of uh, logic key gates uh, as a uh, fundamental limitation of uh, traditional logic locking. Therefore, I propose integration by logically activated nanoscale field effect transistors as uh, functional key gates alongside a locked CMOS netlist uh, by utilizing multi-layer, uh, multi-value logic gates in the form of unique biological activation keys. Uh, multi-value lock is a promising approach for protecting future generation circuits integrity against malicious actors in the IC supply chain. Uh, in the future, we plan to explore a variety of uh, locking mechanisms using multi-value logic gates, also uh, incorporating multi-value logic gates into the original circuit uh, functionality and uh, novel attacks on logic locking. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you a lot, Nuga, uh, for an interesting presentation. Um, so far, I don't see any questions in the Q&A section. Are there any questions from the panelists? Hi, this is Donna Bay. I'm asking from Tom. I figured I might as well just turn on the microphone and ask this way. So um, thank you very much for the talk. It's very exciting to see all these new technologies. When do you expect these kind of things will actually be able to be fabricated and manufactured? Because it seems, I mean, I love this kind of research, but it seems like it takes quite a while until we can actually expect these kind of things. Is that right? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your question. Actually, it's an interesting question and uh, probably is a little bit hard to answer. Um, Although we have the uh, prototype ready, actually we are working on the prototyping uh, at the moment. And um, if um, you know, like, because it's a, there are a lot of challenges in um, developing uh, these molecular devices, uh, but um, we have a group in IWE1, they are uh, actually they uh, did a lot on this uh, binary leg sensor, uh, or let's say bio uh, sensor. And um, then I think that we could probably soon have uh, the first prototyping. Um, although it wouldn't be that much difficult. I mean that it doesn't uh, mean that it has all the multi-value logic locking and so on. Inside it would be uh, maybe only the prototype. So uh, we will see that how this uh, logic locking in total with uh, biosensor works together. Thank you. Very interesting. Looking forward to, to see where it goes. Thank you so much. Um, okay, thanks. We have some uh, questions in the Q&A section. So the first one is from uh, Kashif Nawaz. Um, how do you characterize the power and delay of bio key gates? Uh, uh, so uh, at the moment, I cannot um, offer, uh, actually uh, tell you a strict answer because uh, it's um, something that we have to first of all measure. Uh, but uh, basically, we know that uh, our biosensor is not um, uh, like uh, it doesn't need that much power. Um, maybe for the whole uh, circuit, we would uh, use some power, uh, but for the biosensor itself, it doesn't uh, really need that much power consumption. Uh, but uh, we have to see actually after the prototyping. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and a follow-up question uh, also from, from uh, Kashif Navaz. I did not fully understand how are you implementing the DNA and silicon nanowire on the FPGA? Is it through the bio uh, biosensor? Yes, it's through the bionan sensor, and we apply the bion, uh, We apply the DNA uh, by microspotting on top of the uh, biosensor, and then uh, we just uh, applying some uh, small circuitry on top of the breadboard with, um, with a biosensor, and then uh, we uh, implement the locking by the FPGA. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this next question is uh, by Leonard Reimann. Uh, do you think that polymorphic gates could be abused to leak data in the circuit by implementing a different functionality than they are supposed to? Um, actually, I'm not uh, sure um, and I cannot give you a, a, like, a, a, a complete answer for that, but probably uh, yes. Uh, or I, I actually, uh, I hope it would be. Uh, 
and um, yeah, but uh, so far I cannot uh, say uh, a lot about it. Yeah, if I might just comment, I think since this is kind of a new uh, approach to this problem, it will probably also uncover some uh, potential uh, attacks as well, which we are maybe not aware at the moment. Yeah. Sure. Um, but but I think this is basically how security works, right? Uh, we have to find the issues and then try to fix them uh, on on the way. Um, okay, thanks for this. Uh, the next question is by Tony Pustinen. Uh, what does IC imaging refer to? Is it a particular method or a collection of methods for a specific purpose? Um, the IC imaging is uh, basically that um, uh, you can have um, uh, somehow um, like uh, by, uh, let's say by, uh, 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 by the laser or uh, by uh, by some uh, fiber technologies, you can have uh, you can see the um, IC and uh, how it works. And uh, by this IC imaging, I mean that uh, you can see the functionality of the circuit by by these uh, kinds of uh, um, uh, somehow these lasers or these types of uh, IC imaging. I so probably are referring to. Uh, imaging techniques that are used also to reverse engineer uh, yeah, exactly circuits. That's right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that's it. If there's no other question from the panelists so far. Good. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Elmira, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, I really no appreciate problem. it. Thanks. Um, and basically, that's it for the morning uh, program. So we are now having a well, a little bit a shorter lunch break, and afterwards the high peak uh, keynote talks are are happening uh, up until uh, two forty five. But we are actually uh, continuing at uh, three o'clock with a talk by uh, Professor Tawil, who will talk about side channel attacks. So we are back at three o'clock. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome back. So Dominic speaking. Uh, we will start now with our, with our afternoon session. And uh, our first speaker in this session is uh, Professor Motakila Tawil, who will tell us something about side channel attacks, a perspective from an attacker's and defender's point of view. Um, Professor Tawil, you are here, right? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Um, by the way, if, if it's possible, it would be nice if you could also share the video. If, oh, uh, yeah, sure. If that's possible from your, your side. And in the meantime, um, you could uh, show your slides already and I'll do the introductions. Share screen. Okay, so uh, Professor Tawil received his Master of Science and Doctoral Degree from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands in 2009 and 2014, respective, respectively. During his PhD, he developed 3D, uh, 3D Costar, which has been awarded by High Peak, uh, with High Peak Technology Award in 2015. After his PhD, he has been working as a postdoctoral researcher at the computer engineering lab uh, of the same university until 2018, where he subsequently was appointed as an assistant professor. His research focuses on two domains, dependability, including reliability, testability, and hardware security, and emerging computer paradigms, so 3D stack, uh, stacked ICs and resistive uh, architectures. Uh, Professor Tawil published over 100 journal and conference papers in a variety of topics and received multiple best paper awards. Furthermore, he has been involved in uh, many professional activities such as organizing uh, conferences and summer schools. Uh, Professor, you may start. Uh, thank you very much. Before I would uh, start, I would like to ask, can you see my slides properly? Yes, it's because uh, I have multiple windows. And, okay, thank you very much. Um, and the objective of this talk is not to present really detailed things how certain side channel works, like spectrum meltdown, but I would like to give a complete overview of uh, things that exist there. Uh, uh, and of course, I will provide some examples: uh, what attackers are doing, what defenders are doing, and then uh, end up uh, this presentation uh, with why it's so difficult to get this uh, problem. Uh, solved. So the first thing is uh, what are side channels? So once you execute a certain application or program, um, it, it, has, it leaves certain uh, 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 tracks that, 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 that you could observe to identify uh, what's going on. 
So there are different uh, side channels. So for example, you could look at the power consumption. If you run, for example, an AES encryption, uh, if you monitor the power uh, and you do some statistics on that, you can get some idea of uh, what key has been used uh, uh, um, during that execution. And there are many, many different uh, side channels. Most popular ones, of, of course, related to the to power uh, because that's very easy to do. And, and they are very important to consider because uh, the problem with the side channel attacks is you have no idea. Uh, um, uh, you can assume it, of course, that they are uh, uh, leaking information, but you have no idea if someone is using that leaked information. It's very difficult to see if someone is tampering with the power or uh, measuring the uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, field uh, and so forth. Second, every now and then, a new uh, types of side channel uh, appear. And the problem with, with that is if, if you can not patch them or solve them in software and you have to change the hardware, uh, it might be very uh, costly uh, to do and it leaves the current uh, chips that are already out there still vulnerable. Okay, so let's look at uh, some uh, sources of leakage uh, that, can, uh, that people could exploit to, 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 to perform these side channel attacks. Uh, uh, there are three levels that I distinguish here, but there are more that I will show later. So the first thing is uh, through technology. So you, have, you use a certain, uh, you, you use, for example, CMOS. If you change your technology, you go from FinFET to, to, to Planner and vice versa, you got slightly different behavior. Then you have your circuit, your gates, the, the, the way you implemented your design. And that could also be leash, leak, leakage from the architecture. So if you change your, uh, if you keep the same architecture, but change to uh, your technology, then you will still have that leakage that will not help you. So why, wh uh, wh so what kind of things can an attacker um, observe? So he could look at voltages, he could look at power usage, he could lose uh, at heat, uh, EM, uh, noise uh, from the technology point of view. In the circuit, uh, thing, he could look uh, to the net list or layout and observe certain, certain things that are going on there, or he could try to access uh, uh, test structures. From the architectural point of view, Leakage exists because there are different timing, uh, different operations require different timing, whether it's a floating point or whether it's accessing the cache. And moreover, you also have certain hardware performance counters that, that you could access, like, for example, a miss rate in, in, in the cache, uh, for cache miss rate, right? So if we look at the side channels, and this is a taxonomy, I really recommend if you're interested in this topic to read this paper, it's, uh, this, this taxon taxonomy is based on that. You have a very variety of uh, side channels, all, starting from technology all the way to the, to the web. Whether these side channels are, how effective they are also a little bit depends on where you have to be. If you need to have access to the device, it's of course more difficult to mass scale that because you need to access each device, for example, measure power and so forth. But you have also side channels that you can do from a, from a little bit of distance. So that you can do it from far away from the web, but there are also some side channels that you need to be close in proximity of the device. So the, the, the ones that are based on technology and design, Often you need to have access to the to the device. So I mentioned a couple of them before for the technology, but also in the design. So related, for example, to cache attacks, uh, spectra meltdown. Um, in this, in, in some of these cases, you can do also do it from the web, from from a distance. But generally, you need to have some access to the device, right? But there are also side channels at higher levels. For example, device. Uh, if you have a mobile phone and you uh, you could try to get the passcode or the, the the access code that you use for the phone by looking at reflections. So some researchers has looked at, for example, sunglasses and identified through that because someone was wearing sunglasses what he typed in. But you could also do take a, a teapot or something else that has reflections. Um, you could also have uh, a look at the residues on the on the uh, on the touch on the touch screen. If you if you touch uh, with your fingers, it leaves some some smudges that that could be used to do uh, side channel uh, analysis on. Then there is a network. So in the network, you can get also a lot of information of what's going on. You could, for example, see who's uh, with. Uh, you cannot see what is being, for example, sent because of encryption. 
but you could identify how many messages are being sent and, and maybe even to who, who they are sent and you can get uh, information from that. I will look from, by the way, from each of the clusters. I will have some detailed slides later on with some, some examples to give some idea. And you can even do side channels from remotely. Uh, you could try to uh, identify uh, mobile devices if you access certain sensors or even location, maybe if you access a GPS, you could try to recognize the speech that that um, uh, uh, that that is said. So the, the, uh, you have some application maybe that's running the microphone on the background. And so all of these uh, different attacks have been performed uh, in literature. And you can also try to access sensors to get some information. So I, I will briefly uh, describe a couple of these side channels uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so just to give some more idea. But before I would do that, I would first like to show you the timeline of how these side channels uh, developed uh, over time. It started uh, as early as in 96 with timing. Um, and then uh, the reviewers focused mo mostly on power power attacks are very famous, then they start to go to, towards the design. And over time, it went to device and uh, to the software and web. Now, I did not put all the existing publications there because it would be a complete mess. But I just highlighted the ones that I'm going to talk in this um, presentation or ones that are very important uh, to uh, uh, like they inter introduced a new thing. And uh, uh, if anyone is interested in, uh, in the slides, I can give them and then you can also find the reference below. So let's start, for example, with uh, technology. So the power started very simple. If you have an RSA encryption, uh, in the beginning, there were no countermeasures. And if, there's, uh, if the key is one, then you have a certain operation where you do a multiply and otherwise you only square. And if you look then in your trace, the square and the multiply have different leakages. And based on that, you can identify what the key was. This was a very simple one with almost no processing. <clears throat> then DPA attacks were um, uh, devised. Um, this work, a bit, they are a bit more complicated. What you do is you measure a set of uh, messages you, uh, and then you assume, assume a certain key. And then based on some intermediate operation, the output of the S-Box, uh, you look uh, based on your assumption, if you uh, uh, and then you're going to sort the traces. If your assumption, uh, so basically what you do is you look at, at a certain bit, and then you classify them. Now, if your assumption of the key was wrong, and that basically means you just randomly group group the traces, uh, and, you, and when you average them and you take the uh, the difference between the two, you will not see anything. However, if your key was right, there will be a slight systematic difference between both groups, and then a, a peak will appear. Right, so this was the DPA attacks, and then CPA came in uh, by modifying this operation and the uh, person's correlation. And uh, after that, even further, people went even further on and start to use deep learning. And uh, then you, you basically train a neural network with traces uh, to, and you classify, in this case, it's uh, asymmetric. Uh, RSA, you classify the key bits either zero or one. And then when you want to attack the trace, you provide the same trace to the deep learning network and see if it, in the inference, if it can give you back your, uh, or predict uh, the right uh, labels for you. And of course, in, in deep learning, you might have very long traces. So you need to select some uh, points of interest. There are different methods and ways of uh, doing that um, to optimize and, and make sure that the neural network is not, not, not too big. Recently, uh, this actually just uh, 2020, some uh, uh, researchers looked at uh, thermal analysis. So what they did is you, you run a yes encryption, uh, you look over time, uh, you create a trace and you measure the temperature. And then they, what they did is they, they uh, trained a neural network on that and they were able to attack the key using uh, thermal side channels. Uh, we also recently submitted a paper on uh, 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 thermal side channels. The first thing that we did is we were looking if you can uh, identify simply by looking uh, different operations. So we created two loops, a small loop and a long loop, and, uh, and looked at how much difference the, the temperature uh, is between the start and the max of the loop. And we identified if you have more operations, then the peak temperature is higher and, uh, 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 yeah, and correlated that and over different moments in time. The problem with thermal attacks that we observed was you could have certain drifts, right? Because the temperature accumulates over time. It's not instantaneously like power, but also the um, dynamic voltage scaling of the CPU 
uh, could change uh, uh, suddenly, and uh, this will have a huge effect on the temperature that we see here. Um, so we did some pre-processing uh, to, to filter these things out, and we were able actually to do that, that you can see on the right side. And we actually successfully applied C, uh, 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 all the attacks that, that I mentioned in the in the previous slide, DPA, CPA, and simple power analysis on the thermal, uh, using thermal, thermal attacks. So let's move a level higher. So we go to the design. So the previous one were on technology. So some examples on, on design. So uh, a uh, malicious user could look at uh, different timings uh, of operations and use that in his advantage to, to, uh, to correlate this to certain data or to certain keys. Um, what we see here is, for example, the cash access time. Um, when you have a cash hit, there's statistically a huge difference between a, a hit, uh, access time, and a cash miss. And you can use this information, that's what Bernstein did in the cash attack, uh, to identify uh, a key. And also you can uh, uh, do this with floating point units and, 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 and other units uh, where uh, uh, the attacker successfully uh, exploited these, these uh, components. Okay, the next one is a uh, cache access attack. So uh, the way this works is um, an attacker first uh, initializes the cache. He can flush it or and then put his own data there. And then what he's doing is he's asking for an encryption. And then when the victim is start uh, uh, accessing the same cache because it's a shared resource, the attacker will monitor how long it takes to read his own data. If it takes, uh, it's a short time, then he knows that um, uh, his data is not overwritten. If it takes more time, then he understands that the, the victim uh, used that location. And by using statistics on this, um, the attacker can uh, eventually identify which uh, SBOX locations have been accessed and derive the key from there. Okay, there are some protections here. Uh, this is an interesting attack uh, uh, using a, a case set, a trace attack, what's called trace attack. So what this users did is they created a uh, malicious application. So consider, for example, in a, a Play Store of Google that you have an application. And what they did is they um, trained a machine learning or deep learning and deep learning network. And what they feed to them was the timing uh, that uh, their application needed to access the last level cache. And what they were able to do uh, to achieve was they were able to, uh, to recognize uh, from uh, uh, an inference from uh, this uh, trained neural network, what application you are running. So they were able to identify all of them, 100 ones, and which websites you are running. So if you have this uh, malicious application in your phone, then basically, anything, any website or any application that is trained to recognize just by looking at the time to access the last level cache, they were able to identify that. Another example is a smudge attack. So uh, once you use your phone, you, of course, you move uh, with your fingers on the screen and just leave this, uh, this kind of smudges. If you take, if you, sh if you take some light source and change the angles, uh, that you that you point to the phone, you get kind of patterns, and they were able just without any processing by just looking. They were I think they had a success rate of seventy percent. I don't know the number exactly by heart, in getting the slight pattern that was used to 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 open the phone. Uh, this is an, uh, uh, the network attack uh, on Bluetooth. Another example. Uh, in this kind of attack, uh, when you have a mixed signal circuit, so IoT is very popular nowadays, so you always have some digital processing and some analog to, to, to communicate right, with the internet. Um, and what this attack has identified and showed was uh, in 2019 that if you run your digital AES score, um, it has some leakage into the, into the uh, analog domain. And how that works is you can see that in this picture, when the transmitter is off, you cannot see any signals in the air. When you put your transmission on, but you don't run the core, you just basically see your, your, your modulation. So the signals getting modulated here before they are sent out. And then you have the higher uh, harmonic uh, uh, signals there. And then once you run AES, so you only run the digital part, um, you could see in, your, um, in the air, so from a uh, transmitted signal, uh, uh, of your AES, and what they uh, what what they did is they were able to recover the key uh, up to a, a ten meter distance. Now it was also in the lab, so uh, but still they demonstrated that 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 this could be possible. 
Okay, uh, let me move on. Uh, this is another example. Uh, here, the, the, uh, the, the, the research showed that if you access the accelerometer, you can identify which uh, um, uh, uh, numbers are being pressed. So assume, for example, you have a calculator on the internet uh, based on, uh, you could train that, for example, on the user, each different digit that you press has some different signature in the accelerometer. So a nine looks, for example, completely different than, than a one. And based on that, you can identify what someone is typing. And then I have another example here on uh, light. So these light sensors uh, that you have on the phone are typically used to switch off the screen when you put the light close to your, uh, the phone close to your head. Um, so what, uh, what this research, research is so that if you use this light sensor, you can also identify which keys have been pressed. So for example, if you press a one, then your hand is a bit higher. So there's less light coming into, into the sensors. But if you press a five, a nine or a zero, you get more light, right? So you can identify based on this, uh, which uh, a number has been pressed. Uh, there are different sensors. So uh, different sensors show different data. So they, they, they were able to do that with uh, both sensors. And also if you have a number on the same level, for example, one and three, but just because your three is outside the uh, it's more to the right, it's, uh, it blocks less the light and you also have a higher level. So they were really, uh, the danger of this is that new web standards like W3RC are adding access to this kind of devices by default. So if you are not aware that people can use them to get uh, secret information or the access code, um, it starts to become a problem. Okay. Uh, so let's go quickly through the, a bit through the countermeasures. I see that I have limited time left. Um, so most of the researchers focus only on this lower level, on the technology and design. Uh, of course, the, uh, we don't own this, this kind of, we don't make phones and so forth. So, so I only focus on, on, on this kind of countermeasures. Um, so the first thing that uh, to, to show is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the timeline of the countermeasures over time, I will go into some of them a little bit to just explain the concept behind them. But what's very interesting to see is that the first Count, uh, the first side channels that appeared, uh, let's say in this this time range, the countermeasures started to appear um, over this this uh, over this time, and typically what 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 people do or res what researchers do, they first try of course the easy solutions at the architecture level, then they identify that they don't work, they try to fix some stuff in the circuit level, still identify their issues, um, then they go to technology level. The problem really with the technology level is you need to produce a chip. So it's very hard to verify for other researchers whether these methods really actually work because you have to prototype and so forth. Um, uh, so, this, uh, so that's a bit difficult. Then you have, again, a new sets of attack and then the countermeasures are starting to pair up. Um, so I expect for this later attacks that have been uh, recently developed that in the coming years that also some people have some smart ways of uh, dealing with the uh, meltdown and spectra instead of just patching the thing and, and basically kill the performance. So now I will go through some of these examples uh, of each of these different categories. Uh, so if you are interested in the slides and you want to have more information about uh, the references, you're free to, to look at that for more details. Um, so let's take some examples. So start first with the lowest level, which is technology. Uh, one way of, uh, of, of trying to, to, to make this side channels, uh, the power-based and EM-based side channels less successful is by trying to balance the power. So if this is your chip, so typically what an attacker is, is doing, he's adding some shunt res resistance or some other way uh, of to, to measure the power. And then if the power is typically like this, and because of different operations, you have different power, it's easy to attack. So what, what uh, a countermeasure here to balance the power is to use built-in capacitances that try to flatten the power. So um, you have some spare energy here that can be used to, to, to make sure that these, these, these high peaks are not there. Uh, the problem, of course, with, with this kind of scheme is that they increase the uh, area and they are only very limited in focus because they only consider power. So what about EM or about heat and so forth? You could try to, to inject noise in the system. So you could, for example, have an analog uh, uh, piece in front of your uh, VDD line that would randomly generate uh, noise into, in, in, into your VDD line. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that 
you reduce your, your, your operating margins, it increases the area, it increases the power, and an attacker could still collect many traces and do statistical analysis and still cancel the, the noise out. This is another interesting paper uh, called Stella by the authors. So what they try to do here is they try to provide countermeasures against um, uh, EM, electromagnetic fields. So what they do is, this is their core, and they only use lower metal layers. So they don't want to use the higher metal layers because then uh, the EM to the outside can be observable. Um, and so they only use this lower metal layers and you basically have the higher layers as a shield. And what they identify then still as a problem is that the power is still leaking. You have still a lot of operations. Then they use a second, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, block or module, which is called signature attenuating hardware that is also flatting the power. So instead of having uh, high peaks, you have a more balanced uh, equalized uh, power consumption. So by having this, they, com they combine two countermeasures against EM and against power. Uh, but then again, I'm not sure or how, uh, how good it works against thermal attacks or other types of attacks are, are popping up, uh, it's still questionable. The difficulty about this thing is you really need to be an expert in the place and route. You need to make sure that you avoid higher metal layers and, and have the proper routing uh, and so forth. So there are also new technologies um, uh, that people explore for, uh, for, for, uh, for the side channel. Um, so in this particular case, the author looked at uh, MemRistor. So MemRistor is a two terminal device that, ha that has a hysteresis loop that can be used to store a low resistance and a high resistance. So one of the resistances is in this VI uh, line and the other one here. And then you can switch between them based on the, uh, the voltage polarity that is applied to the switch. Um, so what they did is they used what's called mem uh, 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 MemRistor ratio logic. So they have different inputs to a gate. So yeah, they looked at two gates and an OR, uh, and, and they identified that there, theoretically there is no current consumption if you have a certain input combination. Um, so they are the same. And if you have this input combination, you have a different current. Um, and by that, they tried to hide basically the differences in the power consumption between the two. So this is the first paper uh, that I found in literature that focused on using these new technologies um, for, for the uh, to protect against side channel analysis. Another way that you could do, so now I'm, I'm moving up to circuit, uh, try to, buy the, uh, uh, to, to balance the power uh, using what's called dual real logic gate. And the idea is that in this gate, it doesn't matter which input transition combination you have, it will always consume the same power. Ideally, of course, because of process variations, you might get some 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 differences here and there. Um, and this works in two stages. It first uh, will uh, charge up the internal lines and then uh, evaluate the logic function. The problem also with this dual rate gate, it's very expensive. So normally, if you would have a limited number of gates to perform an end gate, now you have many many more. And the second issue with this is you have some routing issues to make sure that all the uh, the lines are that the timing is, is precise, otherwise you still uh, leak information. Another leakage source at the design level uh, circuit is your uh, uh, testing. So if, you are, if your scan chain is open, um, if your key is part of the chain, uh, scan chain or the in, uh, output rounds of the certain rounds of your encryption, you could easily uh, break the encryption system. In order to prevent that there are different things, you could always force a reset before scanning in so that all the content is, is erased in, in, in the flip-flops. You could encrypt the scan chain using some challenge key response pair uh, such that only uh, authorized users that are aware of how the POF uh, responses uh, work that can have access to this device or another method that also is um, uh, uh, explored is by um, if using the scan in and just disabling it. The problem with disabling the scan chain, then you cannot, uh, if you wanted the diagnosis as a force in the field, uh, uh, you cannot do that then anymore. Then there are some countermeasures against uh, architecture, keeping an eye on the time. So you could try to, to insert random delays or change the clock frequency. So basically how that will look is like this. So normally you collect traces based on these operations, but now you insert some dummy operations or you could even try to change uh, the frequency just to create misalignment and make it a bit harder. 
that if you have proper uh, pre-processing techniques, these things can be broken. What you could also try to do is if, if uh, dependencies allow uh, to change the order of operations and make sure that uh, it may, it's harder for the attacker to collect statistical information. But also this is very limited. You need to look at dependencies. Uh, probably you have to pay penalty in, uh, in performance. Then there is masking. Um, the concept of masking is you try to, to, to change your intermediate operations so that you make it harder for the attacker to, to, to identify what uh, key is used. So basically, if you have an SBOX operation, you have two to XOR mask. This one basically remaps the uh, indexes in the table, and this one is basically changing the values. Uh, unfortunately, also this kind of mask have been broken by high order attacks. So, um, and typically due to area overhead and complexity, uh, only dual masks have been tried out, but also these have been broken already. Um, let me see if I have enough time. So the time is a bit, um, I will skip this one. Um, uh, we'll skip also this one. So maybe this one is interesting to, to mention. So um, in, this guy, uh, in this paper, the authors created the smart detector. Uh, what they did is they monitored uh, cache miss rates from L1, L2, and L3, and tried to identify if they could uh, detect certain uh, cache attacks, flush and reload, and flush and flush. If you want to find more details about these attacks, please uh, refer to the paper. They achieved some high accuracies, but they could not detect it um, 100%. In one hour, our previous papers, we actually did uh, a more systematic way. We uh, looked at the patterns that each of these uh, different attacks, these case attacks had, and tried to model a certain template that allows us to detect them. And actually, by doing that, we made a very uh, low cost um, a detector that could detect all of, all of these different cache attacks with a very high accuracy uh, and low overhead. Uh, another countermeasure is uh, trying to break the leakage model. So typically what you have is uh, if you have uh, more transitions in your design, you, uh, uh, more transitions uh, 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 in your design or more signals driven high at the output. So the hamming weight of the S-Box, you have higher power consumption. And it, uh, the current countermeasures fo focus mostly on blinding, trying to make the power flat or trying to add random noise. But if you if you add in, you, it's very difficult to, to make this ideal. If you add enough traces, you can still uh, typically attack attack uh, uh, attack them. And one of the countermeasures uh, which is interesting is they try to change this behavior. So uh, maybe if you have uh, zero transitions, it could be here, but at the same time, it could be there. If you have four transitions, so they try to, to break this correlation that if you have a higher hemming weight, high uh, hemming distance that you, uh, uh, with the power. And the way they did that is they uh, created a neural network um, where they, uh, of course, they have to have the deterministic input. So they made sure that this neural network uh, provide the same as box operation. Um, they did different uh, um, sets of training. So they have multiple of these uh, uh, networks, but with different weights. And what you could see is if you do not protect you, uh, the key rank, which is the guest key by the attacker, when it's zero, then you have the right key. It's very fastly broken for different types of attacks, CPA, DPA, deep learning, and template. But with this particular implementation, they were able to, it was very hard to attack it because the rank was showing really uh, chaotic behavior. Then I would like to focus on one more countermeasure. I, have, I see that I'm closely over time. Um, uh, one, uh, this is our previous work. One of the interesting things is we always like to have simple countermeasures with low overhead. And one countermeasure, for example, is by trying to, to make the operations equal for, for RSA. So you have a square multiplication. If your key is different, then in essence, you have different operations. and you only have to identify the different operations to get back basically to your key. So in one of these countermeasures, what we did is we tried to make the, uh, the operations equal. So um, uh, we exploit two key bits at the same time and always do square square multiply. So independent of what your key is, you have always the, the same type of operations. This makes the side channel uh, harder because you now you, it's not the operation that you have to uh, identify the difference, but you have to identify uh, what value has been used to, to understand the differences. So these four combinations, you can rewrite them uh, into this square-square multiply. So you have a square-square and multiply for, for all of them. 
square square and then multiply. So it's much more difficult because now you have to identify these intermediate values and they could be uh, really anything. So uh, this shows the training on this uh, protected implementation. Uh, although the pro uh, training, uh, uh, um, uh, this neural network to identify this, this operations was successful, but in the validation phase, um, it was really not, uh, the neural network was really not able to, to, break, to break the key. And we tried different implementations here, square and multiply and the Montgomery implementation. So let me conclude this uh, presentation. I'm a little bit overhead, uh, over time. So there are a lot of new side channels uh, appearing regularly. Uh, I showed that in the timeline and they could occur at any level uh, from technology uh, at the bottom all the way up to software layers, but also at devices or things over the network and so forth. And it's very difficult to protect against them because um, in order to do that, you have to be aware this, uh, uh, um, vertically on the stack to make sure that that if you do something in the technology you cannot exploit it on the web and vice versa but this is really really a complex uh, complex task and i also believe that um, some research in the future will uh, pop up on uh, emerging technologies so in the restores or sst MRAMs and so forth um, they have to be also uh, taken into considerations to see if maybe if the leakage uh, as the paper showed, actually, uh, the one on the memory store, that it has initially a, a less less leakage. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a bit over time. Sorry for that. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Professor Tavio, for the nice presentation. Um, yes, we have uh, two That's questions fine. so far. So the first one is by Tony Pustinen. And it's about power uh, analysis. Uh, so the question is, in which places can the power signal be measured and with what kind of tools to successfully conduct power analysis on a desktop PC or laptop uh, attached to a power socket? And are there any countermeasures for the users uh, of these devices? Yeah, so typically, um, if in order to do this power analysis, it is difficult if you have onboard regulators and so forth. So it makes it really impossible. So these kind of things work typically for uh, like simple, cheap uh, microcontrollers, simple IoT devices and so forth. To do the power on a PC or desktop, I think uh, it's, I don't see the, uh, the practicability or usability uh, uh, of doing that. Um, uh, it, but for example, uh, if, you do, uh, if you do thermal analysis, then it becomes actually relevant for a PC because if you are running uh, shared application, uh, applications and you can simply monitor the, uh, the, the temperature of the other processors, you can also probably still uh, do an attack there. But doing power on a PC or laptop, I'm not sure if, that, if, if that's adding uh, uh, any value. And I think it's also be too complex to do because uh, these PCs and laptop, uh, these uh, advanced CPUs have very complex uh, voltage regulators and so forth, which makes it very difficult to do power on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is by Michaela Dami Damian. Uh, regarding power analysis, which countermeasure is more efficient, masking or shuffling? So basically there are two types of uh, countermeasures that you could uh, try to summarize uh, in blinding and masking. As far as I know, um, all of the things that are being published in literature, let's say not recently, but given enough time, uh, these things have all been broken. Um, so it's, I, I think in, uh, um, I think uh, the best way to deal with this is try to have a combination of both if if the uh, area allows you that if the overhead allows you. But I th uh, it, uh, yeah. I th so I have worked with both countermeasures in both cases. It's, if you collect enough traces, you will break it. It's very difficult to really make it secure. Okay, thanks. And we have another question uh, in the chat section. Uh, so do you recommend to start designing uh, Membristor-based cryptographic uh, functions such as ciphers? No, because Membristors have other problems at this stage, and that is to make sure that they work, uh, that they are reliable. You have a lot of issues with uh, drifting of uh, ions and so forth, so retention time, uh, um, endurance issues. So I don't think that that it's ready to use this yet. Maybe as uh, maybe you can do that with SCT. Yeah, that's already closer to market. Um, uh, the thing is, you first have to analyze and investigate whether these things work or not. So I, I cannot say that the leakage will be less than if you use uh, FinFET or, or Planner technology. You have to evaluate that first. 
because mm -hmm. each um, each device has a has a, dif a different characteristic or different fo footprint on the on the leakage. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions from uh, the panelists? Just to remind you that the panelists can actually ask uh, by voice. If not, um, I have a short question regarding this. Um, this one example, which I find quite interesting, where the gyroscope of a mobile phone was basically used uh, to uh, to extract the information. So the typed in password, for example. Yeah. Um, but in your presentation, you kind of didn't address uh, these kind of scenarios. So how to protect against such an attack? Yeah, I mentioned some of these things here, but I had no time really to go in detail. Yeah, the only thing that you either do is you don't allow, basically the only thing you can do is don't allow these applications to access these, uh, these sensors. But then you have, of course, these problems like that you have, when you have these new uh, web standards that, that by default allow web browsers to access these things. Then you got this kind of things that people can even use light sensors to identify the numbers that you type in. And I think you could also expand this to anything that you type as yes. long as you have good. Uh, yeah, it seems like a very powerful attack with. <laughs> it's very difficult to protect to protect these things. Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, I think we are out of time. Uh, yeah, thanks, Professor Willy, for the interesting presentation. You're welcome. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. And um, yeah, we are continuing now with the next presentation, which will be by uh, Johanna Bear from TU Munich, who will tell us something about open source IC design and hardware reverse engineering. So Johanna, maybe you could uh, show your slides uh, while I do the introductions. Sure. So um, Johanna Bear received her master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from the Technical University of Munich and in 2016, and has since been working as a research assistant and PhD candidate at the Chair of Security and Information Technology under the supervision of uh, Professor Georg Siegel. Uh, her research interests include hardware reverse engineering, logic locking, hardware trojans, and uh, IC trust. Um, so Johanna, the stage is yours. Thanks so much. So uh, we've already had one talk regarding uh, logic locking previously, and I think we have two more talks regarding reverse engineering today. So uh, I think we switched around. So I'll talk a little bit more about general reverse engineering, and then hopefully you get more specific stuff later on. Um, before I do anything else, though, I really want to say that um, I love open source design, and I really want it to be here to stay, and I do believe it's here to stay. So anything I say here, please keep this in mind, um, whether it be sort of this, this idea of Open Titan, which is kind of a very recent and commercial idea of open source design, where we want to get something like the Google Titan chip to be almost completely open source, or whether it be something like, for example, the Pulp platform, which has been around for quite a while and has recently kind of become more commercial, uh, which was obviously developed, um, or one of the sort of parts of it is ETH Zurich, um, whether it be something like Open Course, which has been around since 1999 and obviously has a huge amount of IP you can get on there from something that is non-synthesizable to complete cores. Um, and obviously the fantastic thing about open source design is always it's transparent. We can completely view the code. It's not a black box, which might be something we buy from somewhere else. It's verifiable due to this being completely open. Um, it's customizable. So I can say, look, I might want some part of my RISC-V design, for example, to look a little bit different, or I might like to add some stuff or take away some stuff. Um, it's obviously low cost, generally. Um, so there are some stuff you do have to pay for um, get it open source, but that's not what I really mean by open source. I do mean stuff that is being shared in the community openly. And that does mean that it's available for teaching and academia as well, which is obviously fantastic because it means that we get to do um, more research on exactly these kind of designs and how they impact, for example, reverse engineering. And for us in a security point of view, obviously this verifiability um, topic is very interesting and very important and is why we actually like this as well, other than being really you know, low cost and everything else that's great about it. Um, I will show you a slide that you have kind of seen before uh, about two hours ago, whenever it was, um, just showing a little bit different. So this is the life of a chip as you might have it if you had open source design. And how it might work is um, you are a company who wants to create a chip and you might buy a little bit of IP and you might use, for example, mainly open source designs as well. You would have your in-house design team that maybe uh, designs some other stuff to go on there as well. You have integration team and eventually you get a RTL netlist. 
You might do some RTL verification, uh, do some logic synthesis, get your gate level netlist, um, eventually do your physical synthesis and do your layout, so your GDS2 layer. You might do some layout verification, send that off to the foundry, um, you get your waiver, you do testing, your packaging, and then you have sort of your, your chip life cycle at the end. So that's generally how chips work. Um, in an open source context, obviously the the main change is that we do have a design that is open source, so um, not something black box or gray box. Plus, you may also want to be using open source tools. So there are open source tools available, which also mean that your core um, or your code is more um, customizable or more uh, you can have a little bit more effect on what actually happens in there. So that's generally what it looks like. Um, but I'm a hard reverse engineer, right? So that's what I do. And I want to talk about what we actually want to do when we start hard reverse engineering. So the idea that we have here is that we want to understand what is the functionality of a chip that we have sitting in front of us. And why do we want to do that? We want to identify, for example, product over production. So what might happen is that you have spent a lot of money creating a wonderful chip and you have sent it off to the foundry and the foundry says that's a great chip. We're going to make two million more and send you sort of what you ordered, but we'll sell the other two million. So we want to, you know, try to avoid that, we might want to find some kind of IP infringement. So it might happen that someone says, hey, that's a really great chip. I would like to know what kind of stuff you have in there. And then I'm going to make exactly the same one. So you could do some hard reverse engineering, have a look at some of the chips that are out there and see if your IP is on there that shouldn't be on there. And the final one that we often talk about is of the hardware Trojans. We're always worried that within our chip or our design, there's something in there that we don't want to have happen or something in there that we didn't plan for, um, whether that be a stupid change that just accidentally happened or something really malicious. Um, on the other hand, uh, when we look into this from an open source kind of perspective, um, IP infringement is not such a huge topic because as we do have an open source design and it's sort of freely available, um, you know, you're probably not too worried about IP infringement. The same thing about product overproduction. Generally, you probably won't spend quite as much money on the design. Um, and so you probably don't care so much uh, if the foundry does do something with your design. Hardware Trojans are still, at least in a security context, um, one question though. So that's all the positive stuff you can do, right? But of course, as in security always, we do have negative parts to have reverse engineering. And um, that does mean that we can use reverse engineering to identify, for example, IP advances by competitors. So maybe you didn't create the great chip, but someone else did. And you wanna know what did they actually do and how do I do that too? So you get the chip, you'd reverse engineer it and then you might be able to steal the IP. Um, you could also use it to identify, for example, weaknesses for some kind of hardware attack. So you might say, look, I have this really great security chip. I wonder what it does and maybe let's have a look if there's a crypto core on there somewhere and if we find that let's have a look where the registers are which might be interesting to I don't know do a fold attack or do some probing or do some side channel whatever um, so that might be interesting um, and the final one obviously if I want to insert hardware children into something I need to know where to insert them I can't kind of go in there randomly doing stuff and hoping something cool will come out of it. So I actually need to know where do I place this stuff. Um, from an open source perspective, again, IP advancement by competitors, uh, it's open source. So you probably don't care so much what they're doing. It's probably the same open source design that you also downloaded from whatever page. Um, could be possible that you've added some crypto and you don't want someone to figure out some weaknesses. We also don't care about it so much though. And the final one is that we do have the problem of hardware Trojan insertion points. So that's something that we do still have when we talk about open source IC design in combination with reverse engineering. Um, when we talk about hardware Trojan insertion points, uh, I'll come back to this kind of slide. Uh, we generally say when we talk about hardware Trojan insertion points, we have, for example, that stuff is inserted in the IP. So for example, you buy a black box IP and you get what you wanted plus something extra. This is obviously something that isn't gonna happen with open source design because obviously it's open source. So you can look into it and actually verify completely whether there's something in that it didn't want to be in there. Um, the second area we usually say that something might come in is maybe in your in-house design team. I'm gonna hope that your in-house design team is trustable. So I'm also gonna ignore that threat for the time being. And the third big one where we kind of say maybe something could be inserted here or done here is the foundry. So the foundry will get your design and they will say, oh, fantastic. Let's put something in there because whatever reason you might want. Um, of course, uh, the sooner you stop being able to trust someone in the design flow, the more easy it becomes to actually insert something. So uh, for example, if, if your designing stops kind of up here and design integration after that, then it's probably a lot easier to insert something than for example, at the foundry. Um, when we come to the foundry, let's have a look what it actually looks like for them. Um, so we have this full hard reverse engineering process and I did have uh, see that someone had a question regarding this IC imaging before. So I will quickly talk about that in a minute. Um, so when we talk about reverse engineering, what happens, our chip 
comes out of the foundry. And that's where we start. So um, the first part is very much a physical process. So you get the chip, you depackage it. Then you might have to ha check how many layers does the chip have. This kind of depends on whether you created it yourself or whether it's someone else's chip. Uh, you might kind of do a, a side uh, view of the chip and see, OK, eight metal layers, fantastic. Um, then the fun part starts because you actually have to delayer it. So you have to basically um, manage to somehow scrape off each different layer and then image that. And with images, you get something like a couple of thousand images per layer. And obviously that adds up. So with eight metal layers and one silicon layer, you'd be like nine times a couple of thousand images. So you have all these wonderful chip images. Um, and then you get into the topic of image processing because obviously you have to put these all together into one big picture. So first you have your T 2D stitching where you basically align the pictures you've taken. This might be like 6,000 pictures per layer and you have to figure out where do they overlap? Do they overlap? How do I put them all together? And the same thing in a 3D kind of way. So basically putting the layers on top of each other. The next thing you do would be interconnect identification. I've got a picture down here, um, what that might look like. So basically you could try to find your vias and your uh, sort of connections and to say, look, uh, this point connects here and this point connects there. Um, you would then go ahead and try to find all standard cells. So some poor designer might say, okay, for this um, technology node, uh, we have 400 cells and each one looks like this. And then your image processing tool would go, okay, I find this one here and that one there and this one here and that one there. And eventually what you would get is some kind of net list. Um, so that's kind of where we start. And this is actually where my research generally starts. So that's why I have kind of a bit of a question mark there. And the idea here is that from a list to go to something human understandable, some kind of high level description, whether that be, for example, RTL code, or even something like I could say it's a risk five um, risky core or something like that. Um, so the, the idea of what high level or abstraction level we're going to here seems is a little bit different every now and then. Um, so that's kind of the full process you would do if you do get a chip and you don't really know what you're doing with it and you want to have a look inside it. For a foundry, if they want to actually insert something, um, they start here. So they get your GDS2 data and that's flat and non-hierarchical and it's pretty easy to get a netlist out of that. And then they sort of start and say, look, where might be interesting parts to add some kind of hardware children? So they have to also do some kind of abstraction and then they can eventually insert any kind of change or a hardware children. So for the foundry, it's actually a lot easier. Good. Um, when we talk about these final couple of processes that the founder would have to do, so, and sorry, my mic sometimes fails, but it should be okay. So when we talk about this final part, so we go from the netlist to something where I can eventually insert a Trojan, we actually have two problems. So on the on the left-hand side here, you see kind of, I think it's a risky core from Pulp. Um, you have some kind of design and what you want to do is basically partition. So basically find where do these boxes belong, which gate in my netlist um, belongs to which sort of module or box of functionality. So for example, if you have a core, you might say, you know, this is the multiply, this is the ALU, this is some um, reg files or whatever else. Um, and you wouldn't actually know what this the functionality is yet, but you would say these belong together here, these 10,000 go here. So on the right-hand side, you would see that, for example, that you can say, look, these gates sort of belong together. And the second part you would do is to identify. Um, so to say, okay, look, I found my modules, my boxes, my grouped nodes, my grouped gates, I want to now say this is actually this functionality. So maybe it's a cryptographic core or a RISC-V core or something or other. And um, these two steps are actually linked. So if you're finding that you um, have already partitioned a little bit and you can't identify anything, you would go back and partition more and more. So if it's very much divide and conquer, you partition until you can identify. If you get down to sort of a very small level and you haven't been able to identify, well, bad luck, probably doing something wrong or don't have enough data yet. Um, so these are the two problems that we generally have. And I do want to very quickly talk about some of the methods we have there. Um, so for the partitioning part, we generally have two different methods. I would like to call one of them exact and one of them fuzzy. And the exact one is basically the idea that we are trying to identify where the data path is. So we're trying to find how does data flow from the inputs to the outputs. For example, here I've got an IS. And anyone who's seen an IS knows there's a couple of stuff you have to go through. You do like 10 rounds. So you might say, look, I'm trying to find for something that kind of uh, does a couple of steps after each other, maybe 10 times, if you have like a fully um, complete IES. Obviously, that's not how you write it nowadays. But you might try to see, okay, we have uh, sort of 32 flip flops here and 32 flip flops here, and data goes between them. And then we would cut exactly at these points and say, this part here is probably a module. Um, it becomes a little bit more difficult than that when we do go sort of into the research. But the basic idea is we're trying to figure out how does data flow. And every time we kind of find places where data comes together, we cut there, we cut there, and take the stuff in between and define that to be a module. 
The other thing we can do is we can do some kind of graph analysis or structural analysis. And the basic idea here is that form follows function, right? So if you have, um, for example, a design and you have some bus in there and you have different modules coming off that bus, you could very easily say, look, I'll have a look um, at where stuff is more interconnected and say, that's probably a module. And then the stuff where it all comes together, that's probably a bus. And you can see that here, that's actually an Ariane core, not completely something like um, 10,000, uh, sorry, not 10,000, 100,000 gates that you see there, um, which have been very, very simply just um, layouted and shown. And you can already see it here that you do have some functionality. And I'll come back to some of these pictures in a little while. And that is a very fuzzy way of doing it, obviously. So it can happen that you might have gates that are kind of like attributed to the wrong module or maybe some stuff that's not found and whatever else. Um, but it does have some advantages, which I'll get to in a little while. Um, we then have the second part, right? So we've now said these cells belong here, these gates belong here. What is this thing now? What is the module we've just found? And we generally tend to do that, not always, but mostly by comparison to something that we know. We call this known thing the golden model. So the golden model might be, for example, an adder that you've seen before. Um, it could be some design you've designed before. It could be something, you know, in our case, obviously for, for um, open source design, it's probably something open source, which you can also download. So we try to identify something unknown by comparing it to something known. And if it's open source, the unknown stuff will definitely also be, we will have access to some to the same thing somehow because it's open source. And there's three different ways of doing that. So we have again, an exact and inexact way. Uh, the first way is doing it functionally. So we are really comparing like the Boolean algebra of the two designs. We would look at them really functionality and we could do something like a MITRE circuit. So we connect all the inputs of the unknown and some test design. So something where we think that might be it and all the outputs. And if we test all input possibilities, we basically want all the outputs to always be exactly the same. So we basically say, is this thing functional, uh, functionally completely identical to our known thing? And if it is, obviously it's the same thing. At least that's what the math says. Um, the second thing we can do is uh, data path based or FSM identification. So we're basically trying to find the sequential part of um, of our design. Uh, so we could do a lot of different methods for FSM identification, which I don't want to get into. And this is actually generally the part where you might not always be comparing against something that you do know. In an open source use case, um, you will get these exact FSMs because you do have the open source design as well, but this can be done without comparing. And finally, you do have a sort of a structural way of doing it. So again, um, you saw previously one of the larger pictures and you saw very easily that it's very identifiable with your uh, with your eyes. And if you look here, it's just some designs that um, I will show this picture a little bit later um, in bigger as well, um, where you can basically say, uh, if it looks the same, it's probably similar. And obviously we have possibilities of doing that, for example, with machine learning or some statistics to figure out how alike graphs look. Um, I would like to talk very quickly about these two methods, um, the functional and the structural or the exact versus the fuzzy and what kind of the good things and bad things are. Um, just because I find it interesting and maybe you do too. So when we do functional comparison, the nice thing that we have here is that it is usable across all different synthesis tools. So it doesn't matter what you use, whether it's open source or something commercial and all different cell libraries. So if you're using eight nanometers and you're comparing to something that's synthesized in 128 or whatever, 120, um, it doesn't matter. You can compare that because you're looking only at the functionality. So at the pure functionality, um, which is quite nice. However, it does mean that the functionality must be completely identical and there can be no customization. So for example, if the open source design, which you have as known in your golden model library. So if you have a golden model, if that has a multiplier with 32 bit and in the other one, the unknown one, the one you're trying to reverse engineer for some reason, they went, look, we'll have 64 bit multiplier, uh, that's not going to be able to match. If, for example, they said, look, we'll do some weird kind of multiplication where one number doesn't multiply properly or whatever, they do some kind of weird customization to it, it's not going to be comparable. So you actually need to have the exact same design in your golden model library. And that does mean that any kind of errors that occur, for example, in the petitioning are going to really ruin this because, uh, for example, if you say you petition, and you're trying to find the multiplier and you're missing, let's say, an inverted gate. So you, you've lost an inverted gate somewhere in the petitioning because some this is quite common and occurs, um, then you wouldn't be able to do this kind of functional comparison very easily. There are ways of getting around that a little bit. You can use, um, for example, QBFs instead of satisfiability solving does work, but generally you want really exact identical functionalities in your known and unknown. Um, and Hello, that does Joanna? mean- 
yeah, sure. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for interrupting. Uh, it seems like the next speaker will actually not be joining today. So uh, if you need a little bit more time, it would be fine. Fantastic. Yeah. And I can then I can take a drink and speak a little bit yeah. slower. <laughs> yeah, right. And I do see there's a question there already, but I guess we're doing questions right at the end, right? Yes, it would be nice. Okay. Perfect. So as I was saying, that does require like a little bit more strict partitioning um, and you can't really use this fuzzy partitioning to do this. I will quickly take a drink. Okay. Um, one other problem that we do have is that we require some kind of IO matching. That's a side topic, but we do need to basically figure out which one is the reset input on the unknown one and obviously connect that to the known one. Um, not so important, but it is an extra difficulty which can take time. Um, if we're looking at the structural partitioning identification, so this kind of fuzzy thing, um, we also have the great point that we are able to use this across different synthesis tools and cell libraries, and this is actually research we've been doing, and we found that um, even very different synthesis tools will compile, will synthesize uh, the same things to look Similarly, obviously there's huge differences, for example, in gate count. So we have had the stuff where um, we have had a design which is 50,000 gates and in another um, synthesis tool and another cell library, we have only maybe 20,000 gates. However, the look or the structure will remain the same. And that's something we can quantify statistically or with machine learning or some other graph um, based analysis. So it actually is usable across different synthesis tools and cell libraries. Um, the nice thing is also the functionality does not have to be ex extremely the same. So it is possible that, for example, if the unknown design had some customization and I, as a reverse engineer, have the open source design, I would still be able to say that's the same thing or very, at least very, very close. It could also mean that, for example, if I have a set of risk five designs, which are open source, and someone has developed a risk five design, which is not open source, so which is maybe um, closed, I can still take a shot at reverse engineering it because I have so many samples which are very similar looking, and I can actually have a good shot at trying to reverse, yeah, I can basically reverse engineer. Um, furthermore, we can use it with partitioning errors. So if our partitioning is anything less than perfect, this is the method we're probably gonna go with. And quite nicely, because we are able to deal with errors, we're actually able to deal with some types of gate level logic locking. If you um, remember previously, we had a very short introduction to the topic of logic locking, especially uh, this, I think we, a random version was shown there. And the idea is that we are adding extra stuff and that can be interpreted as errors. And these errors, we don't care about with this kind of reverse engineering, which is obviously fantastic because if I'm a foundry and want to insert something in your open source code and you did some logic locking, I don't care with this method. Um, if you really, really, really want to get very much down into, for example, identifying simple or single um, flip-flops or single gates, it may be that you need some further verification. Um, for example, in the form of this functional matching, however, you would only have to do that for very small parts of your whole entire design. And if you were to do that, you would have, again, have this IO matching, which you might need. So um, that's kind of the two different views that I would see when looking at reverse engineering. You can try to do this very functional, um, exact style. You can kind of try to do this very fuzzy, not so exact style, which, um, however, allows you a little bit more control or allows you a little bit more flexibility in your reverse engineering process. It means it, that the results tend to be a little fuzzy sometimes. You do have to verify them, but you can deal with errors and partitioning. You can deal with logic locking, some logic locking types, not all of them, obviously. And that makes it a lot more powerful in my eyes, at least. That's an opinion, though. That's not, not scientifically proven, but it's an opinion on my side. Um, I would like to go through a short example with you because you can't ever talk about reverse engineering without reverse engineering anything. So I have a RISC-V Ariana core. I did show it to you before. I'll show it a little bit differently. So again, this is about 100,000 gates that you're seeing here. And I have, because if I didn't do this, I have layouted for you because if I didn't do this, you would basically see a whole, a black giant dot. Um, so I did do some layouting beforehand and this is kind of what it looks like. And you might say, okay, I've seen RISC-V before. That's not what it looks like when it's layouted on a chip. Yeah, that's right. So this is completely separate from any IC layouting. This is a graph layouting view. And just so you feel more comfortable, this is actually what some of the parts are. So you see, for example, in red on the side that I guess I would think of a shell, that shell looking thing is a multiplier. Um, we have in blue, the reg files. We have some performance counters in yellow, which apparently connected that. Um, we have our ALU in green at the top. And we have, for example, the issue, issue, issue stage uh, in cyan at the, at the bottom. 
And because I did promise that you can do this stuff with logic locked circuits, I'm going to show you a logic locked circuit, which has, I think, 10% random logic locking. And of course, it looks completely different, uh, not so much. Um, so we have uh, 10,000 gates more inserted here. And you can see that the structure very, very much remains the same. We still have the same kind of um, functionalities represented at the same areas. There is slight differences in the layouting here because it does have a random aspect to it, but we see um, that we have the same areas and they have the same kind of shapes. So for example, we again have these kind of starbursts here and we have our multiplier, which is very distinctive. Um, and because that's not enough, I then also decided to do something like 50% logic locking. So we now have 50,000 extra gates and that looks something like this. And you can see it's starting to get a little bit fuzzy now, but we actually still have exactly the same shapes in there because I do want you to be able to kind of look at it all. These are the three pictures in total. So we have on the top left, our normal design with 10, 000, uh, 100,000 gates. Uh, here we have 110,000 gates and here we have 150,000 gates with logic locking in there. So that's quite nice to see um, that the structure doesn't change at all overall and does really remain very specific to this kind of design. Um, we did talk about partitioning, so I would like to show you what it actually looks like when we partition. So I wanted to show you this picture. This is the same design as before. On the left-hand side, uh, I've again highlighted the, the couple of different, so there's obviously a lot more functionality in there, but some of the important ones. On the right-hand side, I've done the most simple way of partitioning. You could easily do, so this, is, this runs in like, I don't know, 30 seconds or something. Um, it's without any optimization. It's without me doing anything. It's basically press up and it just runs. And that's already what you get out. You can see that um, many of the things we highlighted on the left-hand side are actually put into their own separate category on the, on the right-hand side as well. And I've done that for the other two as well. So this is for the 10% logic locking and for the 50% logic locking. And again, you can see that these things do tend to be put in their own categories and so on. Now I have again, got the three pictures together for you here. Um, and you can even see that uh, it even kept mostly my own coloring scheme. So apparently even the way it found them, uh, so the, the, the modularity of all of these is the same or stayed the same, which is the underlying statistical way we're using to, to create these, these modules or these colors. Um, so that's, that's it for the practical part on my side. Um, oh no, I do have one final picture. So. Uh, you might say, okay, how do I know this thing's a multiplier, right? Um, am I just going to believe you it's a multiplier? And how do, am I even going to identify this thing, right? So I have some weird graph, and now you're going to tell me that's a multiplier. Well, uh, if you remember, this is what it looks like. Uh, so this weird shell thing here. And if you look at other multipliers, for example, I've got a multiplier from an Aquarius core. I've got a MinSoc multiplier. I've got a uh, just a fixed point um, multiplication multiplier and from the open MSP, you can actually see they all have exactly the same structure. This is all from two synthesis tools, uh, but using the same cell library, but it looks very much the same if you do use a different cell library. So the underlying structure is very similar and you can do this for other functionalities as well and you'll find the same kind of patterns. Um, because I don't want to go too deep into the technical part, we'll come back to our sort of more high level commercial design versus reverse engineering design when it comes to reverse and uh, versus, versus open source design when it comes to reverse engineering. And I'd like to compare a little bit. So if we are reverse engineering commercial design, um, our golden model library, so our known library generally consists of something like small standard designs. We might have adders, multipliers, interfaces, memories, all that stuff, uh, stuff. And we might have bought some kind of commercial IP library. So that's the stuff that we're comparing against. So we have our known and we have these small standard designs, commercial IP library. Um, when we come to open source, we have our known design. We know it's open source. And we actually know that the complete entire design is known out there in the world somewhere where I can download it, right? Um, and that means, for example, for Risk Five, we know that we actually have many similar designs as well. So we don't only have the one that is maybe unknown, but also 50 others that are also out there. So even, as I've mentioned before, even if you decided to very heavily customize it, or maybe this is a Risk Five design that hasn't been published anywhere and it's not open source yet, there's a good chance I can probably reverse engineer it much more easily anyway, because so many designs exist out there. Um, which is obviously for you, if you want to kind of not allow for reverse engineering, a very bad thing. Um, we also have all sub modules of a design because when we do download it, it's generally an RTL level, which means that um, we have all the sub modules, for example, the multiplier in their own module. Uh, so I can even know all the partitioning, which is the next point um, in the commercial part, we have to do a lot more partitioning. We, um, we don't really know 
well, we have to get down to these small parts that we do know. So we can't just take the whole entire design. For the open source part, we do actually know the partitioning already. We know how stuff is divided into the modules. Um, because of this commercial, uh, on the commercial side, these small modules, we do require a lot more matching. So we have a lot of small models we have to match. We don't really know what they're going to be in our gigantic uh, gold model library made up of a lot of small designs. In the best case for open source design, we may actually be able to match the whole entire design. So you might get sort of a chip design and you maybe throw away some periphery and you basically are able to match. And that's my mic. You're basically able to match the whole entire thing in its entirety and that's it. And that's done in like an hour or less. So it's very, very easy. Um, that means for us, for a commercial reverse engineering design, you will have some coverage where you will have some non-complete coverage. So you won't be able to always match the whole entire design and uh, you actually get a smaller complete coverage. The less known parts are in that design. With open source, um, only the customized parts and added parts are unknown. So anything you've added um, kind of really pops out, which is not a fantastic thing because let's say you have downloaded an open source with five design and you have added your own fantastic uh, cryptographic module, maybe a post quantum design. Um, if I want to reverse engineer that, I see that I go, okay, 90% is risk five design. I know this thing, throw it away. What is the other 10% there? They look interesting. Um, let me have a look at that. And I have time and space to focus very much on your own design that you have added. So not only are you really jeopardizing um, sort of the whole entire design, but anything you've added there becomes really much, very much a focal point uh, because I don't have to spend time understanding all the rest. And that doesn't mean that in the commercial kind of view, we do have sort of more chance for errors in the open source design. We will have errors happening, but there'll be a lot less because we have a lot bigger designs. We know a lot more and generally we just have a lot more power. Okay, that sounds kind of scary. And I hope that means, or that doesn't mean that you're all gonna need to stop using open source designs because as I said in the beginning, open source design is fantastic and I hope that it continues to grow. What can you do about all of this? Well, you could say, I trust my foundry. That is something you could do. And then you could basically define uh, your chip to be secure because after that, nothing's gonna happen to it. The chance of um, after tested packaging there to be an, an insertion of hardware trojans is very, very small. Um, generally it will happen before then. If you say, I don't trust my foundry, you could do some kind of testing. So for example, your chip comes back and you might do some, you might've done some simulation on your design. And now you can actually do some testing on your real chip and see, look, is this maybe the e EM, um, stuff the same, does it look the same? Or maybe you can do some hardware children detection methods like runtime analysis or whatever else. There's a load of different methods out there. They work more or less well, and you could do that. That's that's something that is possible. Um, you could do some logic locking beforehand, uh, which may be broken using fuzzy methods. So, you know, try to decide which kind of method you actually want to use and, and figure out whether it's actually secure or not. Um, you could do some customization of design. So obviously the more you customize the open source design, the less likely it becomes to be something that is already known and thus the more difficult it comes to reverse engineer. And finally, um, and this is actually the topic that I really like and I'm working on very much at the moment is the idea of encumbering um, the partitioning. So to make the partitioning a lot more difficult, which leads to the fact that it becomes more difficult for me to match parts of design to first identify this is the ALU, this is the multiplier, and then that part is very easily matched. But if you make the partitioning very difficult and put huge amounts of error in there, um, it will make the whole entire reverse engineering process much more difficult. So my key takeaways for you are today, um, open source design will simplify the reverse engineering, will make it a lot easier for anyone to reverse engineer design, especially the foundry that you're manufacturing in. And that is with all the positive and negative sides that might have. So obviously, if you want to reverse engineer your own design or you want to reverse engineer someone else's open source design, it's fantastic. If you don't want it to happen, not so much. We have solutions. Um, they sometimes or often don't have too much overhead. So they are usable, they are um, trustworthy, they have been academically looked into, um, which you can use. And there's a, a several different ones that you can even combine, you know, and, um, and don't have to go sort of more than one horse. However, um, for, open source design to flourish in a in a good way and for the community to grow, we must look very, very much into more anti-reverse engineering countermeasures. Um, because otherwise this will be a topic that at least from a security point of view, maybe cut short and that would be a real shame. So I would find that very, very sad. And thus I'm very much hopeful that we'll get this kind of problem under control in the future. So that's it from my side. Um, again, here's the picture 
bigger. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If you don't, feel free to have a look at the pictures. I should probably publish this at some point, but in any case, it's pretty to look into. So thank you very much. And I look forward to some questions. And I'm right on time. Sorry, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. We actually have uh, some time left. Um, yeah, thanks, Johanna, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, so we have already quite a lot of questions in the Q&A section. Uh, so I'll maybe just uh, start reading. So the first one is uh, by Tony Pustinen. So a more general question is, um, is it possible to uh, non-destructively image uh, modern off off the shelf CPUs to get exact and complete uh, 3D replicas of them. For example, by using X-ray photography, how much would such imaging cost and are there any expertise on it in EU? Okay, so there is work on X-raying stuff. Um, I know there was a big discussion about X-raying stuff smaller than 10 nanometers because I think the idea was that if you started X-raying stuff smaller than 10 nanometers, uh, you actually started frying the chip. As far as I'm aware, it's very difficult to do it non-destructively and as far as I'm aware, it's not used for large areas. So if you want to um, go for sort of your general security chip and not just some tiny little bit, this is not something you will ever be able to pay for uh, non-destructively. Mm -hmm. Even destructively, it's very expensive. And um, I maybe in the future, but not in small nanometer sizes and not, not easily, not cheaply opposite side there is and yeah and the second part was um eu as far as i'm aware they were doing work in that in the tu berlin or at least in the berlin area i would have to look in my notes on who was working on that i do know that there's competence in that direction though they were doing work on how to um x-ray stuff well which is very non-technical work okay. but uh, that was uh, christian boyd from tu berlin by the way i happen to know him yeah that sorry yes that's completely right yes, yes. i don't know if he's still there or if he's still doing work he's in still that uh, a bit active in the background being retired yeah yeah, yeah okay, exactly but i know that they, they did a lot in that direction okay perfect thank thanks. you thanks so much um, the next question is by Niels uh, Albert, Albertus. Is the clustering partitioning on slide 29 for the RISC-V done by including a loca uh, location information or simply on the directed graph? 29, okay, so this is very interesting and it's a good question. Um, this here does actually not include any location information. That's what I meant is for these slides, I did the most simple stuff you could imagine. The methods we're using now are obviously a lot more complicated. So what we can do is we can put uh, layout information in there as well, because we do know that with synthesis and what happens is that gates that belong to a module are placed closer to each other. So if we input layout information, we're actually able to re re refine this view very strongly. Um, I didn't do this because I find it's good enough like this to show. I mean, it's difficult enough to see 100,000 gates um, in a presentation like this. Uh, already, and then you don't see the slight changes or the, I mean, bigger changes that you get for more uh, refined methods, but for this, it's good enough. I, I hope that's fine for everyone here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the next question is, uh, and what partitioning algorithm did you use? But I think that you kind of... What partitioning algorithm? So um, we can use very, very, so this is like these kind of slides. This is, again, as I've said, something very, very simple. This is uh, a force-based partitioning style. So basically it's a layouting algorithm where we lay out our, um, our, our gates according to uh, physics kind of thing. We say we connect, you can imagine that each gate that's connected is connected with a small spring and basically it's force based. Um, the partitioning here, so the coloring in is done based on modularity. So we take modularity as a statistic and then do it that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is, uh, did you also try this for SOCs? Can you actually see a clear modularization between different modules, for example, CPUs, AES, and other peripherals? Yes, we have done this for some. We're still researching further. Um, it's very much a topic of getting the right designs and getting designs we can test. But yes, we have done that, and it does look very similar. OK, perfect. Um, the next question is, uh, how many gates uh, or other small components do modern CPUs, GPUs, and RAM modules have? Your risk <laughs> for example, had, for example, roughly 100k gates. Okay, so that's a very interesting question. So what I used here, again, because it's just to show, um, is a open source cell library, which tends to result in uh, designs which are with a lot of gates. Um, we have done this design in something like 20,000 gates. That does also work with the appropriate cell library where you have like these combined gates and whatever else. Generally, when we're looking into designs now, we're looking at many millions of gates. I, depends on what design you're looking into, depends on what nanometer size it is, or that not so much, but what cell library you're looking into, depends if you're looking at the whole entire chip or not, but you are looking at millions of gates generally. 
Okay, um, thanks very much. How much did it cost to reverse engineer those example risk five CPUs? Okay, so this here is obviously an open source design. So in this case, right here, I was playing Foundry and I was working only from a netlist point of view. So I didn't have to go through this, uh, where do I have it? Through this whole uh, part in the beginning here, right? I didn't do this. And this is actually the expensive part. So um, chip uh, images cost a lot of money. The people who work them cost a lot of money and you're very, very quickly, very expensive. This part here is actually the part that anyone can do. It costs um, maybe, Okay, so not putting into it my expertise, putting it into pure working time, maybe three hours of my time. So it's not expensive to do if you know what you're doing. The part here is expensive. And if you're going from a netless point of view, uh, I get it done quickly. The foundry will get it done quickly. Anyone who has access to netless will get it done quickly with very little cost. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, it is, is it possible to reverse engineer modern consumer CPUs so uh, completely that you can actually build a physical replica of the CPU and the software it uses, and it uses it uh, just like a regular CPU with identical performance? It's a bit it's a very good question. So I think there is a lot of topics that go into that. From the one side, you'd have the whole entire software. Don't ask me. I'm not a software person. I don't know how that would work. On the other side, it's possible, but it's going to cost you a lot, and I can't tell you how long it works. So there was a project at one point where they said we want to be able to reverse engineer a chip with five samples in 25 days. Um, that was basically what they were going from. As far as I'm aware, they had a lot of trouble doing that. So if you wanted to get a modern CPU, and you wanted to get it completely reverse engineered, uh, you're looking at probably a couple of years of work and probably more money than it's worth it to do. Like a lot more money than it's worth it to do. So I think this very much comes into play for security uh, parts. Okay, um, and the last question from the Q&A section mm -hmm. is, uh, can physical and clonable functions be utilized for protecting a circuit layout against reverse engineering from yes. the Lübeck University? Yes, they can be. I okay. won't say too much more. We have active research in that direction, but yes. Okay. <laughs> At least we hope so. Let's see. Let's talk again in two years. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any questions left from uh, the panelists? Yeah, I have one, Dominic. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, first of all, thanks for the nice presentation. Of course, we are aware of your work in uh, Aachen. Mm -hmm. um, I was just missing a bit your attack model. So the big picture. So you talk about reverse engineering. You can obviously do this to a certain extent, and then you say, "Once I did that, I can insert a hardware trojan." But what what type of uh, attack does this hardware trojan do? Is it a kill switch or stealing secret keys or whatever? Did did you think about this? Yes. So we currently have a project where we have created the chip with hardware trojans on there uh, for a Risk Five design. I don't want to say too much because the paper is not yet published, um, but there will be work forthcoming on that this year. Um, the chip should arrive in February, um, and then we'll be doing extended testing and also reverse engineering of that complete entire chip. Why, why was it necessary to actually build the chip just to try out the Trojans? Because, because we're doing a simulation? blue team, red team kind of approach, and there are simulations we don't like too much. We, so what we really focus on is real reverse, reverse engineering. So when you're doing this whole entire part here, there is a lot of stupid, silly things that happen in this area and they affect the quality of the netlist you're getting here. So um, there can be errors in this whole entire thing. So if you can imagine that you have a couple of, not 100,000, but 10,000 images and you have to stitch them, you get errors in there. And um, if you don't, or if you can't deal with them on this kind of area down here, you have to deal with them up here and it affects the um, methods and algorithms that you can use at a later stage and that you should use. So this is actually what we found. This is why, this is why I talk about this exact and fuzzy kind of view, because with the exact stuff, um, you can't do real life reverse engineering. It won't work. It's f wonderful for simulations. It's wonderful for anything where you have an error free net list, not ever something you're going to have in real life. And so you have to change your algorithms to do that. And as it happens, it works against logic blocking as well. Does that explain? It's okay. So looking forward yeah. to your future results. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So I think uh, we can start with the next uh, keynote speaker, which is today Professor Svaro Bunia from the University of Florida uh, in USA. 
Um, so let me introduce our speaker now. So Professor Svaro Bunia is uh, currently a preeminence professor of cybersecurity and Somoto endowed professor of IoT at University of Florida. Earlier, he was appointed as TNA Schröder Associate Professor of Electric Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Case Western Reserve University. He has over 20 years of research and development experience with 300 plus publications in uh, peer reviewed journals and premier conferences and six authored edited uh, books. His research interests include hardware security and trust, adaptive nanocomputing, uh, nano and novel test methodologies. Professor Bunia received uh, the IBM Faculty Award in 2013, the National Science Foundation Career Development Award in 2011, uh, the Semiconductor Research Corpor uh, Corporation Inventor Recognition Award in 2009, and the SR SRC uh, Technical Excellence Award uh, in 2005, as well as several best paper awards and nominations. Uh, he is co-founding editor-in-chief of a spring journal on hardware and system security. Uh, and uh, finally, Professor Bunia received his uh, PhD from Purdue University on energy efficient and robust uh, electronics. He is as well uh, a senior member of IEEE. So uh, Swarup, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, to have the opportunity to give you a keynote and thanks for inviting me. I hope all of you are staying safe and well. That's extremely important. And of course, uh, the focus of the talk, even though it's, it's security, we delve into pretty much all aspects of Internet of Things. And one of the things which we're doing in our research lab here is to develop some solutions to mitigate, protect, and prevent the infection of this novel coronavirus. Maybe that will be another time, another topic. But today, I'll focus on the hardware security aspect, particularly the evolving face of hardware security in the Internet of Things regime. I'll talk about some interesting problems there, and then um, I'll talk about some of the solutions which my group is pursuing in this area to make the hardware as a trust anchor for the security solutions for the entire system that builds on the hardware. So we'll talk about that. Before that, let me quickly introduce the institute where I belong to. I have the privilege to um, be our director for this institute for last one and a half year, and I have a strong leadership team. Together, we are um, working on developing innovative IoT technologies as well as applications driven by that technology. In terms of applications, we are looking at applications which um, are pretty global in nature. For example, food security, water quality, air quality. Um, I talked about um, battling with the novel coronavirus or spread of any virus or any pandemic, how IoT can help with that. And there are some news articles or TV coverages if you want to look for, you can find that depicts our work in this area. The Institute started uh, with uh, 5 million donation from Discover, former Discover CEO and Chairman David Names in memory of uh, his father, Warren B. Names. And a Japanese billionaire and series uh, entrepreneur, Sachio Samoto. And David and Sachio both are alumnus from our institute or our university. And then Sachio donated uh, money towards creating an endowed chair position, which I have the privilege to hold at this point. Together, they established this new institute called Warren B. Names Institute for the Connected World. And the mission for the Institute is, as I mentioned, to develop innovative IoT technologies and use that to drive exciting enabling applications. And of course, uh, as part of the Institute, we are always looking at uh, having new partners, new collaborators, particularly international collaborators and sponsors. So if you're interested, please feel free to contact me. So this is the, this is the list of people who are right now, core members in the Institute. Um, that's the faces of the Institute and I call them the IoT Army. And together they represent a varied expertise. As you know, IoT is pretty broad and IoT is applied. So they bring diverse set of expertise from the area of machine learning, communication, sensing, computing, and different aspects of security, safety, and resilience together to drive applications in agriculture environmental monitoring and healthcare and many more, including transportation. So together that, that forms the core group of the Institute. There are about 50 
faculty members right now and over 100 students that belong to the institute. As I said, again, um, we are very open to have international collaboration in this, in this field. IoT is going to uh, lead the fourth industrial revolution, probably be a significant component of the fifth industrial revolution. So this is extremely important time to develop IoT technology and use it in diverse areas. If you're interested, please let me know. We'll be, we'll be very happy to join hands on that. Now, we, as part of the Institute, not only we do research, um, but we also develop innovative curriculum, particularly hands-on, minds-on training curriculum on different aspects of IoT, including security. And I will specifically focus on the security aspect because that's the topic of this talk. In terms of security, for the first time, we have come up with the hardware hacking module. It's called HAHA module, and that's created through funding from National Science Foundation at the United States. There are two fundings which we received to develop a comprehensive curriculum for security education to students at, at different levels, both undergraduate and graduate at this point, where you're looking at high schools also. And we are also creating scholarship. Um, there's a new National Science Foundation grant of $5 million, about $5 million total which will, um, which will create 50 well-trained cybersecurity students to fill the, the gap in the marketplace. But the most important thing uh, that came up through, through these projects is this HAHA module, hardware hacking module. And a local company decided to market that. There's so much demand of that. Uh, this is being used by students to have about 15 well design experiments, which through which they can learn pretty much all aspects of hardware security and to some extent, several aspects of systems and cybersecurity. So again, if you're interested to know more about that hardware hacking module, I'll be happy to spend more time later. Recently, we got another funding and that's a very unique one. And that's why I will just spend maybe a, a few seconds to talk about that. Pavlo Antonenko, who's the director of Educational Neuroscience Life here. Pavlo and myself teamed up to develop a cybersecurity education curriculum for upper elementary students. So think about these students who are really, really, um, I would say very young at, at level, level four or level three. For these students who are at the beginning of their morphological development, we came up with an interesting gaming-based paradigm to teach cybersecurity, particularly some of the basics of encryption or cryptography, as well as some of the basics of secure communications and secure data storage. So that's going very well and it's very popular among the students. And we also come up with uh, an automotive security course uh, where we actually use a, a real car. Uh, this car doesn't move. It's actually a hardware in the loop simulator. It's RDS 1000, about $300,000 simulator, which can emulate different conditions for autonomous driving. And this car is in the lab and the students can actually use that car to, to learn different aspects of security and safety as well as resilience by using that car. And that's another example of hands-on, minds-on training which we are developing in the Institute. Now, before we talk about how hardware can serve as a backbone of IoT security, let's, let's try to define IoT or Internet of Things. Now, of course, if you hear IoT, that term is overly hyped, uh, overly preached probably, but um, different people have different views in terms of Internet of Things. Now, my personal view of Internet, Internet of Things is that it's kind of a recipe, and the recipe starts with the traditional embedded systems, which has tight hardware software integration, which is optimized and designed for specific tasks. So you take that, and that is, of course, um, an orthogonal paradigm to general purpose computing systems, as you know. So you take the embedded systems like the digital camera, MP3 player, or personal assistance, and then add generous amount of connectivity to it. And this connectivity can be across devices or to the internet. Uh, it can be at different layers, but you add generous amount of connectivity to these embedded systems, typically a set of heterogeneous embedded systems, and you connect them through different connection protocols and infrastructure. And then you basically add a significant amount of smartness to it. And the smartness is, is added to add automation, to make them decide on things based on historic data, 
or based on online learning. So different levels of smartness is added. And then finally, because it's a collection of devices, not just one devices connected to each other and to the internet, you have to add significant amount of interoperability. This interoperability can be added at different layers from the sensor layer to the actual computing layer and then communication layer. But you have to add the interoperability so that the one device can talk to the other as well as human users can talk to the device. And that's a very important part of IoT. If you add them together, that gives you the IoT. So that's the definition of IoT. The reason I wanted to give this definition is that um, it will help you to understand the, the subsequent slides where the security solutions can fit in. Now, if you think about IoT, a lot of people argue that, hey, IoT is nothing new. Uh, it's kind of an old wine in new bottle and it's kind of traditional embedded systems. IoT security is exact same thing as embedded security. It turns out it's not. There are a lot of interesting opportunities of innovation at different layers of the IoT architecture. As you probably are familiar, IoT architecture is defined by these four layers where it starts from things which are the smart devices, computing and sensing devices, which are connected to the network. That's connected to the cloud, which is nothing but a set of servers which can provide shared storage and computing facilities. And then you have applications running either in the cloud or in the things, which are, which are, which are also called edge devices. So at each layer, of course, there are significant room for innovation. And that's why if someone says API IoT, is nothing new. Um, of course, we have to we have to resist a bit because we found a significant room for innovation at each layer. And not only that, we also found significant room for innovation for the holistic system. So if IoT is not just a device, it's not just network, not just cloud, it's a basically combination of all of them, this combination of all four layers. So anything you are doing for IoT, ideally that should consider the entire ecosystem, not just edge or, or cloud. We'll talk about that, but let's talk about security and the big picture of security. Any security or concept starts with few things. And that these things are very fundamental in security. First, you have to define the assets and these are the things which you want to protect, right? Uh, if you do not have any assets, you do not care about security. And then you also need to understand the attacks, what kind of attacks that can happen on those assets. For IoT also, you have to understand those things. Once you understand these two, then you have to understand the protection mechanism, which means that you have to protect these assets against a set of attacks, well defined, well understood attacks. And these protection mechanisms can can be applied at different layers of abstraction. So that's that's IoT and that, that's security. And for any security solutions, including IoT security solution, you have to be cognizant of these three things. Now let's come to this fundamental question, which a lot of people ask me at different, have asked me at different times. What are unique to IoT security? Because embedded security is there for a long, long time, probably 30 years or 40 years. And people have done significant amount of work in the field of embedded security. That those are the security solutions corresponding to embedded systems. If you think about IoT security, there are a lot of fundamental concepts. This particular slide is borrowed from my colleague, Dr. Sandeep Ray at University of Florida. So this interesting problems with IoT security calls for interesting solutions. So let me first talk about these problems. Number one problem with IoT is that these devices, the edge devices, they connect with the physical world. So if you take an example of, let's say, a smart toaster, that smart toaster, which potentially can um, learn what kind of, what kind of uh, toasting you want to do at what time, things like that. So that smart toaster does interact with the physical world. That interacts with you, that interacts with the environment around it, and maybe a, a security issue can lead to a safety issue where it can potentially damage your house. Similarly, if you think about an autonomous vehicle, the, um, including drone or, or car you drive, um, or it drives itself, the autonomous vehicle um, does interact with the physical world in many different ways. And a security issue in that can lead to immediately a safety issue in many cases. It can even lead to death. So uh, 
connections with physical worlds actually brings in new dimensions in IoT security and that you have to be mindful about. And that also brings in the, the complex interactions between security, safety, and resilience. And you have to consider all of them together. Many IoT devices, let's think about this, this autonomous vehicle or let's think about a smart refrigerator. And if you think about industrial IoT or military IoT, they have often long and complex life cycles. Some of these devices would be in the field for let's say 30 years or even longer. So if they have such a long complex life cycle, not only the attack surfaces evolve, new vulnerabilities can be found, but also the security requirements can change over time. Um, regulations can change over time. So that basically means that devices which have long complex life cycle they all they need the provision to upgrade to evolving security needs. Now, how do you upgrade? So today, the most important way to upgrade a device with respect to security solution is to do a patch. And these patches are, are often a software patch. You do not have the, the mechanism to patch the hardware. It turns out that modern systems are implementing many of these security countermeasures or security building blocks in the hardware in particular in the system on chip that drives the IoT or Internet of Things. So that basically means not only the software should be patchable, but also the hardware should be patchable too. And we'll talk about that. We'll give you an example which we have worked on on patchable hardware probably for the first time. And then the third one is that uh, these devices are mass produced in the same configuration. So think about a surveillance camera, which is used in my house. And probably there are millions of them. Someone can go to Amazon or any e-commerce website and buy them. And then they can understand the hardware software configuration. And a potential attacker can find a vulnerability in that and use that knowledge to hack into another device. So that's, that's the problem. Um, that's a general problem, but it's uh, much more prominent, much, much more accentuated in IoT because of the widespread use of these devices in many commercial sectors. Many of these devices like smart light bulb, they are never intended to be connected to the internet, which basically means that if you think about these security protocols we use for connecting to the, to the internet, they cannot be applied there. Many of these protocols for security update they cannot be, cannot be included, cannot be incorporated in those devices. Particularly if we take this example of smart light bulb, they most often, they do not have even an operating system. So without having an operating system, it's very difficult to upgrade them, even if you find a security flaw. So that's why they are not really amenable to, to field upgrade uh, with respect to security patches. But many of the communications are done from machine to machine. And uh, the moment you have machine to machine communications, because you're talking about a heterogeneous network of connected systems, right? So for machine to machine communications, the authentication is done by a machine. So machine decides whether the communication coming from another machine is trustworthy or not. But if you have that, then there are many different attacks, man in the middle attacks, deploy attacks, and many types of attacks that's possible without human being in the loop. Those attacks are much more viable in the IoT regime than if you have, let's say, human putting their password or authentication signature into the system before something is, is, is enabled. Physical attacks, and I'll give you an example of that. Physical attacks are the attacks where the actual hardware is either modified or reverse engineered or uh, captured to do something which is not intended for that device. I'll give you a few examples of physical attacks. This, these are the attacks which are becoming more and more prominent as IoT devices like smart drones or environmental monitors are being increasingly deployed in adversarial territories. So if they can capture the device, they can physically tamper, physically hack into the device to either retrieve sensitive information or to manipulate the functionality and give you a few examples on how we can deal with those attacks. Finally, and that's extremely important, uh, I talked about IoT architecture consisting of the four layers. If you, look, if you think about IoT security, you need to have a holistic view of, of device to cloud and the communication between them. IoT, in terms of technology, as you know, is a convergence of communication, sensing, and, and computing technologies. So that these three technologies, they come together and uh, they make IoT. 
which basically means that if you think about the security of IoT, you have to consider security solutions across this convergence um, uh, convergence area of, of different diverse technologies. And that basically requires significant rethinking, which, which means that the traditional solutions for embedded security may not be readily applicable to the domain of IoT. Now, why we think about hardware? Now, hardware, as you probably know, is considered as trustworthy and they consider as the root of trust for the entire system on which the software stack as well as the communication relies on. And not only that, if the hardware has a compromise, if the hardware has a vulnerability like something like Spectre Meltdown um, or, 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 or some other hardware vulnerabilities um, that, can, that, can, that can be there uh, in, a, in a hardware, system, then I'll talk about that. And then it can compromise a large number of devices. And uh, in the morning you heard the keynote on Rohammer attacks from Onur, and that's another vulnerability that can have in the hardware. So if you have that, then it does affect billions of devices. As opposed to that, if you have a vulnerability like viruses and trojans, that typically affects hundreds of millions. The malware typically affects 10 to 100,000 devices and a phishing attack like just social engineering attacks done through sending emails or posting something in the Facebook or LinkedIn. These attacks typically affect a very few people. This is a slide borrowed from Semiconductor Research Corporation. And I think that basically shows the magnitude of the impact of a hardware compromise, uh, the relative impact for a hardware attack as opposed to the software attack. So not only the hardware needs to be secure because is considered as the trust anchor or root of trust for the entire software stack that builds on it. But also the hardware has to be secure because a potential compromise can lead to failures or security vulnerabilities of billions of devices immediately. And that, that happened when Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities were, were disclosed. Immediately billions of devices became vulnerable uh, um, to, to different attacks. Now, in terms of hardware, if you really want to find out what are the problems that can happen, security problems that can happen in hardware, you need to understand the life cycle of hardware. I think all of you are very familiar with that, but I'll still go through it quickly just to set things in perspective. When you talk about hardware, let's focus on uh, electronic hardware or hardware in this particular talk. For electronic hardware, which goes from intellectual property blocks to integrated circuits, to printed circuit boards, to actual physical device. And I gave you the example of different edge devices. So those are all hardware. And this, the, the design of hardware starts from the design specification that goes to the integrated circuit design house, like, like Intel, like Samsung, Qualcomm. There are many other companies. Most of them are fabless, which means they do not have their own foundry. There are very few like Intel who have their own foundry. And um, these designs go through a complex set of steps. Um, I'll not go through them, but it takes a long time, typically a year or sometimes longer to convert the design spec into something called GDS2 files, which captures the information of the layout, which is used for creating masks in the foundry. And the foundry gets that GDS2 file, and then through again, hundreds of complex steps, these are a billion dollar, several billion dollar facilities through hundreds of complex steps in during fabrication, they basically uh, fabricate the chip. And once the chip is fabricated, it's fabricated in terms of wafers, and these wafers basically um, have multiple chips, and these these these, these chips uh, are cut with diamond saws, and once they are cut, they are assembled and packaged. Um, but but after we produce the wafer, this is about twelve inch circular, highly clean die, um, highly clean plate of silicon on which you have hundreds of chips depending on the size. These wafers are tested for some basic functionality for basic defects. And once wafer testing is done, the, the, the wafers which pass those testings come to an assembly process where we, we cut the dies uh, and then and put them either ceramic package or, or some other packages. And these packages are, are then passed through a comprehensive functional slash parametric testing after the chips 
pass those testings, those which do not pass, they are discarded. Then it goes to the OEM or original equipment manufacturer's house, which they make printer circuit boards, they integrate the system, the good farmer and the printer circuit board, and eventually that becomes part of the actual computing device. So this is the overall life cycle for electronic hardware. During this life cycle, what's happening today is that because this, this process, this entire process is distributed and there are a number of untrusted entities involved in this process, there might be different attacks that are possible on the different, uh, the different stages of this life cycle. I'll talk about those attacks, but it turns out the attacks is coming from increasing distribution uh, of, of, the, of the design fabrication and testing flow of electronic hardware. And that brings in untrusted facilities, untrusted employees, untrusted tools, untrusted intellectual property blocks, and that causes significant issue, issues with security. I'll talk about that. But let's first uh, think of, first talk about a very interesting solution which came up with um, a couple of years ago on hardware patch. So, if you think about hardware, as I mentioned, the hardware can be considered as, as three, um, uh, as, uh, considered at three layers of abstractions. At the bottom most layer, you have these integrated circuits. You can see they can be, they can be system on chip, they can be processor, they can be FPGAs, they can be analog mixed signal chips or, or, or anything else, memory chips, uh, or, or there are so many other different types of integrated circuits or microchips which are part of this hardware. So you're taking an example of smart thermostat here. If you if you tear it open, then you will see a printed circuit board. So thermostat itself, that physical device, is is the is the highest level of abstraction of the of the electronic hardware, and and the printed circuit board is the next layer of abstraction, and then the 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 microchips or integrated circuits are the are the bottommost layer of abstraction. <coughs> so let's look at the bottommost layer for a moment. As you know, a system on chip or on a PC or a microprocessor would typically serve as a central processing unit for any IoT edge device. And if you have that, then the system on chip, let's consider a system on chip because that's the, that's the evolving trend. So typically the CPU is being replaced by system on chip. So Intel today do not just make a processor, they make system on chip, which includes the processor, includes many different intellectual property blocks like the non-chip memory, crypto accelerator, communication block, and then many other blocks like signal processing blocks, like AI engine, uh, graphic display unit, all those things are, are integrated into a system on chip. And that makes sense because that not only becomes cost effective, this the entire paradigm of using reusable pre-verified IPs to make system on chip, taking advantage of the advances in process technology makes perfect business sense um, in terms of reducing costs, in terms of improving the time to market, as well as it's also helping to um, miniaturize the whole system. The reason we have a smartwatch which is capable of doing so much thing is that we have a very complex SOC doing most of the tasks within one chip. So if you look at the system on chip today, and I've been working in this field for the last six, seven years in collaboration with Intel, Texas Instrument, IBM, and several other companies, what, what we figured today is that this system on chips, they need to incorporate many different security solutions during the design process. And these security solutions, they, um, they serve different purposes. Number one, number one purpose with respect to incorporating this security solution is to, to, to add access control. Now it turns out that the system on chips today, they do have a number of security assets and these assets span from cryptographic key to reconfiguration, reconfiguration bit stream, firmware, defeature bits, uh, and, and many different things. ROM, um, the boot, the boot code in the ROM. So all those things are, are design secrets which the designer needs to protect uh, against a potential attacker. I talked about the assets. These are the assets on chip, right? Now, these assets uh, can be accessible by the OEM or original equipment manufacturer, or these assets can be accessible by any user. So you need to protect 
these assets against unauthorized access. How do you do that? So today they do it by incorporating security policies. These are access control policies which guide uh, um, authenticated access of each and every security assets. I can give you an example. Let's say the processor is accessing a se secure part of the memory and you need to make sure the communication unit in this particular example, which might be an USB unit, is not, not able to access the memory at that time because the, that, that, that secret data can be on the bus. So the access control policy now what, what it will do is that it will make sure that the communication unit does not have any access to either the memory or the bus when the processor is accessing sensitive data from the memory. So that's just one example of that. Now, there are typically hundreds to thousands of these security policies implemented on a modern system on chip. And these policies are implemented by a very ad hoc manner and they are, they are sprinkled across the IPs, across the entire SOC platform. What we did, we came up with a centralized plug and play security brain, we call it infrastructure IP for security or IIPS. And the advantage of having this security brain is that of course it's much easier to add the security solution, number one. Number one, it reduces the effort and cost, improves the security, it's easy to verify because all these security policies are implemented in one place. And what you also did, and that's the second requirement for SOC security at design time, you also need to make sure that you, you incorporate proper authentication mechanism, you incorporate protection against different attacks. For example, scan-based attack is a big problem for modern SOCs because you have a scan chain which might be accessed by, a, by an adversary. So you have to make sure that scan chain access is properly authenticated. You need to protect against side channel attacks. So all these things are incorporated into one place. That's the centralized security brain. And if you do that, then it's easy to design, easy to verify. But at the same time, it also allows you to protect against unanticipated attacks. And that's what we call hardware patch. If you find that maybe a, a deployed SOC has a specific vulnerability, let's say specific access control mechanism has not been implemented, an attacker can potentially exploit that. With that knowledge, you can go back and fix the SOC, you can change the hardware, and you can do that by basically having this infrastructure IP as a reconfigurable block. So we have, uh, again, number of details on that. We have published a good number of articles. If you're interested, we can talk more about it later. There's an IEEE Spectrum article uh, that came up uh, three years ago, and they did cover this, this particular requirement of patchable IoT or hardware patching in IoT to, to, to evolve the hardware with respect to evolving security needs. Now, just to let you know a little bit more about the security policies, I have, I have talked about, I've given you a couple of examples here. The security policies govern confidentiality, integrity, and availability of various assets on chip. And as I mentioned, there are so many different assets. They include crypto keys, programmable fuses, firmware, uh, defeature bits, and many different things. And these policies fall into four different categories. They can act control access of these assets. They can control information flow. They can control liveness of a request if you're requesting access to a specific assets. They control uh, how long it will, it will be live, when it will be served, when the request will be served. And they also control talk tau requirements. This is time of check, time of use requirements. Uh, a very powerful and, and popular approach to verify firmware integrity. And, and these policies is govern the time of check and time of use of firmware so that you, you are basically running the firmware which is checked for its authenticity and nothing else. So that's the type of policy also we consider. We have come up with a number of policies in collaboration with Intel and, and, and other companies and TI and many other companies. And these policies are implemented into our SOC architecture. We have also come up with a tool called SOCCOM, SOC compiler tool. And this tool can generate SOCs of many different types or many different internet fabrics. And we have uploaded several of them into our website, which we'll talk about. These are the two examples of different policies. You do not need to 
no details about it at this point. We can skip that. But the point here is that the patchable hardware is able to not only uh, implement uh, all the policies and security requirements in one place as a plug and play infrastructure IP, but also it gives you the ability to update those policies in field. So those are the security requirements which are incorporated into the system on chip at design phase. Now, what about the security issues I mentioned that can come into play because of untrusted entities in the supply chain, in the life cycle of this electronic hardware? And let's take a look what can happen due to the fact that this, this, this process is distributed globally with a lot of untrusted people and tools and IPs and facilities involved in that. The IP vendors provide the IPs and these IPs can come with hardware trojans or malicious insertions embedded into it, hidden backdoors embedded into it. So we need to make sure we can verify that. The system of chip design house now gets the IPs. Those IPs are, are typically integrated using a long distributed process. And many of the phases of the SOC design are distributed. Today, a company can, can do architecture definition in US and then maybe um, inter interconnect um, SOC integration or interconnect integration in India, another step in Malaysia, the DFT insertion in Malaysia. Just to give you a hypothetical example, the point is that is, is actually very distributed, spanning many different regions, many different uh, facilities. And uh, IP piracy, cloning, trojan insertion can happen during that process too. And then Foundry is today considered to be zero trust entity by the US government, which basically means this foundry, which is external offshore to US, they assume they can do anything. If they have the entire unencrypted design, they can implant Trojan, they can extract design intent, they can over, do over production, piracy, cloning, and all those things. And finally, during deployment, there can be search and leakage, reverse engineering, piracy, and cloning. So what can you do to deal with these uh, security threats, uh, the issues? You can have targeted point solutions, which can be the design solutions or verification solutions to deal with these problems. And over the last 15 years, my group has been working on each of these problems and come up with solutions for those. But of course, that's, they need to be combined and then we need to come up with a unified flow and a whole ecosystem of end-to-end -end protection with, with supports for technology and tools. So I'll talk about that. But uh, let's talk about a very interesting aspect of hardware security today. And that aspect comes from the issue of trust. Today, due to this distributed business model, we do not trust most of these entities. And because of that, there are two issues which comes immediately into picture. One is cloning or piracy, the other one is tampering, which is also called hardware Trojan attacks. And it introduces a big verification challenge, which you have not seen before. I'll talk about why it is so difficult, uh, so, so difficult to, to verify a design with respect to respect to trust issues. I'll talk about that, but let's take a quick look on what can happen in terms of cloning. We had an article in IEEE Spectrum, and again in 2017, uh, and that in that article, we talked about the rise of cloning electronics, and there are, there are millions of examples of cloning of microelectronic components and systems, and these are just three of them which, um, which um, I'm giving here. Just so if you look at it, it's, um, you'll see basically the scan on speed light um, flash that was, that was counterfeited. Then there is a Cisco router. And by the way, this is a, an interesting story for the Cisco router counterfeiting. It looks like the fake Cisco router was actually more popular and sold pretty well because they fixed some of the bugs in the original design. Not only they copied, but they also improved a little bit. And then this is a, a very scary um, one, which actually was um, th that went, went to the engine control unit for Honda cars. This is a PCB, S300 PCB that uh, was faked. And this particular PCB had significant reliability issues. So if it were incorporated into a car, of course, that can lead to, lead to significant failures for the car. 
This is a hundred billion every year market, huge market. It's going about 25% annually. So that's a huge problem. We need to do something to prevent that. And of course, one of the solutions people are looking at, and this is what I'm talking about here in this diagram. If you look at the entire life cycle from chip manufacturer sending the design to the foundry, foundry sending the, the chips to the PCB designer through the supply chain and the PCB designer sending it to the OEM. So if you look at this life cycle, then we have to make sure that our proper authentication is done to and to identify the trustworthiness or authenticity of the chips and PCBs. So, so uh, authentication of chips and PCBs are typically done today through unclonable signatures, and that requires security primitives like physical unclonable functions or PUFs. So there might be a separate topic where I can talk about some of our works in this area. But just to let you know that POPs is basically one of the de facto standard for authenticating chips and PCBs uh, with respect to, um, with respect to uh, cloning attacks or piracy attacks. So this particular solution can prevent cloning and piracy. Of course, industry is gradually adopting the solutions. There are issues there to be to be resolved. And we have, we have, we have been addressing some of those issues along with other prominent researchers in this area. Now let's talk about the tools which you can, um, which you can use through the life cycle of these, uh, of these integrated circuits and PCBs to provide assurance. And the assurance means the act of verifying the trustworthiness. So we have, we have uh, recently launched a website called, uh, website called catforassurance.org. And this particular website brings together academic partners to do a rapid dissemination of their research efforts, the rapid uh, outreach to the industry, academic research community, as well as government with respect to what's going on in the field of assurance, particularly in the field of CAD tools for assurance. And this particular website has been extremely popular since when it has been launched with more than 1,000 unique users in just two months. And then um, probably 30 to 40 different tools already launched by different different researchers and I really appreciate Dominic and Farhat for their support for this effort. Now we um, in, our, in our research lab have been working on developing different design and verification tool for assurance and some of these tools are also launched uh, and available in this website either for free or through licensing agreements. So I really encourage you to go to the website and check what is out there. It is a lot of information at this point and I also encourage you to provide more information, upload your tools if you like to share with the community. So what we have done over the years, we have developed about 18 tools targeted, as I mentioned, they are targeted to, to dealing with different threats and design issues, design tools and or verification tools. And together the goal is to come up with an end-to-end -end protection. As I mentioned, even though my research group is targeting point solution at, uh, uh, right now over the last 15 years, but the goal is to integrate these solutions into a holistic flow to provide entry and protection. That effort is underway and it's right now funded by different agencies, but that's the goal. Uh, but right now these tools are available to, to, to uh, either uh, download or for free or, 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 or go through licensing agreements. I'll be happy to talk about each of these tools in details and all of them all of them are available for a demo if you're interested, but uh, because we do not have much time, we want to limit it to, uh, to just be a brief overview. One thing I will point out here is that uh, AI or artificial intelligence has a significant role to play when it comes to assurance or as developing tools for assurance. There are four of these tools which, which uh, implies the concepts of AI. And I'll give you an example, a couple of examples as you move along. There are only a few minutes left, but I'll try to give you a few examples. So these are the uh, description of the tools. Again, I'll send the slides so you will be able to know what tool uh, is doing what. Many of these tools rely on a common platform, which we have developed from ground zero. It's called CAST platform. And this particular platform is, is, is helping us to make these tools interoperable. As I mentioned, if you really want to come up with an unified assurance tool flow, then each tool has to talk to the other tool and they should be easy to integrate. And to do that, we had a vision to come up with a, a common development platform called CAST, which we have developed that itself is also available for 
for licensing. But this platform actually allows us to develop different tools as an app, as very similar to the Jasper Gold Flow. Uh, what it does, it takes a design, it converts the design into hypergraph, and now you can actually, using a well-defined set of APIs, you can actually implement any security functions on that hypergraph. And we also have a set of test matches and scripts. So um, we have a few more minutes left, and I will focus on a very important problem that's called hardware Trojan problem, which was basically the first topic I, I have started working on in the field of hardware security in 2007. I was a young junior faculty, and I looked at a call from the Department of Defense to develop solutions to deal with hardware Trojans, which are malicious modifications in a design. They came up with a solution. I flew to Washington DC to present it to the program manager, and he liked it. And, he said, so let's do, do something on that. And that's when I started working on, on, the, um, on, on hardware security. And so it's about, about 13, 14 years now. It's not exactly 15. But anyway, the point is that that's the first thing I started working on. And then over these 14 years, we have developed a number of solutions to deal with hardware Trojan issue, particularly developing solutions to detect them after the chip is manufactured. Why it is a very important verification problem? It's important because these hardware Trojans are intentionally incorporated design modifications, which are supposed to be covert, supposed to be hard to detect by traditional testing or verification mechanisms. So, uh, so it's a very different verification challenge. These are unintentional, uh, uninten these are intentional malicious changes as opposed to bugs security bugs, which are unintentional, which are bounded by functional spec or parametric spec. Most of the time, these security bugs are, are easy to detect because the attacker has, the, the designer has knowledge about these bugs. They can create an assertion and then use formal verification to detect those, or they can do other things like penetration testing. But as opposed to that, because a uh, 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 malicious change is intentional and it's quite unbounded. It's add an extraneous functionality. It's much more difficult to detect. And I can give you many examples for, for uh, hardware Trojans, which can easily bypass the conventional verification and ATPG techniques. So how do you detect them? There are two different ways to detect them, non-destructive and destructive. Destructive means you delay it and image it and try to see if there is anything suspicious. But of course that destroys the chip and also highly expensive. So non-destructive, non-invasive approaches are very effective approaches in that uh, detecting Trojans during manufacturing tests is most important. And there are two solutions there. One is using functional testing or logic testing, looking at the effect of Trojan in the functional output, or you can also try to look at the effect of Trojan in the side channel parameter or physical parameter. And that's the one which we have put more time, but we'll also talk about uh, a very interesting approach, which we introduced uh, long ago in 2009. It's a statistical approach for detecting unknown Trojans in unknown places in a design. That's called Miro. The Miro basically relies on a very basic principle of statistics. The idea here is that you assume that they would try to make it hard to detect or covert. So if you want, if you go by that assumption, attacker has to trigger the Trojan by conditions which are rare. So if you know these conditions, but it's your design, then you can try to statistically trigger them one at a time. And if you do it large number of times, let's say 100 times, and that's a concept which is also used in, in increasing defect coverage called in detect testing. So if you do that many times, let's say 100 or 1,000 times, then with high probability, you can activate any unknown Trojan and, and capture the effect in functional output. So that's Miro. It's a very powerful approach. It can work at IP level. It can work at chip level. We have also done a significant amount of work on detecting Trojan effect in side channel parameters. And this is an example which uh, we, um, that's the one we presented in 2007 to the, to the, to the program manager. And what, what we presented is that if you, if you have a Trojan, that Trojan is going to have a signature or footprint either in delay or in power or in both, right? Most often both, right? So if you just look at one of them, it should be hard to detect that because that uh, small deviation uh, or small footprint can be easily masked by the intrinsic process variation. On the left, are, we are showing that the intrinsic variations in manufacturing process is so much that can mask 
the effect of minute effect of heterogen. So if you can look at multiple parameters in a multiple parameter space, it's easy to isolate the trojan effect from the process variation. So that was the that was the theme of that solution. It's called multi-parameter approach for trojan detection, but it does require golden chips. We also came up with a solution which does not require golden chips. Uh, because you, you need to have baseline or you need to pre-calibrate your threshold beyond which you can detect the footprint to be a Trojan footprint, not a footprint due to process variation. So we came up with a way to compare part of a chip with another part of the same chip with the assumption that the Trojan would not be everywhere. And that's called self-referencing. It's a new paradigm of detecting Trojans where a chip is compared with itself or side channel behavior of a chip is compared with itself. It did lead to uh, significant research in this area by other researchers, uh, but I believe self-referencing self can be a very powerful solution for detecting for the effects using side channel analysis. We also came up with metric because if you have progen detection solutions, but you cannot quantify the confidence, it has no meaning. The, on the customers, in this case, it can be industry or the Department of Defense, they want to know how much confidence I have with respect to a Trojan attack. So to do that, we came up with a comprehensive assurance metric called CAMP, and there's a paper in DAC called Metric Matters. If you're interested, you can look at that. And that talks about these different ways you can, you can provide a level of confidence with respect to respect to Trojan coverage. And it can, this can be based on actual vectors or based on mathematical analysis. We came up with the first ever metric in that paper, Miro paper, which was published in Chess uh, 2009. And in that paper, we talked about a statistical sampling-based approach uh, where we came up with a solution to quantify the level of confidence for a given Trojan detection approach. So the idea here is that if you take good enough samples because the effective Trojan space is practically infinite. There are there are trillions of possible Trojans and an, an attacker can inject. My students always complain that attacker has an undue advantage here. That is true. Uh, the attacker can easily put a hard to detect Trojan. So the Trojan space is, is very, very large. How do you come up with a uh, quantification of coverage there? Um, you come up with statistical sampling approach where you randomly sample a, a number of Trojans and then you see how many of those Trojans in your random sample can be detected by your technique. And that gives you a very good estimate. And that, of course, asymptotically uh, converges to a value once you increase your sampling size. So I'll just talk about a couple of more things and then I'll stop for questions. So to understand what Trojan attacks are possible, benchmarking is very, very important. So today, there are only very few benchmarks available in open literature. So if you're working on Trojan, you do not have benchmarks, right? So you came up with a way to, to generate synthetic high quality Trojan benchmarks of different triggers, different sizes, different payloads. And this, this particular tool is called MIMI. MIMI is a machine learning based malicious, malicious insertion tool. What it does, it looks at these available Trojans, looks at the features for these available Trojans and you see this generative machine learning approach to create uh, a new Trojan set. So this is, again, a learning guided approach to generate Trojans. I'm not going to details about that, but if you can have such a synthetic Trojan generation tool, it helps you so much in understanding the Trojan attack vulnerability of your design. So now you can run this tool and it can, uh, it can give you the possible Trojans for your design. And it can specify that, hey, I want Trojan, which is let's say changing my memory right angle or changing the pass arbitration signal. So if you want to specify a payload, specify a trigger, the tool can actually accommodate that. It's a very flexible, scalable tool. And if you have that, you can have so many use cases for that. Another AI-based techniques which you have developed for detecting Trojans in, in third-party intellectual property blocks is called Viper, verification of IP trust. In this case, as you know, there is no golden module to compare with. So if you receive an IP, um, maybe a thought, maybe let's say crypto IP from a third party IP vendor, how do you know that IP doesn't have a Trojan? So to do that, it came up with a machine learning based classification approach where you looked at again, different Trojans and we learn the features for the Trojans. And then for a new design, we basically apply the classifier to detect um, suspicious nets, and it can give you very high coverage. These are the features we have considered, about 30 features we have considered, all structural, 
they think they encompass structural features, functional features, and proximity features. The final thing is, uh, is physical attacks. I mentioned that there are a lot of physical attacks in IoT, and these attacks deal with physical tampering and more physical modification of, of printed circuit boards. It's called mod chip attack. If you Google mod chip attack, you will have hundreds of thousands of hits. People actually do it for their gaming consoles or set of boxes. They add jumper from point A to point B, and there are YouTube videos to follow that to bypass the DRM protections or security, security solutions built into the system. So this is a very easy way, rather easy if you, do, if you know soldering, let's say, to bypass security solutions and manipulate the functionality. So how do you deal with this problem? You have to have runtime monitoring. You have to come up with uh, a runtime signature generation of the whole PCB using the JTAG infrastructure. And that signature can be securely transmitted to the base station or maybe any other part of the system to check periodically and detect any possible tampering. So that's runtime integrity validation. It's funded by Semiconductor Research Corporation, number of publications on that. So just to summarize, uh, untrusted on regulated supply chain is a big problem. We need to deal with that to end-to-end -end protection that can deal with the trust issues coming through the untrusted supply chain. Hardware has to be the trust anchor for IoT. So we need to make sure the hardware is is trustworthy and um, assurance is, become, um, is becoming essential to live with an untrusted supply chain. To uh, enable assurance, we need to have integrative solutions encompassing design, validation, and runtime monitoring. And that's most effective. So that's the way to go, in my understanding. So, with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I have to acknowledge my, my collaborators and sponsors here. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Swaro, for the very interesting presentation. So um, are there any questions uh, from the audience? So far, I don't see anything in the chat. So in the meantime, um, maybe we can uh, switch to the questions of, uh, of the panelists. I have a question about the first part, about the education part that uh, you presented. Uh, how can uh, somebody participate in uh, this effort or if we want to, for example, use it in places like in Israel or other countries, how can we collaborate on this? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very, very good, very, very important question. So there are two ways to participate. One is that um, you can help us develop more educational modules on this hardware hacking platform. So the design of the hardware hacking platform is public. Um, the educational modules will also be public. They are right now accessible to the instructors. So if you if you need to access those the, the experiments, just let me know and I will, as an instructor, will be able to give you access to those. So we'll have the, the educational modules, you will have the design for the hardboard Along with that, as I mentioned, a local company at Gainesville, Florida is also selling that board. So if, if someone wants to buy those boards, uh, they can do that through that third party company. University does not provide that board to outside entities, but the, the third party company can do that. Or you can fabricate your own board with the design, which is publicly available. Um, so once on, so one contribution is to help us develop more experiments. Uh, for example, right now I can tell you that we do not have uh, Rohammer attack as, a, as, as part of these 15 experiments we have, we have built. And one of my colleagues is trying to build a Rohammer attack module on that, on that platform. So similar help should be appreciated. And uh, the other, other help, other participation would be that we provide you all the information we have and you use it in your curriculum to train your students. Uh, maybe I'll take it uh, offline because uh, most likely the best way will be to generate some kind of community, maybe to do it also under IEEE or ACM or something like that, uh, that has international branches so it can be expanded uh, uh, more widely because this is very, very... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I told you, there's a huge amount of interest across um, the globe. And uh, I talked to my university that, hey, are you going to make this design board available to other universities? They said, 
no one university a non profit organization they cannot they cannot sell the board they cannot support the board uh, it comes as a kit because uh, the board and the few other components together make it a kit and during this pandemic it has been extremely helpful because all these experiments are our uh, students can do it at home so they do not have to come to a lab so they can do this 15 experiments on different aspects of security just being at their home following a very well defined set of instructions so it's it's extremely popular it has been very effective it has been tried at university of florida for last 5 years so yeah, i would be very happy to see it being used by other instructors and other universities Great, thank you. That's a very good point. Yeah, please, please uh, send me an email. We'll be happy to discuss about a way to make it available to other uh, other universities and instructors. I will. Thanks. Now about the the the, the other technical material you mentioned, the idea of the patchable uh, 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 sock, and yeah. I wonder if. Uh, This by itself will not open the door for another type of attacks. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good, very good question, very good point of view. So yes, it it may, it may, and anything you do like that um, that may create an opportunity for an attacker to attack, right? So the opportunity is even there today because um, because. Um, They, today, if there is any security bug, they try to fix it through firmware upgrade. So there, there is a hook to change the firmware, and they want to make sure that the firmware upgrade is only done through proper authentication. So any upgrade into that infrastructure IP for security has to be done through proper authentication. So in our implementation, we already have an authentication mechanism. And by the way, this authentication also Uh, it's pretty complex in the sense that different assets on the system on chip would have different level of accessibility some of them are only accessible to the uh, system designer soc designer some of them are accessible to both the soc designer and oem and only few of them are accessible to all uh, all layers uh, soc designers oem and users end users right so multi level access is another in, in interesting um, authentication solution we had to incorporate into our solution right now this is a part of a bigger darpa project darpa is our research wing in department of defense uh, and i'm i'm part of that but they are trying to come up with a solution like that which has proper authentication built into it okay thank you but well, that's a very good point Any other questions? Yeah, hi, this is Rana. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. sir. So, of course, we are very much aware of your work in Aachen. And um, another branch of research that we recently started is on neuromorphic computing for AI acceleration. And now we are bringing together <clears throat> these aspects of AI and uh, hardware security. Do you have any activities in that domain? Do you have any thoughts about how to make your morphic circuits are secure oh yeah absolutely and uh, that's a very good very good point and uh, um, for neuromorphic circuits um, one important problem we are looking at is that uh, once you train the neuromorphic circuit the trained neuromorphic module or or a neuromorphic circuit optimized for a specific application that's that's a great asset i mentioned security you have to identify your asset first so that's the asset right so um that's an ip uh, intellectual property and you need to protect that so what's one one particular work we are we are uh, doing here is to um figure out a good mechanism to protect neuromorphic circuits against piracy or reverse engineering or cloning so that's that's an interesting um problem uh, altogether yeah, and specific about neuromorphic circuits so against cmos do you have any plans for this oh yeah yeah i uh, neuromorphic circuits uh, just look at the neural network right so the 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 protection uh, is not not like uh, logic locking or finite state machine locking if the protection has to be done in terms of 
protecting the connectivity or the edges between these neurons as well as the weights of the neurons and the edges. So, so protection of the, the weights and the edges um, and obfuscating the connectivity that is different from the traditional CMOS counterpart. But there are, there are more, more challenges. This is, it looks like an active area of research and there are many other groups working on these topics. So that's, that's one interesting uh, research problem in, in your morphic circuit. Um, the other thing we are doing here in collaboration with my colleague, um, Dr. Trivedi at the University of Illinois, Chicago, is to use neuromorphic circuit to uh, protect against side channel attacks. So it turns out that neuromorphic circuits can be trained to detect uh, fault attack, to detect power attacks or EM attacks and protect against that. So not only neuromorphic circuits bring in new security challenges, but also they give opportunities to use them for developing interesting solutions. And you can, you can do research in both reactions. Thanks. Um, we have also one question from the audience in this Q and A section. I'll just read it out. Mm -hmm. So, um, if for if some circuit is simple enough, could the circuit have a unique physical fingerprint determined by how electric current travels through the circuit? In such a way, uh, could end users, for example, verify the hardware fingerprint by causing some specific sequence of electric current to go through the circuit? The answer is yes. Um, typically, if you look at physical and clinical functions, they they look at the delay-based fingerprint. Most of the pups are delay-based pups. There are several weak pups. We are strong pups, which means they have larger challenges in space. The weak pups, like the SRAM pups, which have lower total entropy or lower challenges in space, these weak pups, of course, not look at delay. They look at the metastability of two back-to-back -back connected inverters. But um, one can look at current signature and that um, can be used to um, used to generate fingerprints. And there's, this is a recent uh, area of research. And um, there is there are some work, including the work by my group on current-based fingerprinting. In our case, we are not looking at the, the combinational logic. We are looking at sequential logic to generate a current because in the sequential logic, you can definitely incorporate a challenge vector and that gives you different currents. So you can create multiple challenge response pairs. For a combination of block, you can do something similar, absolutely. You can apply a vector and look at the current and that can be the unique signature for that. One thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, when you generate signature for, let's say, authentication, because PUF is used for authentication. That's one of the primary uses of PUF. If you want to do that, then you have to make sure the signature is robust enough, which means that every time you measure, you get almost the same signature. There might be a few bits being flipped, but it should give you very robust signature. So how do you make sure that every time you read that current and convert it to a digital value, you get, the, you get almost the same value? Because current is extremely vulnerable to environmental noise, supply voltage fluctuations, and things like that, inductive noise. So, that's a challenge, but if you can deal with that challenge, then definitely that would be a very interesting way to generate unique signature. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I see another question into, um, oh, oh, I think Tony asked a follow-up question there. Any good reference material for current signatures? So uh, that's, that's a good question to ask. Unfortunately, it's a new topic, and uh, the only work I know of is my own work. Uh, I'll be happy to share my paper. Uh, it's still under review, but I'll be happy to share that when it's accepted. Okay, perfect. Um, I think one more question from Joanna. Yeah, so Joanna Bertum, I'm well aware of your work. I wasn't aware of the um, machine learning machine learning based hardware children generation. I was wondering whether that's published and what your seed is for that. Oh, that's a very good point. So that's not published yet. Uh, we are going to submit it soon. To, to We have actually a tool to demo if you're interested, we can demo it at some point. Uh, it's a very powerful tool in the sense that um, we had actually a paper in date a couple of years ago on Trojan generation using a static analysis. So basically look at a design, convert it into graph first, but look at a design, you look at the properties of the design and figure out where uh, potential attacker would, would insert a Trojan, right? That tool is called TRIT, uh, Trojan Insertion Tool. 
And that tool is, of course, we have a publication. We have uh, the description of that is available in the CAD for us website. For Mimi, we have not published too much yet. Mimi is a better tool than Treat in the sense that Mimi is easily capable to mimic an input Trojan set. And the seed is basically your Trojan set. You give a bunch of Trojans for it to mimic. And what it does, it basically looks at the properties of those Trojans and try to create a set of Trojans through a complex set of steps. And it basically gives you large number of similar Trojans for the given design. So if you give a design, we'll try to incorporate similar Trojans into that design. But to do that, we have to follow a set of steps and they're generally complex. The first step, as I mentioned, is to use generative machine learning models to, to generate a uh, large number of Trojans of similar properties. But then you have to follow a good number of other steps to create Trojans into your design and then you get uh, as many Trojans as you want. But that hopefully will be available soon. So we are going to submit the paper in a month or so. Okay, okay thank you. That sounds very interesting. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Svaru, for the interesting presentation and of course also for, the, for all the questions. Um, I think we should now continue with our next session to somewhat stay in line with the timing. Um, thank you, Swarup. So if you would be around, maybe later on, there will be still some questions in the open round. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks a lot for being with us today. Sure. sure, I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks, thanks to everyone for your attention. So um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Leonid Azriel from the Israel Institute of uh, Technology will tell us a little bit about automating hardware reverse engineering, a daydream or reality. Uh, so uh, Dr. Azriel, maybe you can just share your slides while I do the introductions. So uh, Leonid Azriel is a hardware security researcher at the computer science department in the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. His main specialization is IC reverse engineering, in particular reverse engineering with SCAN. In addition, he serves as an advisor in IC security for several companies. He received his bachelor, master and PhD also from uh, Technion. All the degrees are in electrical engineering. Dr. Azriel spent about 15 years in the industry before returning to academia. He served at uh, different technical and managerial positions at National Semiconductor, Winbond Electronics, and New Neuroton Technologies uh, companies, where he was involved in the development of trusted platform uh, module TPM. So, uh, Leonid Azriel, the stage is yours. Hi. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, I know this is the last talk before the beer and the dinner of tonight and uh, of the started with some deficits in time. So I try to keep it short, doesn't guarantee so. So I'm playing with the reverse engineering of IC for the last maybe five years. And why do we do this like a uh, half criminal thing? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, first, the uh, reverse engineering of hardware is a type of attack and we should study it to be able to protect against it. There are also constructive uses of the reverse engineering. It can be used to protect the IP, for example, by detecting IP threats. It can also be used to detect hardware trojans. Those malicious things can be injected along the way of the IC development. Uh, hardware trojans are actually supply chain attacks and we learned just recently about how devastating the supply chain attack can be. And the example of SolarWinds, you can see that for SolarWinds, it took about a year from deployment to major impact. And what is interesting about the hardware torsions is that few people actually know how they look like, maybe only the people that designed them, and I believe there are not many. Uh, there is some effort to search for torsions based on uh, like circuit properties, but there is no evidence that these are indeed the right properties. So the safest way seems to be actually doing reverse engineering and find the differences. If you take a look at the world of software reverse engineering, you'll find plenty of tools that make at least part of the process automatic, and we want the same for hardware. 
So the process of reverse engineering can be divided to two distinct phases. First, having the integrated circuit in hand, we apply some magic. And here we get the schematic of the chip, or that we also call a netlist. Now, this netlist can contain millions of logic gates with complex connection patterns. So just the schematic itself doesn't give us an answer about what's there inside the chip. And this netlist should be further processed using algorithm to, uh, algorithms to make sense of it. Uh, so how the first phase netlix extraction is usually done and uh, I, uh, thank you Anna for presenting already some part of it uh, so there will be some overlap I will go through it uh, fast well first it depends on what kind of IC it is for ASICs the traditional way is physical and invasive first stage is a, a decapsulation where chemicals are used to open the package and then get access to the silicon. Then special equipment is used to peel off the individual layers, lay by layer, scan them with electronic microscope, stitch the images, process them, connect the layers, and so on. Finally, this procedure um, produces the electrical schematics that um, is a gate level netlist uh, which we can post. FPJs are different. The post A6. The hardware itself doesn't store information about the application. All the functionality is implemented uh, in a file, which is called uh, a bitstream. So the first thing to do is to obtain this bitstream file. Now, many vendors encrypt this file, but there are publications that show that uh, some of them can be, uh, some of this uh, encryption can be broken. So, uh, so from this bitstream, we can also obtain the netlist. Also, the bitstream format is proprietary, but again, there are publications that show that uh, this format can be interpreted. In addition to, in addition to this, let's say traditional ways, there are also other ways. Maybe the most you know, criminal way is uh, obtaining the files from using what's called the social engineering. And there's also another way, it's called scan, and I'm going to expand on it in the next slide. So what is the scan? The scan was introduced a few decades ago, and the goal of the scan is to help to the production testing of digital semiconductor devices. Every single chip, when it comes out of the production floor, should be tested to make sure it came out clean of defects. That actually means uh, the production test shouldn't find a failure in any of the millions of devices or wires in the chip. Once uh, they're using functional tests for that, that was uh, proven to be very inefficient. And uh, then scan was introduced to make this process efficient. The idea of the scan technique is uh, to have a convenient access to all the memory elements in the sequential cells inside the chip. This makes it much easier to generate patterns automatically that will cover the entire logic. Uh, for this, as early as in the design stage, all the sequential elements are uh, stitched uh, into one or more shift registers called scan chain. This is called scan distortion. And uh, later, after the chip is produced, it, the scan chains can be connected to a production tester so that the production tester can inject values into the scan chain by, that, by this uh, setting the state of the device. Next thing is to run a chip in maybe one a clock cycle in a functional mode to get new values inside uh, the scan chain and read back the values from the scan chain this way, the tester can check that the values it uh, got the expected values and there are no defects in the chip. Uh, why is it so efficient? Because with scan, it is easy to get deep inside the logic. It's good for test coverage and also good for reverse engineering. Just think about the digital uh, IC as of a huge state machine. It has state register composed of all the internal registers, and it has combinational logic that implements the next state function. Finding out uh, what this function is actually uh, is reveals the entire network. Uh, by giving the possibility to 
uh, write and read the state register from the outside, the scan essentially exposes the combination of function uh, to the adversary. Now, the problem of reverse engineering of the IC is mapped to the problem of learning a Boolean function with n parameters, where n is the number of the internal registers. Indeed, going over all possible values of uh, the input vector, one can build a truth table of the combination of function and by this obtain the full matrix. But uh, doing an exhaustive search is obviously impractical since there are maybe millions of uh, registers inside the chip. And uh, this is, uh, of course, an exponential task. However, the matter is that uh, this f, which is a combination of function of the chip, cannot be any function with n inputs, but only a function that can peek onto a single chip. And uh, this defines actually very tiny subset of all the function. So we search within this subset uh, by taking advantage of some properties of the uh, functions that are implemented on the chip. Maybe the most important one is what is called a limited transit FNE. So consider um, one internal register of the circuit. The input to this register is produced by uh, this cloud of combination logic. Uh, which we also call the logic cone. The number of registers that aff uh, affect this logic cone determines the transit definition. And not surprisingly, the number of this uh, transit definition is much lower than the total number of uh, flip-flops inside the chip. So the source space is now reduced to the function that depends only up to some uh, k, which is uh, some limit on the transit definition in the whole uh, circuit. With this assumption, we can use Boolean learning algorithms to learn uh, the circuits with the complexity proportional to, to, the, to the power of k instead of two to the power of n. And this is, uh, of course, uh, much better. To show the simplicity of scan-based analysis, here you can see a lab setup. All we need here is an FPGA board that serves as a tester that injects patterns into the device under a test and samples the results. The chip itself is a mounted uh, in a socket. Let's see here. Here's the chip uh, on an evaluation board that plugs into the FPGA board. This FPGA board runs a server that gets uh, vectors over the network from client running on a Linux station. The client is in charge of running all the other algorithms that extract the networks. With this uh, setup, and the learning algorithm, we could see the approximate transit of uh, map of the registers inside the specific chip that we tested. So it doesn't reveal all the dependencies. It does show a good picture of the FNN distribution. We estimate that about 95% of the flip function on uh, this chip can be directly learned uh, uh, using the scan. Now, getting back to the two phases, uh, so we saw that there are a few different ways to obtain the netlist and may, with different degrees of accuracy. And with the netlist in hand, the next thing is to use algorithms to uh, run this, what we call it, specification discovery stage. <clears throat> Unlike the netlist extraction, that may be difficult, but the result is well defined. The question itself of the spec discovery is not something that can be formulated precisely. It may be a reconstruction of a state machine or translating a circuit to higher abstraction language, or maybe just looking for some specific sub-circuit. The answer depends on the learner objective. But uh, you won't find any formal definition of the outcome of the stage. That's why today the stage is mostly manual and very much tailored to the specific case. Making it uh, fully automatic is something that probably won't happen. So this may be already an answer for the question at the beginning, but uh, uh, not exactly because we do want to automate large parts of this process. The most intuitive way to automatic uh, to, to automate the process uh, of uh, specification discovery is do some matching against some library of 
known components. And there are two types of matching. The first uh, is structural analysis that merely takes the structure of the circuit, ignoring the logic function. And the second is functional analysis that focuses on the, <clears throat> on the functional identity. Uh, those can be behavioral simulations, formal methods, or static equivalence algorithms such as that. Uh, as of today, structural analysis is by far the most popular uh, method in the academia. So, uh, structural analysis considers the circuit as a graph, for example, by uh, considering the gates as nodes and nets as edges. And then we can uh, apply known algorithms from graph theory to find familiar elements inside the graph using uh, like subgraph isomorphism or similarity search techniques. Since we are looking for a match of functionality rather than a specific implementation, we uh, want to want it to work for any implementation. Here you can see three results of a, a synthesis of a simple four-bit adder with slightly different optimization constraints. You can see that if uh, the first two results are somehow similar, uh, the third one is completely different. So it's hard to believe that the uh, graph algorithms will classify all three under the same category. So what can we do with this? Uh, there are um, different approaches to deal with structural variability. Uh, one is the mapping uh, the combination of function to some unified form or maybe canonical representation. And we'll see a few examples. Uh, still with this representation, we need uh, to take care of uh, permutations. And uh, the problem also with the canonical representation that it explodes very fast and <clears throat> will probably won't work for large combination of codes. Uh, a different approach is uh, uh, using some optimization invariant representation, such as graphs based on registers only or data flow graph, graphs. Uh, this is one example uh, from Dai's work in uh, 2017, uh, where they took a circuit and uh, mapped it to a library of LUTs, lookup tables, with four inputs. Now, every lookup table like this can implement up to 64,000 functions, uh, but uh, they mapped all these functions to 222 isomorphism classes because of the permutation. So they made actually this graph a permutation invariant, but only locally on the level of these LUTs. After that, these uh, LUTs were uh, used to build neighbor uh, matrices uh, which were fed to CNN, and this CNN uh, convolutional neural network was used to uh, solve the classification problem, which in this case was fi find whether a multiplier is present in this circuit. So for a single class, uh, it worked very well, but as uh, the number of classes increased, the accuracy uh, reduced sharply. As an additional work uh, where uh, the uh, the combination function was mapped to and or inverter structure. This uh, was used with spectral graph methods that uh, uh, supply the permutation invariance. And I will talk about spectral graph methods a bit more. Specifically here, it was used to detect uh, uh, whether an AES S-box is present in the design. So it's, it again, it took classes uh, classification. And S-box can be implemented in two different ways. Uh, one is finite field and another just a lookup table. And the results show that when the implementation is the same, uh, the match is, uh, uh, gives quite high uh, grade. And for different implementations, uh, the results are, were not that different. Another way to address structural variability is considering only optimization invariant data. 
for example, flip flops. Note that uh, this also works for scan based netlists. So here are all the flip flops that uh, no matter what optimization is, stay the same. So we can use the information of dependencies between the flip flops and build a graph out of it. For example, take a simple adder again, it can be built of full adders or other implementations as we saw before. And so we, and we can have a full netless representation of, of the classical uh, reverse engineering or only combinational clone resolution out of the scan base. In both cases, we can extract this dependency graph or between the flip-flops. And uh, this dependency graph has a very distinct picture for another, for example, and it will be quite easy to find uh, this graph and the total graph of uh, silicates. But in reality, it is not that common to find uh, an isolated other function. It will be usually mixed with, uh, some, mixed with some other functionality, and then it becomes complicated. Here, for example, a simple circuit that contains uh, two components, add and shift, and the selection at the end to choose one of them. On the right hand, there is a dependency graph where the red nodes are, uh, and the red edges are the additions on top of the original adder graph. To find an adder in this comp composed graph, we need to find a subgraph in this graph equivalent to the adder graph. Note that this subgraph is a subgraph not only of nodes, but also of edges. Now, this problem resembles the shape detection problem in merging. In, in imaging, which uh, can be solved using spectral graph. <laughs> so how this uh, works? Uh, first of all, uh, the goal is to generate a graph similarity metric, which will be invariant under graph isomorphism and will be robust to small perturbations. And we'll encode some proper similarity between uh, different subsets. Uh, there are a few methods, uh, uh, the uh, kernel that can be built to do that. Uh, the, here on the left side, you can see the spectral descriptors. The uh, spectral descriptor is some function on the adjacency matrix of the graph, uh, and uh, which uses its eigenvalue decomposition. And here specifically, there is an operator which is called the heat propagation. It builds a heat propagation map over time. Now uses uh, traces of the matrices that it gets from the heat propagation and eventually compares it vector of traces. Now the traces, since it's a sum, it's a permutation independent. An alternative way here on the right side is a graph kernel that checks for isomorphism between two subgraphs. And uh, it, it doesn't prove isomorphisms, but it can show if, there, uh, if the graph are not isomorphic. Using these uh, kernels, we can build a, what's called a graph neural network. You can see here, A describes one of the kernels that we saw before. X is a, a matrix of uh, features, features per node. And double is some transformation on the nodes that uh, doesn't mix features. This network can be trained to detect specific subcircuits. Our goal eventually is to find subcircuits and not only isomorphisms. So this can be done by applying some matrix on the uh, some uh, uh, some mask on the on the adjacency matrix. To evaluate these kernels, we used some uh, toy benchmarks. Uh, designed a set of simple circuits like adder, ALU, or register file of different sizes, and we took also combinations of these circuits. On top of that, we added modifications of the original benchmarks. We added permutations, which are not supposed to change anything, and some perturbations, such as slight modifications. And uh, again, the comparison was run at the flip of dependency. What you see here is a matrix of about 600 over 600 uh, different circuit benchmarks. You can see the green squares along the diagonal uh, in uh, both of the maps. 
each square is a matrix 20 by 20 showing matches between different permutations or perturbations of the sorted graph so you can see the green means the uh, biggest similarity so you can see that this matrix show quite a good um, match for uh, for benchmarks that are within some uh, limited set of uh, permutations and perturbations. Okay, so far we're looking at the level of a single combinational function. Alternatively, we can zoom out and uh, look at the entire graph. I think Johanna's representation today showed how this can be done with the graph clustering methods. The DANA framework is doing something different. It's extracting the flow of data in the circuit, and it does that by finding world level structures in the circuit. Uh, it uses some uh, sort of dynamic programming, uh, again, at the level of uh, flip flop dependency graph, by grouping flops with common successors and predecessors. It does a number of iterations, focusing on the number of uh, successors and predecessor flops uh, and merging groups with matching numbers. There is also some rule checking that prevents merging of unrelated groups. For example, two flops cannot be in the same group if, they, if their clocks are different. Eventually, it does uh, quite a good job. And here's an example uh, of uh, Open Titan, where Dana was able to find the uh, AES-256 and the uh, HMAC SHA-2 functions. So it was good, and uh, in general, we all like to look for crypto models when uh, we do reverse engineering. But uh, the crypto models are quite easily recognized even by visual inspection of the graph. They have a well-organized flow here, like, for example, this flow of death. Uh, they have standard definition, uh, which is known to everyone, and it has also some unique structures with high entropy, like this ad block. And this is not the case with uh, other types of logic. For example, when we go from data pass to control logic, uh, the entropy grows uh, very fast, and we uh, we can't really find any regularity inside those. Structures. One way to look at the control structures is, is to present them as a state machine. And there are a few methods to extract state machines uh, from the circuit. I want to uh, expand on them because uh, I think we're uh, running out of time. So I'm, I think I will run to the uh, last important point uh, that I uh, wanted to make is uh, uh, the benchmarks. The situation today with the benchmark for IC reverse engineering is uh, really something that needs an improvement. Here you can see, for example, uh, a summary of the benchmark used in the papers about hardware obfuscation technique from 2008 and until today. You can see here the benchmarks that were used. Most of them are 30 years old or even older and these benchmarks are very old and not so relevant uh, they have small circuits mostly combinational circuits the problem is that uh, there is very few open information about ic circuits and we need to do something with this uh, we need to create a massive set of benchmarks either manually or develop some synthetic benchmark generators some work has started, uh, for example, is a recent publication by Sarah Mir, but uh, we need to put effort in that direction. So to conclude, uh, how can we advance some more research in the re uh, reverse engineering of ICs? Uh, first of all, uh, we need to come out with some uniform output format to streamline the research and to have some common baseline and common metrics for evaluation of different reverse engineering approaches. Quantifying success, so how exactly do we measure the success of reverse engineering? Uh, was it number of gates? Or maybe have some equivalent to coverage of the spec? 
I uh, think functional analysis is something that should be further explored. And as I already mentioned, the data sets, uh, we need to create more benchmarks and have some common set of benchmarks that everyone can use. With this, uh, uh, can, I can conclude. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonid, very much for the presentation. So uh, we have one question at the moment in the Q&A section. I'll just read it out. So it's from Tony uh, Pustinen. Uh, how many man hours and financial resources uh, it has taken you to reverse engineer a simple, moderate or complex circuit? Some concrete examples. Okay, so, uh, so if, if we're dividing the process into two phases, as I explained at the beginning, there is a netlist extraction phase and uh, the specification discovery. So with the scan method, after, uh, after the setup is done, extracting the information that is equivalent to the netlist is something that takes like I don't know, maybe a few hours. So uh, once we uh, get all the information about this uh, scan protocol and how to uh, switch on the scan, how to operate it. We can extract some uh, information that is equivalent uh, to the netlist in a few hours. Now the, spe the specification discovery is a, a different question. And here the main question is what exactly the things that we are looking for. If we're looking for some specific circuit, so I can, uh, uh, I can uh, for example, talk about what work that we had uh, about IP theft, where we uh, I identified a SHA-2 in some design. And well, it, it, took, it, it took maybe a couple of months to, uh, to run all the algorithms and to find the right algorithms to identify the circuit. Okay. Thank you very much. Answer the question. Yes, thanks. Um, also from my side, just a little question. So we've also seen a lot of reverse engineering today in another talk uh, by Joanna Bear. Yeah. So I'm just curious, one thing has not been uh, mentioned so far if, if I didn't miss it. So are there any online uh, tools which help out in this reverse engineering process? Because so far it always seems that it's kind of one researcher doing all that. Um, but this goes a little bit against this uh, automation process in reverse engineering. So can you comment on this? Mm -hmm. very, very good question. So, uh, so first of all, <clears throat> some work uh, here is done in collaboration with uh, RUB, Rural University Bochum and uh, Max Planck Institute. And uh, they developed the tool which is called HAL, uh, Hardware Analyzer. And this uh, tool is uh, available to the public. Uh, it's, this is a framework that uh, contains uh, netlist parsing and different algorithms for netlist exploration. And uh, the users can add their own algorithms to that framework. So this is one thing. Uh, it's called HAL, HAL. As, uh, there's another tool, Scandit, that uh, uh, we use for scan-based extraction. And it is not published yet, but uh, it will be published in the near future. Uh, so uh, as, as soon as we'll have more interesting uh, data to share with the community, we'll definitely do that. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Are there any questions uh, from, from the panelists? Just to comment, in general, the, our approach is to put everything that we publish in the, the open source. So the intention is that as soon as we'll develop more uh, algorithms, and uh, right now we're working very hard in the, the graph theory, etc., uh, we will release it uh, to the public. This is the intention at least. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds uh, promising. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, if there are no other questions, as far as I see, there are none. 
Then uh, thanks, Leonid Azriel, very much for the presentation. And I am handing over to one of our co-organizers, Harvey Mendelssohn, so for the final, final words. I'll try to do it very, very fast. Uh, I think that we had a fascinating uh, day. We had uh, quite a few uh, topics that uh, at least in theory can bring to collaboration between different two, uh, teams and uh, the works that has some similarities or at least they complement uh, each other. So we really hope that uh, such workshops and uh, uh, meetings will create more collaboration between the teams because I think that we are quite a small uh, a group of researchers and we want to enlarge the, the activity and uh, we want uh, to make our uh, uh, if we want to make our work to be more meaningful, we need to expand it and to work together.